Members of the Board of Equalization want to hear from you. If you have ideas, concerns, or suggestions on how the Board could improve services in the taxpayer experience, make sure to attend the annual Taxpayers' Bill of Rights hearings in Culver City on April 26th or Sacramento on May 24th. If you'd like more information, visit boe.ca.gov. Okay, so we have your W-2 and mortgage deduction, your receipts, charitable deductions, mileage claims. Let's see, are we missing anything else? Oh, do you owe any use tax? What's use tax? It's usually owed when you buy something from an out-of-state company or website that didn't charge you California sales tax. So do you think you may owe use tax? Gosh. You know, I did a lot of online shopping this year. I think I have some receipts from a few things I bought. Oh, that's easy to add in on your return. Let's see what you have. Oh. The revenue collected from use tax helps pay for important California services like public safety, health care, and schools. Remember when you file, pay your use tax. To learn more, visit boe.ca.gov. Paying your use tax. Good for you. Good for California. The Taxpayers' Rights Advocate of the State Board of Equalization wants you to know you have rights. As a California taxpayer, your rights are protected during the assessment and collection of taxes, including the right to courteous and prompt service, and the right to be treated fairly during all dealings with Board of Equalization employees and officers of the Board. Publication 70, Understanding Your Rights as a California Taxpayer, and Publication 145, California Taxpayer Advocates can be useful in learning about your rights. If you feel the BOE has not resolved your concerns adequately, please contact the Taxpayers' Rights Advocates Office at 1-888-324-2798 or email us. The Taxpayers' Rights Advocate of the State Board of Equalization. We're here for you. You ask and we listen. Together, we've designed a California State Board of Equalization website with you in mind. The convenient login button allows you to access many of our online services from anywhere at any time. Drop-down menus make navigation easy. You can do everything from filing a return and making a payment to finding permits and licenses. Our interactive banners highlight the latest news, programs, and services. Popular topics help you find information quickly. The How Do I and Business Center sections offer you even more helpful resources, including individual tax guides for various industries. We also want to hear from you. Tell us, how was your experience? Your feedback is important because it helps us provide you with an improved and more interactive website. So check it out at boe.ca.gov. It's designed with you in mind.
It's easy to buy things online these days, but did you know you may need to pay tax on those items? Really? It's called use tax. And just like sales tax, the use tax you pay to California will help fund important services like public safety, healthcare, and schools. But how do you know if you owe use tax? When you buy things online, look to see if you were charged tax when you checked out. If you weren't, you may owe use tax. It's easy to figure out how little you may owe. For most purchases, you don't even have to save your receipts. Just use this convenient use tax table available in your income tax instructions. Find your adjusted gross income to see how much you may owe and enter that amount when preparing your state income taxes. It's that simple. No looking through files and no hassles. You've paid your use tax for the whole year. That was easy. Paying your use tax. Good for you. Good for California. We're committed to supporting our communities, teaming up with businesses large and small, improving our roads and schools, investing in law enforcement and our environment. Together, we're funding a better quality of life. We're the California State Board of Equalization. The BOE was created in 1879 to equalize property tax assessment practices throughout California. Our responsibility has grown quite a bit since then. Today, the BOE administers more than 30 taxes and fees that provide one-third of all the revenue generated in our great state. And we're efficient. More than 99% of the money you contribute supports services and programs that benefit all of us in California. When you drive down our many highways, see a police officer helping someone in need, or enjoy a walk along a pristine beach, think about what makes it possible. Whether you're a business owner, making a purchase, or just filling up your gas tank, your contributions are important to our state's economic health. And the greatest part, we're doing it together. We're ready to work with you. Take advantage of our free seminars, helpful classes, instructional videos, and mobile applications. Also, use our online services. It's easy to do business with us from anywhere, at any time. Our partnership equals success. Learn more at boe.ca.gov. Together, we're supporting our communities and funding a better quality of life. Members of the Board of Equalization want to hear from you. If you have ideas, concerns, or suggestions on how the Board could improve services in the taxpayer experience, make sure to attend the annual Taxpayers Bill of Rights hearings in Culver City on April 26th or Sacramento on May 24th. If you'd like more information, visit boe.ca.gov. Okay, so we have your W-2 and mortgage deduction, your receipts, Charitable deductions, mileage claims. Let's see, are we missing anything else? Oh, do you owe any use tax? What's use tax? It's usually owed when you buy something from an out-of-state company or website that didn't charge you California sales tax. So do you think you may owe use tax? Gosh. You know, I did a lot of online shopping this year. I think I have some receipts from a few things I bought. Oh, that's easy to add in on your return. Let's see what you have. Oh. The revenue collected from use tax helps pay for important California services like public safety, health care, and schools. Remember, when you file, pay your use tax. To learn more, visit boe.ca.gov. Paying your use tax. Good for you. Good for California.
The Taxpayers' Rights Advocate of the State Board of Equalization wants you to know you have rights. As a California taxpayer, your rights are protected during the assessment and collection of taxes, including the right to courteous and prompt service and the right to be treated fairly during all dealings with Board of Equalization employees and officers of the board. Publication 70, Understanding Your Rights as a California Taxpayer, and Publication 145, California Taxpayer Advocates can be useful in learning about your rights. If you feel the BOE has not resolved your concerns adequately, please contact the Taxpayers' Rights Advocates Office at 1-888-324-2798 or email us. The Taxpayers' Rights Advocate of the State Board of Equalization. We're here for you. You ask and we listen. Together, we've designed a California State Board of Equalization website with you in mind. The convenient login button allows you to access many of our online services from anywhere at any time. Drop-down menus make navigation easy. You can do everything from filing a return and making a payment to finding permits and licenses. Our interactive banners highlight the latest news, programs, and services. Popular topics help you find information quickly. The How Do I and Business Center sections offer you even more helpful resources, including individual tax guides for various industries. We also want to hear from you. Tell us, how was your experience? Your feedback is important because it helps us provide you with an improved and more interactive website. So check it out at boe.ca.gov. It's designed with you in mind. Ms. Richmond, will you please call the roll to determine that a quorum is present? Chairwoman Ma? Here. Ms. Harkey? Here. Mr. Harton? Here. Mr. Runner? Here. Ms. Yee? Here. Thank you. A quorum is present. The meeting of the State Board of Equalization is hereby called to order. We will commence with the Pledge of Allegiance led by Private First Class Gregory Oakes, son of Cliff Oakes in Ms. Harkey's office. Private First Class Oaks serves in the United States Marine Corps. He finished boot camp in January 2016 and infantry school in February 2016. He is currently stationed in Fort Lee, Virginia for his military occupational specialty school and is currently here in Sacramento on a one-month recruiter assistance duty. Please come forward, uh, first, Private First Class Gregory Oaks. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you for your service. <laughs> that was official. <laughs> okay, Ms. Richmond, please introduce our first item. Good morning, members. Our first item on this morning's agenda is the board member annual photograph. <laughs> okay, we will just take a 
five minute research, uh, recess while the um, team sets up the photograph. Okay, welcome back, members and guests. Ms. Richmond, please introduce our next item. Our next item is the state assessed properties value setting. This is a property tax matter. To the department, Mr. Thompson, welcome. The department will introduce yourselves for the record. Good morning. I'm, I'm John Thompson. 
to my immediate left is Richard Reisinger, and to his left is Michael Harris, they're the managers of the State Assessed Properties Division. We're here today to uh, fulfill our constitutional mandate of setting the unitary values for 400 uh, utility companies. Um, before you, you have uh, documents that uh, summarize the recommended values of the staff. Uh, they're arrayed by industry, and uh, staff <coughs> is here to answer any questions. Thank you, members. Are there any questions? And Move adoption of staff recommendation for all items. Second. Is there any non-participation? Okay. Uh, we will, um, the motion is by Mr. Horton, seconded by Ms. Harkey, uh, to recommend the staff recommendations for both consent and non-consent items. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next item, Ms. Richmond. Our next item is item B. Corporate Franchise and Personal Income Tax Appeals Hearings. Item B1, Gregory Wimmer, please come forward. <laughs> Board Proceedings has received contribution disclosure forms for today's hearings from the parties, participants, and agents. All forms are properly completed and signed. No disqualifying contributions were disclosed. All parties, participants, and agents are on the alpha listings provided to your office. Each person sitting at the table will be asked to introduce themselves and, if necessary, their affiliation with the taxpayer for the record. Ten minutes is allocated for the taxpayer's opening presentation, followed by ten minutes for the Franchise Tax Board's presentation, and five minutes is allocated to the taxpayer for, or for rebuttal. Ms. Ma. Thank you. Mr. Thompson? Yes. Yes. Mr. Thompson, will you please introduce the issues in this case? Uh, yes, only one issue in this case, and that is whether appellant has shown that he had reasonable cause for filing his tax return late. Okay, thank you. Um, to Mr. Wimmer, Gregory Wimmer, um, welcome to the Board of Equalization. You have 10 minutes to present you. your initial presentation, and we'll have an additional five minutes on rebuttal. Please introduce yourself for the record and present, start your presentation. Yep. Uh, my name is Greg Wimmer. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I think the issue before us is uh, the nature of the um, late filing penalty. It's, I think, a 23.5% penalty. Um, the penalty resulted from the fact that um, I, I prepared my taxes thinking I had a refund in place and I had a valid uh, federal and state extension uh, at the time, and I was in the midst of a rather lengthy and serious uh, IRS audit that would have had uh, a material impact on the current year at question and future years uh, in California as well as federal. And um, I had recently submitted a large amount of information to the IRS, uh, a, a banker box, roughly 40 pounds of documentation, answering every single question that they had. Uh, and so I had, perhaps naively at the time, uh, with the uh, advantage of hindsight, um, thought that there would be a fairly reasonable resolution of the issue um, before the uh, due date or some sometime right after the due date of the uh, return, uh, which is why I was late in filing the turn, return. Ultimately, the IRS did not uh, issue uh, an answer at that point. Uh, in fact, it's gone on for five more years. It's just been um, adjudicated this week, uh, basically on Monday. And um, there were a ton of items, many of them impacted California, a lot of them did not, but there were certainly material items that impacted California. And uh, they've all been basically uh, reversed um, uh, by the tax court, so that now the only adjustments are taking some expensed items, repairs on real estate, capitalizing them and depreciating them. The IRS has not assigned, uh, um, assessed any penalties. There will be interest in a small tax due. Um, but it took this long to get through um, all of that stuff. As, as soon as I realized um, back in 2012 that there wasn't going to be uh, an expedited answer, even though I'd provided all the documentation, I went ahead and filed my return. At that time, I uncovered an error. Uh, or actually, it was probably, I think it was afterwards uh, that I got an audit notice that I discovered the error um, in the TurboTax software that I use. I use Pro Series. I'm an, a licensed CPA. I used to prepare taxes for a living. I haven't done so for, for quite a many years, since the 1990s. 
But anyway, I used this, this software to prepare my taxes, and um, I un uncovered an error. Um, and it was an error in the default box between federal and state differences. Uh, for the federal version, um, you're allowed, I ended up being classified as a qualified real estate professional for fed federal purposes, which was one of the main issues of the IRS audit. Um, and in the earlier years, there's an exception. If your AGI is between $100,000 and $150,000, you're allowed a $25,000 uh, 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 deduction against other income. And California has complied with that at certain times and not always. Um, as my income went up, the default uh, box that I had originally selected in 1989, which allowed the Fed and state items to be treated the same, so I got proper treatment. When my income was higher in 2011, that default box is actually wrong. Okay, It's a box called other passive exceptions. And the big issue I have is there is no other passive exception in California, and yet there's a default box in the software. So it's clearly an error in the software. And it resulted really from initially uh, using it correctly in, 18, in 1989 and then carrying it every year and having it be accurate uh, to the point where in 2011 it was an in incorrect default and it should not have been there. Um, and once this was discovered, um, you know, I've admitted that I absolutely owe the tax, I owe interest. My contention is that the uh, penalty uh, seems um, very heavy-handed and, and harsh that's possibly designed to to uh, you know, discourage taxpayers from, from doing things. This was an honest mistake that uh, I, co I couldn't have avoided. And I'm a reason reasonably sophisticated taxpayer, and uh, I still made a mistake. OK, thank you very much. Um, Franchise Tax Board, if you would please introduce yourself for the record and also uh, begin your presentation. You will have 10 minutes. <clears throat> Good morning, Chairwoman Ma and members of the board. My name is David Meridian, and sitting next to me is Margaret Monnier. We represent the Franchise Tax Board. In this case, appellant filed his 2011 tax return reporting wages of over 280000 on November 15, 2012, uh, seven months after it was due. Respondent then audited appellant's 2011 tax year, which resulted in an assessment of 21970 in additional tax. Appellant has conceded this, this additional tax. Respondent also imposed a delinquent filing penalty, which is the only issue on appeal today. Respondent's imposition of the delinquent filing penalty is presumed proper unless appellant is able to show that, the, that his failure to timely file the tax return was due to reasonable cause and not <coughs> due to uh, willful neglect. Appellant must provide credible and competent evidence to support his contentions. In this case, appellant who is a licensed CPA has not met his burden to demonstrate that, to demonstrate reasonable cause to abate the penalty. Appellant makes several arguments. Uh, one of his arguments is that he could not have filed the 2011 tax return in a timely basis because he was still waiting for federal determination on prior tax years, namely the 07 to 010 years. In addition, appellant, argue, uh, appellant makes the contention that he did not want to file a return and then have to amend it later. His other argument, of course, is that the TurboTax series uh, had some kind of a software defect which resulted in an error <coughs> causing him to uh, file late. As to his first uh, argument, which is basically that he did not have to, uh, you know, he, he filed his return late because he was still awaiting the final federal, federal determination for those 7 to 2010 tax years and that, you know, he didn't want to file a return and then wait and then amend it again. Um, there's no provision in the law that allows appellant to file a late return in order to avoid filing an amended return. In fact, the law requires the taxpayer to estimate his or her tax liability based on the best information available. Thereafter, if, you know, if the information changes and appellant receives some type of a, a more precise figure, appellant can thereafter go and amend the return. Of course, in this case, that's not what occurred. The, as to the other issue, which is that there was a software defect, uh, number one, there hasn't been any substantiation of any error that appellant has provided other than what he has stated. But besides the point, let's assume for the fact, you know, that there was a software defect. The fact of the matter is, 
Appellant filed the return on November 15, 2012, seven months late. Had the t uh, software not made so-called error and done everything properly, Appellant would still have not have paid his tax liability in time because at this, in this case, the, of course, the issue is the delinquent filing penalty under RTC 19131. But let's just assume for the fact that the uh, appellant's software made everything, you know, the default um, box was not checked and everything went as planned. He still, he might have escaped the late filing penalty, but he would have had the late payment penalty because the late payment penalty does not give an extension. The late, pay the late payment penalty says that taxes must be paid by April 15, 2012. And if we look at the record, by April, April 15, 2012, the, the taxes, you know, equaling the deficiency that are approximately 21,000 were not paid. So in either case, there would have been a penalty. It's just w one way it would be the reasonable, uh, it, it would be the late filing penalty. The other way would be the late payment penalty. So the whole issue of the software defect, in essence, um, you know, doesn't, the, the uh, whether there was a software defect or not in this case just would not ultimately change the outcome significantly in any way because one way or another, one of the penalties would be imposed. With that, uh, I think, I, you know, I will, uh, be uh, welcoming any questions your board may have. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wimmer. You have five minutes on rebuttal. Yeah, um, th there's some in inaccuracies in that uh, most recent testimony because at the time I filed the return, if TurboTax had been accurate, I had a refund. So I would have had a late return and a refund balance due. We didn't discover until audit that there was a tax liability because we uncovered the error. So. Had TurboTax been accurate and I relied on it, I would have filed a late return with a refund. So there would not have been this, this penalty. Um, as far as the other things, yes, I am a licensed CPA, but I did not prepare tax returns since the 1990s. Um, and so there, there are uh, case citations to abate penalties when you rely on a professional. In my case, I relied on myself as a professional, uh, perhaps not razor sharp as I once was, but that's why I used professional software, TurboTax, to guide me through this. Um, and it had been accurate for all those years until my income went up this year um, and made that default uh, bug become relevant. Um, uh, there also uh, was some discussions about significant adjustments that did not impact California, and the two key areas that impacted California were the IRS initially proposed for uh, two properties, one uh, on Patrol Road and another on Pacific Avenue, to classify them from Schedule E rentals to a personal residence and a secondary residence. That means the mortgage uh, and property taxes would have become Schedule A items on California, and they were material numbers. Um, so that's why I waited, because I thought, okay, I've got a refund, I should get this adjudicated, and then I can file the returns and I'll get my, my money back, um, was, was my logic. Okay, thank you. Members, discussion? Ms. Harkey? Hi, this is for the FTB. You said be late filing or late payment. Are they both the same amount? Uh, the, no, the late payment penalty under 19132 is uh, kind of, it has two components. It's a point, and I can uh, tell you the exact. Ms. Harkey, it's a different formula that's used and typically would result in a lower penalty, not always, but uh, often it does. Okay, so we've got late filing, which is the 5000 and so a late payment would be something less than, probably. It, it would be, yeah, right, probably something less, although, you know, not something significantly less. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm confused, I guess, uh, this is for the taxpayer, I'm, I'm confused as to why you didn't just file a return if you thought you had a refund? Why didn't you just file a return and then go back and correct it later? Or what, what was your reasoning for that? Yeah, I mean, the, the IRS audit was, like, was massive uh, at the time. They uh, audited uh, four years, and they initially proposed a $900,000 adjustment in tax. 
And so I thought, oh my, this is going to be yeah, massive. You could not do that. Of right? course not. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And and I was like, okay, I, I absolutely, uh, you know, uh, initially when I provided all the documentation, I thought, okay, we're going to be done. Everything they asked for, I gave them. There wasn't a single item missing. So I expected a zero change or some minor change. Um, and that's not what happened. What happened was I got this $900,000 assessment, and I spent the last five years going through the process. I've been through appeals. Um, I was in front of uh, Judge Holmes in the tax court on Monday uh, to finally get all this adjudicated, and now it's a, a very minor $30,000 um, fine from just taking uh, items that I deducted, mostly repairs, uh, to some units and capitalize them now and, and depreciate them. But at the time, I... I and I said, that, you know, it, perhaps with the advantage of hindsight, I think oh, I was naive. But at the time, I thought I gave the IRS everything um, they asked for. This should get adjudicated. I should get a no-change letter. Then I'll know exactly where I stand with California. And since I thought I had a refund, I thought, that's okay. I'll get my money back whenever. I'd rather just get this done and then know where I stand. Okay. Were you aware of late filing or late payment penalties? I will just say late filing. Were you aware of late filing? Penalty. Yeah, but when you when there's a, re a refund, it's 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 usually a fairly small amount. When you have a late filing penalty on a refund, it, it's it's not a big deal. And I was willing to lose that and pay that um, to to wait on the IRS. Now, when I discovered that I had a balance due too, then it becomes a much larger penalty. Right. Mr. Renner. Just a quick question on, on the on the on the, um, the federal filing on that particular year. What did what was what was your timeliness on the federal filing? It was it was timely. So, I'd filed it already because there. So, so you filed your federal, but did not well, file on, your on, on 2011. Um, that's a good question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't I don't I don't know the answer. I'd have to look it up. Um, let me ask. I we, think it would have. Yeah. yeah. Oh. I was going to say, let me ask if they know. Yeah. Uh, the 2011 federal return was filed on November 1st, 2012, which was uh, past the extension okay. date. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So I filed them at the same time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yes. Ms. Stowers. Thank you. Um, I want to first talk about the TurboTax um, issue. It's my understanding you're saying that it, the default box was in error? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Can you it's explain to me how that default error, <laughs> asserted error, caused your return to be filed late? Uh, it, it didn't cause it to be filed late. It caused me to think I had a refund when I didn't. Okay. So yeah. that's not the reason why the return was filed late. Yeah, no. I, I willfully filed it late, thinking I had a refund because I was waiting on the adjudication from the IRS. And it was potentially a massive change, and so I wanted to to get it right. Okay. So then we're not, we, the Franchise Tax Board did not impose a penalty for paying late. Correct. Correct. Okay. We, so that we issue is not really before this board. Correct. Okay, great. Thank you. My next question to the appellant, sir, is um, the, the, the IRS audit, it was for the 2007 through the 2010 years? Yes. My notes here indicate that the issues dealt with the net operating loss carry for it. Is that accurate? Uh, that was one of the issues. Um, but there were many other issues. Like I had mentioned, there was uh, the IRS proposed reclassing two properties from Schedule E to Schedule A, okay. and those were material numbers. Okay. Was the NOL material as well? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's my understanding that for California law, NOLs were suspended for that year. They were, but if, if you're disqualified as a real estate professional, you still generate what are called suspended losses that you carry forward until you have some transaction where you have a gain, and then you can use those suspended losses against those gains. And so those suspended losses need to be filed with the return and, and, and accurate so that you have those numbers when you need them. Okay. But you weren't looking for on the 2011 year to use those suspended losses on your 2011 tax return? I, I wasn't going to use them on the 2011 return, but I certainly wanted them to be accurate because I would use them at some time in the future. They carry forward indefinitely. You said that you once prepared tax returns? As a for, for, for a living, yeah. I did, yes, for a living. In, the, in the early 90s. Okay. 
Here's where, and it's just an observation where I'm struggling with this is that it, it seems to me that as a licensed CPA, someone with experience preparing tax returns would know that if you're under audit by the IRS, you should still timely file your state and your state and federal tax returns. And then if there is an adjustment, then you just um, well, on the IRS side, they're going to make the changes for you. Yeah. And on the state side, they will give you the federal audit report and advise you to notify the agency, the agent that you have an adjustment on the state side. Yeah. And you can either amend your return or you can just send them the federal audit report and the state of California will make the adjustments. So I'm, I'm a little perplexed on why you waited. Yeah, in to, both, to, I'm yeah, talking, in both cases, I had refunds and I would rather get this adjudicated and be right and get my refunds back later. I, I wasn't in a hurry to get my refunds. I'd rather get the audit done and, and, the, and, the, and both federal and state returns correct. Okay. All right. All right. That was just, it was just my observation yeah. that I, from a, from, a, from a tax professional, it would have been following the rules to file the return by the due date or the extended due date, which was October 15th. I also have a note here that you met with the IRS on September the 12th, 2012. And at that time, the case obviously was still going on. Yeah, but that, that, that I believe is when I gave them this huge bank the huge, box. The huge box. So yeah. it was going to take them some time to, to review this information, but yet you still didn't file the 2011 return by the due date. Just an observation. Yeah. Um, to the Franchise Tax Board, with respect to this penalty, 19131, it's 5% of the unpaid tax for each month that the tax return is late, not to exceed 25%. That's correct. And I'm reading the statute and it says the penalty shall be added to tax. So that makes this penalty mandatory? That's correct. And what is this board authority with respect to this penalty as far as adjusting it or canceling it? The only uh, uh, 19131 provides that you know the penalty shall be uh, imposed unless the taxpayer can provide, uh, you know, competent evidence that uh, the failure to file timely was due to reasonable cause okay. and not willful neglect. Thank you. Welcome. Mr. Horton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, let me, I just want to make sure that I heard your testimony correct. Uh, you, you indicated that you willfully and strategi strategically <laughs> filed your tax return late. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I, I knew it was late, and, and I've articulated why I waited, because I had a refund and I wanted to get it right from the okay. audit. So, Thank you yes. very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. This one. Uh, uh, Mr. Renner. Yeah, that, that was actually my concern, too, in regards to the issue of, the, of, of clearly there's some words here that are pretty important, and willful is one of them. Um, <laughs> and, and, and so my concern is that you, in that regard, you have said that you willfully chose not to file. Now, I, now, see if I get this right, because you believe that you had a refund coming as a result of the um, mistake or the problem in the turbo tax, and you were willing to eat a smaller penalty, but you willfully ch still chose not to file. So let me fi ask you this. Yeah. What did you, with the turbo tax problem, did you correspond to them? Did you, what, did, what did you do once you identified this problem? Because i got to believe you're not the only guy out there filing pro- who had who would have this circumstance? Yeah, I mean, I, I so called, did you, do you, what do you have? Do you have I, any? I talked to their customer support, and I kind of got the runaround. I said, "Why do you even have this other path, passive exception box? Because there is no other passive exception in California. Period. There right. isn't. It doesn't exist." And I couldn't really get an answer. Um, one of the customer support people said there are some states that we use the. the um, TurboTax Pro Series for that may have an other path, passive exception. Right then it should not be in the California form. Um, okay. So that's, okay. that's the only answer I could okay. get out of them. Thank you. Okay, thank you, members. Is there a motion? Uh, move to take the matter on the submission. Second. Okay. Um, Ms. Stowers, uh, motions to take the uh, matter under submission, seconded by Mr. Horton. Thank you, Mr. Wimmer, for appearing, and we will uh, make a decision later on today. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Richmond, please call our next item. 
Our next item is B2, Riverbell Park Apartments. Please come forward. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Ambrose, will you please introduce the issues in the case? Good morning, uh, Madam Chairwoman, members of the board. The uh, issue in the matter of the appeal of Riverbell Park, River Park Apartments is whether appellant has shown reasonable cause exists for the late filing of its 2012 return. Thank you, uh, Mr. Um, if you would introduce yourself. My name is Paul Prudler. Mr. Prudler, welcome to the Board of Equalization. You will have 10 minutes to make your initial presentation and an additional five minutes on rebuttal. Thank you. Um, well, I guess my job is to uh, get you to believe that there was reasonable cause for filing a late return. Um, <clears throat> at the uh, end of uh, 2012, I needed to uh, hire a professional manager uh, because I had one of my uh, partners was managing the apartment and not doing a very good job, so I had to let her go. She was also a partner in the uh, project and still is. Um, so a few months after I hired the new professional manager, I also changed accountants. And... Um, in about September uh, 10th, around there, I received my K-1 from the old accountant. And this is not abnormal. He would normally get an extension every year. I built this apartment with my partner almost 40 years ago. So we've had a very long time, and we formed a general partnership on it. And he was a general partner, and I was a general partner, and we each owned, at that time, 50% of the project. So we've had it many years, and, and this was kind of a, um, the way it worked. Uh, I would get a K-1, and the other partner would get a K-1, and, and we would just file our taxes on extension generally every year. But anyway, around this year, uh, on 2000 and 13, actually, it was, uh, I got my K-1. So getting my K-1, I assumed <laughs> that the tax return had been filed. I mean, I didn't even, I honestly, didn't even think about it any different than any other prior year. Okay, so anyway, I changed accountants uh, for the next year, and when the next year, close to when the next year was to be filed, the new accountant found that the that the uh, tax return for 2012 had not been filed. So he immediately set it up for me to sign and send in, and, and we did. As soon as we found that out, we did. Anyway, um, uh, I w after we did that, I was sent letters from the uh, Franchise Tax Board and from the IRS that they wanted me to pay a fine, so I appealed it. And the IRS said uh, I didn't have to pay anything. I think it was because, I think it was because when we, all the partners got their K-1, they all fired, filed their personal taxes on time, so no money was lost, even though the Riverbell apartment tax return had not been sent in. We didn't, nobody knew that. So, so we thinking it was sent in, we paid the correct amount of taxes anyway, so there was no loss to, in taxes to uh, IRS or to Franchise Tax Board. Okay, let me see, where am I here? Um, anyway, uh, I can give you more detailed information if you'd like on why I had to make these changes. Uh, uh, but what I, all I'm trying to do is say, as soon as I found out that the tax return hadn't been filed, I did file it, and 
then when I lost my appeal to the Franchise Tax Board, I did pay that also. It was, it was not a great deal of money. It was $1,080, but it just seemed wrong to me that I didn't, I had no idea it hadn't been filed, so I, that's why I'm here today. That's my story. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Prudler. You're welcome. Okay, Franchise Tax Board, please introduce yourselves for the record and begin your presentation. Uh, good morning, Chairwoman Ma and members of the board. My name is Andrew Amara, and I'm with Natasha Page. Together, we're, <clears throat> we're representing the Franchise Tax Board in this appeal. Um, as the board just heard, this is a delinquent filing penalty case involving a California partnership for the 2012 taxable year. The only issue in the case is whether appellant has established a reasonable cause for the late filed return. Um, and just by way of factual background, uh, appellant filed his 2012 taxable year return over a year late. Uh, FTB imposed a late filing penalty as required by California law, and appellant has appealed that penalty. Um, appellant's position on appeal is, in essence, that it relied on its preparer to timely file the return. And more specifically, appellant claims that uh, it was under the impression the, the preparer would timely file uh, by the e-filing method, but appellant admits that it did not confirm, it just assumed. Um, now, in order to prevail, appellant has to establish that there was reasonable cause for the late filing. In, in analyzing um, and evaluating the meaning of that term, the United States Supreme Court and your board have continually held that the failure to timely file a return is not excusable through reliance on a tax professional or tax preparer and that reliance does not constitute reasonable cause for a late filing. Your board has also consistently held that every taxpayer has a personal and non-delegable obligation to timely file. Ordinary business care and prudence, which are necessary in establishing a reasonable cause, require at minimum that taxpayers confirm rather than assume that timely filings have occurred. Uh, based on all that, appellant has not established reasonable cause for the late filing and the penalty must be sustained. I'd be glad to take any questions your board may have. Hey, Mr. Prudler, you have five minutes on rebuttal. Okay. Uh, uh, don't have much to say, but uh, other than, as you, you can see, I'm not a young man, so I have paid taxes for a lot of years to both IRS and, and California, and I have never, ever been late except this time. And this time was only because I didn't know it. Uh, that that's really all I can say. Okay. Members, Ms. Harkey. Oh, excuse me. I have one other thing to add. Okay. Because I, I just told an untruth. <laughs> um, there are two other apartments that the same exact thing happened with at the same exact time. I, I tried to get them all put together, but they didn't want to put them together. So we have to do them one at a time. So I'm late on three apartments at this 2012 thing. So, you know, if I win, you'll probably see me again. If I don't win, you probably won't see me again. <laughs> but but I'm, I'm just, th that's a fact. It happened to all three, the same exact thing happened to all three the same way. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harkey. Thank you. Um, Mr. Prudler. Yes. Did, did you have a property manager at the time? I did. It was, it was the, the widow of my partner. Uh, when, when he passed away, she came to me and said that she needed the money, so could she be the manager? And I said yes, and so she managed it for a long time, maybe 10 or 15 years. But the, that was what I could have gone into earlier. But the problem was, as nice as she was, she lost interest in the thing, and it wasn't doing as well as it should have been doing, but worse yet, I would not get the monthly reports maybe for six months. I'd get the June report in December. And only after calling and begging to get the reports, you're supposed to get the, the financial reports each month, like on the 10th of the following month. That's what most property managers do. But I, I begged her for about two years and then finally had to change managers. And I have a professional manager and now I get them the reports. 
on the about the 10th of the following month. The, the reason you need the reports fairly promptly is if something's going wrong, you can react and maybe fix it. Six months later is too late. So I, I, I did have to right. change managers. Did, did that person work with the former CPA yes. on your taxes? Yes. So that person would have probably been the one that would have followed up for the tax return? I'm, I'm guessing, however I answer that, because I don't know for sure. Okay. The, the accountant found the unfiled tax return in a Riverbell file, and I don't know how it got in the file. So it could have been between the property manager and, or the CPA when he turned over the file. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Renner. Yeah, just a couple of questions. Um, the, the idea that you had two other apartments that were kind of in the same, or two other partnerships that are in the yes. same situation? She did with the same property manager and the same partners. So all the facts are the same? Very similar. No, well, hold on. Are all the facts the same in the sense it's, it's only the singular partner? Uh, no. In, uh, there's other partners involved in some of the other ones? Uh, in one of the other ones, there's the same partnership. Okay. Uh, we have my... My don't, don't, that's, I don't need to know who's in the other ones. Okay. So I, I'm trying to find out if any of them have the exact same partnership. Yes. One and does. the exact same filing problem. Yes. Okay. One of them does? Yes. Let me ask the FTB. Why would we not combine that if they're both being appealed? <coughs> because I haven't well, hey, just, appealed the second one oh, yet. I'm sorry. Yeah. I haven't appealed it yet because I just got the... A letter oh, I thought, this you, month. I thought I heard you told. I thought I heard you say that they wouldn't let you combine them. I asked when I before I appealed the second one. Right. I asked if I could. I could combine it. Uh, combine it, and they said no because I hadn't. Re they hadn't gone far enough to get send me the letter of denial. I guess. Okay, so it was a timing issue as to why it couldn't be a put the why they couldn't be combined. I think so. Uh, partially is my understanding. I think also that there was there was an opportunity to consolidate them, but it re would have required that this this hearing be um, pushed back to in order to allow the briefing to catch up on the other ones. And and um, Mr. Prudler didn't want to um, postpone this hearing in order to do that. Well, I had already that, postponed would, it once. Would you, okay, so you, you chose not to postpone the hearing in order to hear them at the same yes. time. Okay, that's fine. I'm just concerned that a taxpayer has the, has the desire to, po to combine things for both the taxpayer's sake, for and your sake. FDB's sake, and for yeah. our sake. We just yeah. as soon have them combined. But it sounds like there was a series of circumstances that kind of yes. got in the way of combining them yes. beyond just the FTB deciding not, yes. to, not to combine them. Okay. Um, let me just ask you a couple other uh, questions in regards to this. So your personal filing was done on time. Yes. So what we're dealing with is your, the partnership filing. Yes. And on, the, on your personal filing, you, ha you did include the, uh, the K-1s for that Information particular year. from the k one So it was yes. timely. Yes. Um, am, I to, am, I, am I to kind of get from this that the assumption was since you got the K-1s, you assumed that all the filing was complete? Well, I never even thought about it because that's what had been happening if you had all been, these years. If you didn't get a K-1, what would you have done? I would have called the accountant for a K-1 because I had to file my taxes. Um, so the I fact have is... to do that. The fact is that part of the filing, part of the work of the CPA was done in that you received the K-1 timely. Yes which then gave you the idea that everything else would have been turned in timely. I honestly, until later, I never even thought about it. You know, I just assumed it was like all the other years. I got my K-1, everything was filed, and that was, it'd who been going had, on for signed, years that who way. Who signed the previous years? I beg your pardon? Who signed the previous year's filing? Um, it wasn't me, so I, don't, I do not know. Probably that... The property manager? Pro probably. She was a partner. Was also. she the property manager at the time of the filing? Uh, no. The filing, yeah. I the, let her go, uh, I think, early, uh, uh, like in December of 2012. So you let her go previous, and then you let her go, and then that previous probably month or a month and a half, then you got your K-1s. I didn't get my K-1 until... Uh, 
around, it was dated uh, September 9th, 2013. This is when I normally get them every year because he does, files extensions every year. So you got okay. So you did, say so you got them September. And you fi you had yes. already filed an extension and yes. you got your K ones in yes. September. Okay, okay. But she was not the property manager at the time. Not at that time, no. But the accountant was the same accountant that she had always dealt with. I hadn't I hadn't changed accountants. You hadn't until changed the next accountants year. at that time. Yeah. Okay. Let me let me ask go to, go to appeals in regards to the to the issue of. Again, um, <clears throat> the ability for us to, to um, deal with some issue like this with, with some of these more interesting parts to it, like <laughs> getting a parcel filing and therefore making your assumption um, that your accountant is doing the job because you got something from them. Um, and that's as opposed to just assuming you got nothing and then didn't do anything. Exactly. But when you got something which was important, again, for the tax to be paid, because let me make, I think I'm going to make this clear too. All the state taxes were paid correctly. Yes. The state received all their taxes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So this, this, this is all about the penalty. The state received all its money. This is all about the idea of whether or not the filing there was confusion in the filing. So again, I'm sorry, I got off track on that. So the, so the idea here is reliance, I understand that there was some issue discussion of reliance on an on a, on a, on a, uh, accountant um, does not give cause. But in this sense, because there was already partial information giving, it almost reinforced the fact that the filing was done. So. I mean, I'm just trying to find out how open a door could be or how the crack in that door could be when it is indeed that there that it's the reliance wasn't based upon just not responding and hoping it was done. The reliance was based upon the fact that there was actually evidence that something was done. The, the, the circumstances. Well, I mean, if the board finds that that constitutes reasonable cause for failing to timely file, then... Because of the unique it's circumstance. A, yeah, it's it's a factual determination. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I mean it is. It's a, it's an unusual circumstance, right. and yeah, I, unfortunately, you know, we the you know the FTB the the R, R revenue and taxation code doesn't have a provision for a first time. Yeah, and I, and I get the and I get the idea where 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 the 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 taxpayer needs to be held accountable when it is that a filing wasn't done and, and you know, like you're missing your K-1s and so then you call up your account and you don't just forget about it. Um, but my concern is in this case, there seemed to be evidence that he had an actually tax filing that was completed and taxes paid based upon what he had done so far. Seems okay. like based on prior history. Yes, yeah, yeah. okay, thank you. Yes, Ms. Towers. Okay, uh, a couple of questions for Mr. Yes. Um, Partler. Um, I kind of want to go back to, you indicated that you let go of the property manager in December 2012? Approximately that time. Around that time frame. Um, and prior to this manager being let go, was she signing the partnership tax? I think so. You think it so? It wasn't me. <coughs> was not, it was she her. a partner? Yes. Okay. Okay. And now... Um, I'm just trying to get a good idea of the time frame. Did you hire a CPA to prepare the partnership return? Um, I can't remember if she hired her the CPA or I did, but it happened many, like 10 or 15 years prior. It was the same, so, but there was same, a CPA. Same CPA, yes. Okay. He, would, he did a fine job. I only changed because I found one who would do it a little bit cheaper. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's, that's fair. That's fair. Um, so and kind of going to what Mr. Runner was talking about, the 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 CPA provided you with your K one. Yes. It's in September of twenty thirteen. Yes. And with that K one, you were able to file your individual California and federal tax return in a timely fashion. Yes. Um, but the partnership return, which is why we're here was not filed. That's correct. Um, in the, the different correspondence that I received, I was under the impression that it was your argument that you assumed that the partnership return had been filed and you assumed that it had been electronically filed. 
I, I think I assumed electronically, I think that was a mistake because I think it was mailed in because my, my new accountant found the, the whole mail-in file that hadn't been mailed in in the Riverbell file. Oh, that, that, that's kind of going to go to my next question. Okay. Um, and I, and, I, and I'm, not, I'm not there, so I don't know what was in your file, but I was just thinking the same thing, that generally when CPA firms prepare tax returns for individuals, a partnership, and whomever, they send a package. They send it was a, the it package was, that has it to be was signed. Like ethic, yes. it, yeah, that package here. Here's your original return. Mm -hmm. Please sign if you owe, write the check, and send it to the tax authority by the, the due date. I'm and very familiar with them now because <laughs> since that time I sign them. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. That that, that kind of clears up something for me because I was just wondering how did what happened that it it didn't get into the the taxing agency's records. Now, I'm also a little confused. You're saying that when you got your new CPA and he found this package. Yes. And he and he realized what had happened that it yes. had not made it over to the IRS yes. or the franchise tax board. You then sign the tax return? I did. Okay. And sent it in. And you sent it in? Yep. Is there a, any particular... I have a copy here. The Franchise Tax Board Exhibit A is the copy that... Um, they received into the records, and it is signed by you, and it's signed September 9, 2013. Yeah, that's when it was dated. I just, I just signed it. You just signed it, but that's you didn't. When it, that's the same date I had on my uh, K-1, I, the correspondence that came with the K-1. Oh, but you didn't put that date down there. I did not. That was my next question. Why would you? Basically, it appeared to have been. Dated well, it is dated September 9th, 2013. Yeah, I didn't know all that stuff till recently when I found all these pieces <laughs> of paper. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, <sighs> okay, sir. I, I understand it. This is just my observation. It, it seems like the, the prior CPA provided the, the package, the, the original copy that needed to be signed and dated and sent. To that's, the tax authority, and then a copy for your file. That's what I believe is true. And then that original just did not, that final and most important step did not happen. Never got mailed in. Never got mailed and in. And I had never seen it to sign. And you never seen it. And your property manager that we believe, property manager slash partner, that was previously signing tax returns was no longer the property manager. That's correct. So that person couldn't have signed and, and mailed it. Was there another partner that would have been responsible for? No. The only other partner was the widow of my partner. Not the widow. Uh, was the uh, ex-wife of my partner. So I have an ex-wife and a widow as partners now. And, and <laughs> the ex-wife would not have uh, signed it. Poor guy. Okay. <laughs> so it seems like everything failed on, on you. Now. Yeah. Now. Yeah, I was kind of the majority partner anyway, so I didn't have to let her be the manager. Uh -huh. But it thought, I think, all of you would have done the same exact thing. So, Okay. You know. Okay, I, I understand. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. So, Mr. Pruler, um, I'm very sympathetic to your cause. Um, I used to file tax returns, partnership tax returns for clients, and um, the practice for CPAs is to send the tax returns uh, to be signed, um, you know, back to the client, mm -hmm. and the CPA usually sends out the K-1s yeah. to the partners because um, that is usually the, the past, that's or that's the, the, that's the process. It's not usually the um, partners, like if we sent the client the tax right. return, we did not expect you to send the K-1s, but we as a CPA would send it. So I think the CPA did do their job in 
terms of sending the tax return back to you yes. for signing. Yes. Unfortunately, someone put it in a file and didn't file it. Um, but the CPA also did send out the K-1s to all of you. That enabled you all to file your personal income taxes on time. So although I feel um, sympathetic, I understand your situation, but I feel like the CPA did do their job, yes. and unfortunately, your partner did not um, do her job uh, in terms of signing it and getting in. So um, unfortunately, I um, am going to have to be with the Franchise Tax Board on this yeah, case. That's, a, that's understandable. Okay. I, I, I wasn't sure, sure I was going to win. I'm just telling you, I did not know. You know. Right. Miss mm. <sighs> Harkey? I didn't hear a motion. <laughs> oh, oh, Mr. Horton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, question of the uh, department. You know, I agree with the chairwoman. Um, the taxpayer, uh, is, his testimony is honest. Uh, he's seemed to have exercised a reasonable care uh, to some degree. I'm just curious if there was any, uh, well, question of uh, Mr. Pruler. Yes. Um, when, my understanding is the property manager was the one that that's, was somewhat the checks and balance to make sure that the return was filed. Is that correct? Uh, I, I think so, yes. And when you, when, you, when you terminated the property manager, did you put anything in place to assure that that assignment would be taken care of? I did not. You did not? OK. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, this is a, this is a, this is, uh, it appears that all the members are very sympathetic, but it's hard to, hard to, to separate when you have a partnership, the partners are responsible for each other. Exactly. So the acts or the failure of one partner uh, does not relieve the other partner of their responsible to act prudent. That was why I paid the penalty personally. <laughs> I didn't pay it out of the partnership. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm. Mr. Renner. Yeah, um, again, I, I, I'm, I'm going to... It seems to me that this is a unique situation in the fact that um, uh, that there was not... El that the, the, the reliance on the accountant on this, uh, at that point was based on some facts. The facts being you that the taxpayer received a K-1. It wasn't just not handled, it wasn't just neglect, it wasn't, it wasn't the fact that there was, that they, that, that, um, you know, somebody wasn't doing their due diligence, they, they, they actually received something. So I, I actually want to make a motion for the taxpayer here, and I'll wait for. I took, I, I would like to ask a question of, uh, of appeals. Ms. Harkey. Thank you. Um, I do not see evidence of willful neglect. And if it's not willful neglect, then my question is, is this a mandatory penalty? Uh, yes, it is. It's basically a two-part test. You have to show ordinary care and prudence and an absence of willful neglect. Okay, so we've got absence of willful neglect. Um, ordinary care and prudence, I would think would be there uh, in that uh, there was a change in command, the K-1s were sent, all the taxes were paid, <coughs> this taxpayer is being totally honest, as a matter of fact, maybe too honest, and I don't see that there wouldn't be an exception for this one time when there are no taxes due. Uh, there was a change in the bookkeeping and the taxes. Um, he did locate, or his new CPA did locate it in a file and filed it did, without pursuit. The IRS waived their penalty under the circumstances, and so I would uh, wait to hear the motion from uh, Mr. Renner. Oh, okay. Uh, motion would be to grant. 
I'll okay. second that. And let me let me again respond to a little bit of the same issue. To me, to me, this is unique in the fact that there there is, uh, to me, the idea of the abs. There was no willful neglect here. The issue of prudence, I think, comes in play when, again, a person in in, in good thought and mind says, "Hey, this is what I normally do. I got my K ones," and so I think that there the circumstances demonstrate to me that there was this was a normal, typical issue, um, and. Um, it seems to me that this is just a unique issue then from from the um, from some of the um, the uh, court issues that were laid out in regards to reliance on a on a tax professional as not being uh, able to meet the burden. But this was a little bit different in that there was actually ta the tax professional actually did provide some of the information which then caused the taxpayer to feel like indeed that was done. So again, it wasn't just reliance saying, I hope my tax, my, my CPA files this. It was the fact that there was actually correspondence and there was actually then follow up from the CPA and, and again, it seemed to be a very normal pattern. So again, I think this is a unique circumstance. The facts I think are very different. I think again, this is an individual who's come forward now, again, not paying the, not paying the penalty out of the partnership, but be saying, hey, I, I, I did this personally. And uh, in order to try to get this, and I'm just trying to trying to get a refund here in this state. So that's why I feel comfortable at this being a unique issue to where uh, I think the facts are uh, a, a little bit different than just the idea of just strict reliance on a, on a, on a CPA. Madam Chair. Oh, Mr. Horton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I mean, I too share the sympath sympathy, um, sympathetic towards uh, uh, Mr. Prudler individually. The unfortunate thing before us is, is that this is a partnership, and so he is representing the entire partnership. So the partnership itself would have had to act it reasonably, which means all of the parties involved had an opportunity to engage, correct, establish in, internal controls and balances in order to uh, prevent this. Um, if it were Mr. Pooler, my apologies, um, alone, uh, then there would be uh, maybe a basis in law that we could, uh, we could do so. But I see no basis in law in, in that this is a partnership and we have to sort of consider it uh, unitarily, if you will, and collectively. To help you a little bit, maybe, is since I... Thank you, Madam Chair. Excuse me. Um, I, I think okay. we're, we're um, going to debate the motion now. Um, there is a motion on the floor to grant for the taxpayer appellant in the claim for refund of 1080 uh, by Mr. Runner, seconded by Ms. Harkey. Um, Ms. Richmond, if you would call the roll. Ms. Ma? No. Ms. Harkey? Aye. Mr. Horton? No. Mr. Runner? Aye. Ms. Dowers? No. Motion fails. Is there a substitute motion? Um, motion to sustain the Franchise Tax Board. Second. There is a motion to sustain the Franchise Tax Board by Ms. Stower, seconded by Mr. Horton. If, objection. Uh, objection by Ms. Harkey. You could take the roll. Ms. Ma? Aye. Ms. Harkey? No. Mr. Horton? Aye. Pardon me? Aye. Sorry. No. Mr. Renner? No. Ms. Stowers? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much, Mr. Prudler, Thank for appearing before much. us today. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Richmond, please call the next item. Our next item is B3A, Emerson Properties, Inc., B3B, Stanley R. Emerson and Kathleen Emerson, B3C, Christopher B. Emerson and Valerie M. Wade, B3D, Dale R. Emerson and Carolyn K. Emerson, B3E, Michael Emerson and Maria Nova, B3F, Patrick Emerson, and B3G, Craig J. Combs and Tricia Emerson. Okay, Mr. Thompson, will you please introduce the issues in this case? Uh, yes, again, only one issue in this appeal, and that is whether appellants have shown error in respondents' determination 
uh, that uh, they recognize taxable boot income and a like kind exchange under Internal Revenue Code Section 1031. Thank you. Mr. Silvio Rajardo. welcome to the Board of Equalization. You have 10 minutes to make your initial presentation and we'll have an additional five minutes on rebuttal. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and please commence your presentation. I am Silvio Rajardo. I'm an attorney. And you just heard what I think are complicated factual cases with fairly le easy legal issues. This is a different one. This case involves complicated legal issues and I think fairly simple facts. And our our uh, taxpayer, main taxpayer, Emerson Properties Inc. is an S corporation. It's got flow through income, which is one of the reasons why the shareholders are involved. And it entered into a real estate transaction where it received $2 million of deposits. And those deposits were treated as option payments held open as to taxation under the open transaction doctrine because we didn't know how they would ultimately be handled. And when it was clear that there would be a closing, uh, there was an exchange opened, an intermediary hired. And the intermediary received all of the proceeds other than the deposits. Right before the closing on the target property, so we're at the end of the exchange period, uh, Emerson Properties put $1 million of the deposits into the escrow and used those funds to acquire target property in a like kind exchange. The intermediary never touched those funds. The intermediary had the other funds, but the intermediary never touched any of the $2 million of deposits. The issue is whether we have $2 million of boot or $1 million of boot under Section 1031B. Uh, Emerson Properties kept $1 million. There's no question that was boot. Uh, the Franchise Tax Board argues that all $2 million uh, would be boot. You'll see in the briefs of the Franchise Tax Board the word sale many times. This is not a sale. This is a like-kind exchange. It was never questioned whether it was a like-kind exchange. To the extent that there is cash or other property, boot, it would be under 1031B. And this is not just nitpicking. This is a, an important legal distinction because there's a big difference between a sale and reinvestment as opposed to a like-kind exchange where there's boot. There's no authority that I could find relating to the interplay of the open transaction doctrine, funds held under the open transaction doctrine, and a like kind exchange like this. Uh, we're dealing with a like kind exchanges, deferred exchanges have existed for decades. It's typical, it's the rule that in these transactions there will be deposits or option payments that are held open, and yet it's surprising. I've, I've looked hard haven't found anything. There's nothing in Section 1031. There's nothing in the regulations. Uh, no cases that I've located. Uh, no revenue rulings. No private letter rulings. Nothing that I could find. And the Franchise Tax Board cites various authorities, uh, but, but they don't apply. There's nothing mentioning the open transaction doctrine. There's a revenue ruling that the Franchise Tax Board cites, but, the, but all of the funds were uh, or some of the funds were uh, retained, none were put into the exchange in that ruling. So I, I haven't located anything right on point, which is surprising. Uh, and the Franchise Tax Board has not published any guidance on this issue, at least not that I've seen. It appears the Franchise Tax Board's making two arguments. Uh, one, uh, on, on uh, page 12 of its opening brief, it talks about how the taxpayer had actual receipt of funds during the exchange period. Well, actually, uh, Emerson Properties had the funds well before the exchange period. The exchange period starts at the time the relinquished property is transferred and then ends either at the end of a period described in the regs or at the acquisition of target property. Uh, on page 12 of its opening brief, we get some insight where the Franchise Tax Board says that the at the first closing, the um, funds were, quote, converted from an option payment to sales proceeds. Again, th this is not a sale, so that reference to sales proceeds is not, uh, not relevant or appropriate. But the word converted is important because nothing physically happened. Emerson Properties, Inc. held the cash in its pocket the day before the relinquished property closing and the day after. Physically, nothing happened. If anything happened, it would have to have been a tax event. So it appears the Franchise Tax Board is asking uh, this board 
to deem a tax event to have occurred. And Congress knows how to do that. Most famously, it's done that in connection with the distribution of property from a corporation, where it's deemed to be sold at market value. We see that in Internal Revenue Code Section 311 and 336. And there are other instances when Congress has stepped in and said, we will deem a transaction to have occurred, didn't do it here, and yet it appears that the Franchise Tax Board is asking this board to basically write the law rather than interpret it. The second argument it appears the Franchise Tax Board is making relates to language in the Deferred Exchange Regulations. Uh, the, the language essentially says, and it's in a couple of places, that if the taxpayer either has actual receipt or constructive receipt of cash during the exchange period before the acquisition of target property, basically, um, then the taxpayer has boot. Well, that would take the regs right out of context. Uh, stepping back, we had Starker and some other cases, but mostly Starker was the lead case on deferred exchanges. Then uh, Internal Revenue Code Section 1031 was amended to allow deferred exchanges within certain parameters, and then the regs followed and fleshed that out. Those regs do not mention anything about the pre-exchange period. They do not talk about option payments or deposits received before the exchange ever starts. So uh, that would take the regs out of context. And, and as I've acknowledged in the brief, had this been a case where the exchange intermediary had held these funds and if Emerson Properties Inc. so much as had the ability to draw on them, there would have been constructive receipt. But that, that's not our case. We're dealing with funds received before the exchange ever started under the open transaction doctrine and those regs just don't apply. And so it appears the Franchise Tax Board is asking this board to stretch the regs beyond their bounds. I think there's a practical solution here. The Franchise Tax Board occasionally issues notices. It's issued one this year that I'm aware of, nothing last year, a couple the prior two years, and, and they go, beyond, go years and years uh, issuing notices to the public, advising taxpayers and their advisors regarding how it might view a transaction. If the Franchise Tax Board were to issue a notice saying it is our view that, for example, any deposits or option payments received must go to the intermediary, even if it's far from clear there will ever be an exchange, set up an exchange, put the funds into the intermediary's hands, or we will consider them boot. Or if it were take the, to take the position that you have to get the funds back into the intermediary's hands before the closing of the relinquished property, which I think would have been the position here. I believe that if, if that had happened, this case would never be before the board. If those are the positions of the Franchise Tax Board, it should issue a public notice because what would happen as a practical matter is the exchange intermediaries who, for the most part, run these transactions and are very attuned to the developments in the law would immediately send e-blasts. It happens all the time. Lawyers and accountants would write articles. I'd be one of the first ones to write. I understand the area the news would spread very quickly and taxpayers and their advisors would get right into line. It wouldn't matter whether there are technical flaws in the Franchise Tax Board's analysis, which I think there are. It wouldn't matter. What would happen is taxpayers, advisors, and intermediaries would be cautious and they would essentially say if this is what, if you don't want to pick a fight with the Franchise Tax Board, this is how you behave. So that's the solution. Rather than attacking a taxpayer without notice, without any federal guidance, without any franchise tax board guidance or published notice, attacking a taxpayer and making arguments that just don't legally hold water, issue a notice, put taxpayers on notice as to the position, and this problem will be solved as a practical matter. Thank you. Um, franchise Tax Board, you have 10 minutes. Uh, if you would introduce yourself and begin your presentation. Good morning, Chairwoman Ma, members of the board. My name is Carolyn Kuduk. To my right is Chiro Imordino. We represent the Franchise Tax Board in this appeal. This case involves the execution of a Section 1031 exchange. Appellants exchanged property in Oakley, California for property in Scottsdale, Arizona. As my friend across the aisle stated, the FTB is not challenging the validity of the Section 1031 exchange. Um, the legal question in this appeal is, do appellants have to pay taxes when they actually receive $2 million in cash during a Section 1031 exchange? Emerson Properties 
was a company that appellants were shareholders of. It was an S corporation. Emerson Properties owned property in Oakley, California. In December 2006, Emerson Properties signed a sales agreement to, to sell that property in Oakley, California. According to the sales agreement, Emerson Properties would do a Section 1031 exchange, and the buyers of the Oakley property would give Emerson Properties $2.5 million in three tranches. Um, Emerson Properties would be able to keep that $2.5 million if the buyers did not buy the property. However, if the buyers did buy the Oakley property, then the $2.5 million would be counted towards the purchase price. It would be a buyer's credit. Prior to the closing of the Oakley property, the buyers paid appellants $2 million in two payments. Appellants took actual possession of the money. As your board's attorney notes in the hearing summary, and as appellants state, they were in actual receipt of the money. They had unfettered use of the money. There was no limitation on what appellants could do with that $2 million that was in their possession. In July 2008, Emerson Properties signed an exchange agreement. In that exchange agreement, they committed to replace the Oakley property with a like-kind property in Scottsdale, Arizona through a Section 1031 exchange. The exchange agreement made clear that as part of the Section 1031 exchange, Emerson Properties could not receive money from the Oakley property before they received the Scottsdale property without paying taxes on that money. Either in July or August of 2008, the qualified intermediary received $500,000 for the Section 1031 exchange. This $500,000 can be contrasted with the $2 million that Emerson Properties received before the se Section 1031 exchange began. The full $2.5 million that the buyers contributed to escrow before the e e Oakley property was sold was reflected in the closing statements as part of the sales proceeds. It was called an early re release of funds. On August 29th in 2008, the Oakley property was sold for over $13 million. In violation of the rule that appellants cannot receive cash in a like kind exchange, appellants received and kept over $2 million until November 3rd, 2008, one day before the Scottsdale property was bought. At that time, appellants placed $1 million of that $2 million in escrow to purchase the Scottsdale property, which closed one day later on November 4, 2008. Appellants then kept the other $1 million. As we have stated, the FTB is not challenging this Section 1031 exchange. In fact, appellants were able to defer taxes on over $10 million of gain on the sale of the Oakley property under Section 1031. FTB is only challenging the tax treatment of the $2 million that appellants took actual receipt of during the Section 1031 exchange period in violation of the strict rule that taxpayers cannot take actual receipt of cash during the Section 1031 exchange. As stated in your board's hearing summary, any money received in a Section 1031 exchange is taxable. <coughs> Your board's hearing summary notes in footnote 11, there's no relaxation of the requirements that appellants cannot receive cash during a section 1031 exchange. Your board's hearing summary also cites to law which states, even if the cash is reinvested in replacement property, once appellants take possession of that cash during a section 1031 exchange, it's taxable. In this appeal, Emerson Properties was an actual receipt of over $2 million of sale proceeds during the Section 1031 exchange. Appellants violated the specific requirement of Section 1031, and this cash cannot receive tax-deferred treatment under the specific requirements of Section 1031. Therefore, the law requires that appellants must pay taxes on the, this money that they actually received. In conclusion, FTB respectfully requests that you sustain its action in this manner. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rajardo. Uh, Rajardo, uh, five minutes on appeal. I counted six times when the Franchise Tax Board Council referred to receiving funds either during or in a Section 1031 exchange. That is not what happened here. 
Emerson Properties Inc. received the funds well before the Lycan Exchange was ever certain to occur. That's the, that's the central difference here. These funds were received under the Open Transaction Doctrine. Taxpayers can have unfettered use of funds during that period when they're held op under the Open Transaction Doctrine. The issue is whether funds received under the Open Transaction Doctrine can be used in a like-kind exchange. Emerson Properties retained one million and treated it as boot and transferred one million into the exchange. Those funds were not received in the exchange or during the exchange. So what the Franchise Tax Board appears to be asking this board to do is to deem a transaction to have occurred, to deem Emerson Properties to have received the funds during the exchange. It appears the Franchise Tax Board is saying that at the time the first closing occurred, Emerson Properties received the funds for tax purposes because we know that did not happen physically. It received the funds long ago. So there seems to be a disconnect between what the Franchise Tax Board is, is saying happened and what actually happened. And again, there are legal problems with the Franchise Tax Board's analysis, but the problem can be solved if it is a problem by simply giving notice to taxpayers and their advisors. Everybody will get right into line. Ms. Dowers. A quick question. To the appellant, $2.5 million was received, and you're saying it was part of an open transaction. Two million. The other five hundred thousand okay. dollars. Okay, just was, two million. Okay, two yes. million was part of an open transaction. Correct. A and one million, the t appellants, you all pay tax on. Correct. One it million was used in the exchange. It was transferred into the main escrow uh -huh. immediately prior to the closing on the target property. The intermediary did not touch okay. those funds. But the one million that was not, you, you, they did pay tax on that. Yes, they reported. And they paid money. tax on that because it was boot. Correct, because they didn't ever use that in the exchange. Okay. They simply retained it. So how could that be boot, meaning that it was part of the 1031, and the remaining $1 million was not part of the 1031? So the $1 million that was retained and not used in the exchange was treated as Section 1031 boot. The $1 million that was used in the exchange to acquire target property was treated as part of the exchange and deferred. Okay. But what my question is that the $1 million that you treated as boot, you're saying that you have a like-kind exchange. So how could the money that, you, that, that, that your client received, the, the $2 million from this transaction, how could one part be part of a like-kind exchange and another part is not part of the like-kind exchange? Oh, well, Whether it's taxable or not, it seems <clears throat> to me that it's one it is one transaction. Section 1031 solves that problem. Yes, yeah, so it's 1031. So if, if, if it's 1031 and they had control over the $2 million, you're violating the rules that you cannot have control over the cash proceeds. 1.1-1.1031 little k, saying two, that. Two separate issues. One, there can be boot in a like-kind exchange, and Section 1031B allows for that. So it is a like-kind exchange transaction, but there is cash or other property received, and that's treated as boot under Section 1031B. It is exactly the same thing we see with corporate reorgs, where Section 356 does the same thing. The dash K regs are deferred exchange regulations, and again, different, because they are regulations that apply during the exchange period. And so had Emerson Properties received the funds during that period from the intermediary, no question, it would have been boot. But this is a different case. Those funds were received under the Open Transaction Doctrine before the exchange ever started. There appears to be no legal authority out there. The IRS, Congress, nobody's issued authority on this. The Franchise Tax Board hasn't. It's a very different thing. So you can absolutely have boot. And Emerson Properties received and kept $1 million and reported it as 1031B boot. That's the proper treatment. It transferred $1 million into the exchange and deferred that. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, to the Franchise Tax Board. Yes. May, may I clarify something? Yes, please. Um, actually, Emerson Properties didn't pay taxes on $1 million in boot. They paid taxes on $808,000 <coughs> of boot. So I, I don't know what the difference is, but um, my friend across the aisle is saying $1 million, but in actuality it's 
808,808812. I stand. I'm just going to round up 200, just easier for me. I was focusing on was kept. Okay, that's that's fine. Didn't mean misleading. Um, to the franchise tax board. When are you seeing the 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 like kind exchange period started and end? Um, the like kind exchange period starts with the sale of the Oakley property, and when the Scottsdale property is bought. So, so when, what are the dates? What's the dates? Thank oh, you. <laughs> sorry. Um, it is August 29th, 2008, and November 4th, 2008. August 29, 2008, mm -hmm. that's the Oakley property? Right. And the replacement property is when? November 4th, 2008. 2008? Mm-hmm. Oh. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that time period, sir? Uh, I don't have the exact uh, dates, but I do see on page 10 of the opening brief where the Franchise Tax Board says that on August 29, 2008, the funds were converted from option payments to sales proceeds. Again, it's not a sale, but that is the date that was cited, so I'll assume that that was correct. When was the, give me to you, sir, um, the date that you guys received the $2 million? Long before that. That's the 06 Long date. before that. <sighs> to the Franchise Tax Board, um, in your experience, have you seen um, cases where Earnest money deposit is received years in advance, or a year in advance, two years in advance of the actual sale of the property? And if so, how is it normally treated? Well, um, <clears throat> there are transactions or structures where um, you'll have options for, it could be years before a um, property is either purchased or the option is allowed to lapse. Um, in those cases, when a 1031 is attempted, the option payments are always put into escrow before the relinquished property closes. And in this case, that would be on August 29th, 2008. Of course, here, they never put the money back into the escrow. They kept it until one day before they purchased the replacement property. But in that situation, that's the way it's generally done. It's not clear if that violates 1031. So if they had done it, you know, what's considered the proper way. The, the, there's no clear authority as to whether that is a valid 1031 or not a valid 1031. But of course here, they went way beyond you know, that structure where they put it in before escrow closes and they kept it during the 1031 exchange period. And so now we go into very clear authority that they had actual receipt of cash during the exchange period and it's all gonna have to be taxable boot. So had it just kind of for me, had they put the $2 million in escrow by August 28th, we would not be here. No, well, yeah, the, the law is not clear on that. But, okay. Um, so. The law is not clear. So you're just, that's been what the Franchise Tax Board has seen in the past where there's been options and the option will end up going into escrow. The entire amount goes into escrow. That's correct. You know, before the relinquished property closes, the funds are put back into escrow. Okay. Okay, that's May it. I respond to that? That is not my experience at all. One of the first transactions I did 25 years ago when starting to practice law involved option money that went into the exchange. I recently talked to some very sophisticated intermediaries, explained my case, and they said, oh, yeah, that ought to work. They did not say, well, we advise that the funds get transferred into the escrow. That is simply not my experience. In fact, I, there's just simply no authority out there. This is not a hot issue. When I get called on exchanges, it's about swap and drops and thing, drop and swaps. It, it, <laughs> it's not this there. issue. Let's not go there. <laughs> well, I'm just saying that this is not the hot issue. That, my experience is not that. And the statement about clear authority, receiving the exchange, again, those are deferred exchange regs. They do not address funds received before the exchange period under the open transaction doctrine. Okay. All right. Thank you. Helpful. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Mr. Runner. Yeah, just a quick question again on the procedure. So let me see if I, I get this right from FTB. If, again, in, in this kind of a structured, what the, the unique structure of this particular deal, um, there was some deposits made. The deposits were made uh, well before escrow, correct? Correct. Um, and, um, and if, did I just, would I, see if I heard this correctly. 
this would have qualified if those deposits then would have been transferred into the escrow prior to the sale? No, um, Did I miss, maybe I'm saying, I misunderstood that. No, if the, if the funds had been transferred into escrow before the relinquished property closed, then yes. the law is more great. It's okay, more okay, okay. undefined. But one okay, it's undefined. So there, obviously there's room, more room for interpretation. What you're bringing us is something that, has, in your opinion, has no room for interpretation, correct? That's correct. Okay. So that would be, that would be if indeed the seller did, or the buyer, or, well, the taxpayer did that, then it would be a s little different set of facts that would have to be talked about, and then we'd have to work through a murkier part of, of law. Is that fair? That's correct. Okay. But your premise is the fact that it doesn't qualify because he had, they had control of the money, right? That's correct. But wouldn't they have had control of the money prior to putting it into escrow too? And that's the exact reason why the structure you know, may not work. And so, you know, when I think when people when you say may not work, when you say may not work, what does that mean? Does that mean that mean the FTB would actually then disallow it? You know, we have not had one of those uh, cases, um, uh, you know, come up at appeal. Or we haven't seen well, the IRS has had a case you know, which has come up on that. And so there's no clear cases out there or no um, clear authority from the IRS or others saying there's gotta how be it's a, treated. It seems to me there's got to be a lot of very complicated exchanges out there that have dollars that that flow um, prior to an identification and escrow. Hunt. It can't be unusual. May I, may I yes. address your question? There are cases where, where taxpayers do take money out of a 1031 exchange before the ch exchange begins, and that money is taxable boot. There are cases like that, Long, Garcia. Well, the difference is that this was not identified at that time as an exchange. Is that, that is right? Not. Those cases involve taking money out of, a, uh, out of an exchange that's actually occurring. These funds were received long before the exchange ever started. Right. So the, these facts are, I think, a little different than what you're uh, illustrating. But in December 2006, Emerson Properties signed a sales agreement identifying that they were going to be doing a Section 1031 exchange. So they knew well before they got the, the $2 million that they were going to be doing a Section 1031 exchange. Nobody ever knows they're going to do an exchange. A lot of reasons why an exchange could fall out of bed. And even Starker says the fact that money might actually be retained doesn't defeat an exchange. I, I don't recall exactly what the nature of, of the language in that document was, but you never know whether you're going to do an exchange. I mean, things Is the assumption that you would, people do that in order to just keep their options open? Correct. But typically what happens is you enter into a purchase and sale agreement, yeah. and then you assign your rights and delegate your duties under the agreement to the exchange intermediary. And that happens once you know there's actually going to be a closing. That's how it works in the real world. Well, and again, that's what I'm trying to figure out if what we've got here is, a, is what could be a fairly common practice. Very common. And it, it, as counsel indicated, in many cases, <laughs> option proceeds are received years before you know whether there's even going to be a closing. A lot of times it happens when developers are trying to pick up property and they get entitlements. Yeah, because again, I, 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 I assume that this, this is a typical kind of, of, a, uh, of, a, of a transaction to where you know, somebody is wanting to sell a piece of property and somebody wanting to buy a piece of property. Um, the seller is wanting to see how serious and protect themselves, and so they get some money up front, whether it's a deposit. It may not be refundable. It keeps this buyer then serious about this, ex about, about this sale. If the buyer sell, backs out, the money then becomes, goes back, is, is belongs to the, to, to the seller, and is then just regular income at that point, correct? That's how it works. And in this case, what you're doing is you're getting that money in advance, to, in, in earnest money, in order to do that. The deal went through. And now you're wanting to, and now, the, but but the but the idea was that it was then then be structured then into this exchange. Correct. Okay, I may come back with that. Mr. Horton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, members, we may want to go to appeals. Uh, there seems to be a, a mixing of laws, if if I may. Um, I mean, this is very common. Very common. Um, but there are different set of laws that apply. When you have a simultaneous uh, 1031 exchange and the funds are in escrow, 
the open transaction doctrines clearly applies to that because the escrow is still open. And so you have an opportunity to move funds in and out of the escrow as long as you do it before it closes. However, if you move the funds outside of escrow and they stay outside of escrow, escrow closes, that transaction is finished. And that act in and of itself triggers a taxable transaction. That's when the tax is triggered. Then you open up a, I mean, you open up a, a 1031 deferred exchange and you identify the property within the limited amount of time extended to the 180 day. That's the subsequent transaction. But if you take funds from a previous transaction and move it into the subsequent tra transaction, it doesn't change the taxability when it was originally triggered. So this is common, you know, and it happens all the time. Uh, but it doesn't change the implications of the tax. And so if you, I, I, I can't remember the case, but I think it's Davis versus the United States or something like that, that sort of speaks to uh, this issue. But, uh, you know, I don't want to be the one putting it on record. I'd rather appeals. Uh, well, yeah, I just wanted to comment. You know, we have a transaction in front of us, and I wanted to try to uh, stick to the facts of that transaction. Uh, both parties maybe have different experiences about what they're seeing uh, at audit in FTB's case and in appellant's private practice. Uh, and certainly in many cases, they're earnest money deposits. Uh, obviously, that's the case. Uh, I would question whether it is typical for an advisor uh, to take earnest money and advise their taxpayers that they can retain actual receipt of that money uh, through, uh, through and during the exchange period. Uh, it would be an odd result if a taxpayer who received money prior to the exchange period was in a better position uh, than a taxpayer who had control of the money constructively during the, tra dur during the exchange period. Let me, let me restate that. Uh, a taxpayer that had control over money during the exchange period would unquestionably, under the regulations, uh, recognize taxable boot. Uh, here, the taxpayer uh, had actual receipt, uh, not, not constructive, uh, not deemed, uncontestedly had actual receipt of the cash during the exchange period. And I'd also note that the regulation on point doesn't refer to the receipt of cash uh, during the exchange period. It refers to the receipt of cash prior to the uh, obtaining the replacement property. Prior to the obtaining of the replacement property. Uh, that's the language in the regulation. Yeah. Um, May I address some of these points? Um, but, and, and, you know, I mean, if you look at the intent of the 1031 exchange, Congress is relatively clear that their intent is to provide the taxpayer an opportunity to make this exchange. However, uh, at no point in the transaction shall the taxpayer retain possession of the funds and be able to control those funds in such a way to deposit them into their personal bank account, uh, use them however they will, and subsequently make a decision to now reinvest it back into the into the 1031 exchange property. That's a conscious act and conscious control. And so, you know, I, I mean, I get the, I, I commend you for the argument, um, and, but they're, you know, two different bodies of law. And the, the first time when it happened, as soon as you pull those, those funds out, you know, you trigger a taxable event. I'd like to address several points. Number one, there was a reference to two transactions. This is all one transaction, one like kind of exchange. In that case, and you're contradicting yourself. Not at all. No, it's a single transaction, and 1031B governs. It's not two transactions at all. The tax laws treat this as one, and that's why we have Section 1031. Uh, Second, it, taxpayers do, in fact, retain funds all the time under the open transaction doctrine. Third, the regulations do not say that you cannot receive property before the exchange period. Those regulations, to, to, to apply them to transact to, to funds received before the exchange period takes them completely out of context. Again, there was Starker, there was an amendment to 1031, and then the regs came along, and they deal only with the deferred exchange period. So to say that there's a better result, it seems odd that there's a better result if you actually receive funds and have them in your pocket. It's a better result than I you would otherwise get. It is true, and yet, 
to, to get a different result, you actually have to make a policy decision and draft something into the tax law that doesn't exist. And this is federal tax law being incorporated into, by reference into California law. And what the Franchise Tax Board is asking this board to do is effectively draft something to solve a perceived problem. The way to solve the problem is not to attack on weak technical grounds, but to give taxpayers notice. They will fall into line. Yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate your argument, I mean, uh, but I think the Supreme Court s disagrees. Uh, I also think that there are a number of cases where they just fundamentally disagree. Uh, and so it's difficult for me to, and, and I mean, uh, I mean, I've done 1031 exchanges before uh, for about five years before going to the legislature and to advise the tax. I wouldn't advise a client to take money out of the process. Uh, that's not the intent of the law. And so I can't remember the case exactly, but it's Logan Bennett versus Logan or something like that, U.S. Supreme Court, that says, you know, the value of the property is established at the point, I mean, anyway. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court has most certainly not addressed this issue. Well, and this is I, not taking I mean, they, they've addressed the open transaction doctrine. They've addressed, addressed when the value of the property is established. They've addressed uh, the uh, issue of uh, deposit and pulling funds out of a transaction. Uh, even, and if this was a continuous transaction, still that bodes to the argument that you shouldn't have pulled the funds out of that transaction, even if it occurred prior to opening the 1031 exchange or commencing the 1031 exchange. The funds were, were in, not in the out. argument that it was unknown is is an argument that says that you had com you had finalized the transaction and then subsequently decided to enter into a 1031 exchange, which is somewhat inconsistent with the facts. But I, I, this is not a I'm, I mean this is just my opinion. You still have four other members to convince. Ms. Harkey. Thank you. Okay, uh, just to uh, uh, start out, uh, to address your taxpayer notice, we can take that up and maybe establish that procedure at a later time. I understand what you're saying, and I'm very supportive of doing so. If the board wishes to, wishes to do that, I'll be happy to take that under consideration. But um, It is true that, ta that uh, money received as part of the purchase option is not taxable until the option is exercised. Is that correct? Okay. Exercised or, or yeah. lapsed? And in this case, the option was exercised when the buyers bought the property on August 29, 2008. Is that correct? That's my understanding, but I don't think that that's a correct statement of the law that it becomes taxable okay, this, in the option. Okay, I'm not debating exercise. now. I'm just asking a yes or a no. Okay. Um, in 2006, this is for the FTB, FTB, there was a sales agreement that noted there was going to be a 1031. Yes. Yes, that's true. Do you concur with that? I, I have not reviewed the file to... to look at that language, but I'll assume that that's correct. Thank you. So I know we have said there's a bit murkiness around, you know, when the options received and the FTB will have to clarify that at some point uh, with us and probably in, in future cases. But it would seem to me that with the 2006 sales agreement, it was kind of an understanding. You did take that your client did take the money out and in 2008, once the option, I used to work with a lot of land purchases and publicly traded and private home builders, so I understand the option element of this. But if this was in fact going to be a 1031, it would seem to me that the minute you had resolved that, that money should have come back. I, w one thing I question is whether the agreement simply had the standard language <coughs> saying that it may be a 1031. I okay, but on August 29th, so that, that's kind of enough, though. You don't have it. The, the FTB does, but, but, but I'm not going to ask for proof. I, I don't what think I'm saying, on August 29th, 2008, did, you, did your client establish that there was going to be a 1031? No, I don't believe so. I believe that language was the standard language saying that, a, that the parties will 
accommodate a like kind exchange. As I recall now, it was, a, it was a standard purchase and sale agreement with language saying that there would be exchange accommodation. That's typical language. It's boilerplate almost. That doesn't mean that the parties are committing to an exchange. But, well, if there wasn't an exchange, then the whole amount was, was taxable. Is that but, not but true? But there was an exchange. And, and so the okay, issue... So there either was an exchange... There was. And it was completed, and money was taken out earlier, and money wasn't put back once the agreement was made, or you're saying there wasn't an exchange, in that case, the tax bill is much higher? There was most certainly a like-kind exchange, but the deposits were received under the open transaction doctrine, and then the exchange occurred later. Yeah, so the, ex then the exchange occurred August 29, 2008. And the funds were have. received well before that. And so $1 million of the deposit funds were used in the exchange to acquire target property. $1 million were retained. So it wasn't clear whether there would even be a closing. Then it was clear there would be a closing, and the, property, the transaction was then structured as an exchange, and an exchange occurred. And so then there was some boot in the exchange. And the issue is whether it's all $2 million or $1 million and change. Right. I understand that. So why wouldn't they have put, why wouldn't your client have put the money in, the million that, that is in dispute, in in August 2008 once they realized, and once they had a qualified intermediary? Or better yet, why wouldn't they keep the options somewhere that would not be under their control? I, I wasn't involved in structuring the transaction, so I don't know the thought process. But as I said, when I first came to town, it's one of the first transactions we did. Deposits and option money are often kept. And then right. they're using they it. are, but they're not part of a 1031 if they're kept. Not true. Not necessarily. That's the whole issue here is whether they can be or the extent to which they can be used in an exchange. And as I've pointed out, there is no legal authority dealing with the use of funds received under the open transaction doctrine before the exchange, the use of those funds in the exchange. That's there's simply no authority on that. But point. I believe we're talking about once the exchange occurred, which is August 29, 2008. Is that when? Well, the it was a deferred exchange, so it was a process. That was the process. That's it once. That's at that point. once you got a qualified intermediary for the for everything. So that's when the first did. disposition occurred. And then right. And so at that point in time, when you were sure that it wasn't all taxable that you were trying to put some back in. Why didn't you put it back? Why didn't you put it back Again, in? I was not involved in structuring the transaction, but what the Franchise Tax Board is asking this board to conclude is that the failure to put all of those funds into the exchange at that time to put the money in the intermediary's hands causes a deemed receipt of the funds because the taxpayer already held the money in its pocket. So Franchise Tax Board is asking this board to conclude that an event occurred for tax purposes. Congress, the Treasury, the IRS, they've never gone down that path. Well, I don't, I'm not so sure how, about that. <laughs> All of my analysis seems to indicate that if the, uh, if, even if the cash is reinvested in replacement property after being received, either actually or constructively, and I think we've ruled on something up here before that not the same issue, but very similar, uh, from the sale of relinquished property it will not be allowed under IRC section 1031 if it was not done through the use of a safe harbor. If there is a sale and reinvestment, that is a problem. This was not a sale and reinvestment. This was a like-kind exchange. Boot right. is tested under 1031B. I mean, we, we need to focus on the technical issues, and that's how this works. I think we're trying to, but, you know, you're trying to get this all around. And I like to say ducky bunny. You had the money here. You knew about the transaction here. You had an opportunity to reinvest the money over here, and we probably wouldn't be sitting here. You did not. You took some of it. Not you, but your client took some of it, and then they put some in at the very end. During that time between this ducky, this bunny, and this ducky, we had constructive use of the cash. You had. Your Actual client Actual use did. of the cash. Actual use of the cash. Right. And Actual that's okay. Actual use of the cash. Open well, you're saying doctor. it's okay. Yeah, open transaction and doctrine. FTB says, is saying it's not okay. And, and my FTB can't cite to any authority that okay. deals with the interplay of the open transaction doctrine and like kind of exchanges like this. This is no, I, I think, I an think open area. I think these things much too complex. You had the money, 
you could have taken it, you would have paid all cash on it, but you didn't. You reinvested some of it, but you didn't reinvest it at the time. You reinvested it back probably when you finally knew what you really had to have for the deal. In the meantime, there was use of the money. And so that's boot, in my opinion. And I think legally it's very supportable that it was boot. So I appreciate your argument. I think you've done a great job. But keeping it real simple, which is really what this is. This is actually not simple. This is complicated yeah, it is. tax no law. Nothing is that complex. This is. Nothing in life is that complex. You just got to break it down. You got to break it down. What are the facts? You had the money here. It, it was option money. You knew about the transaction over here. You didn't put the money in until over here and only part of it. So, and there was no qualified intermediary. So that's where I have a problem. Thank well, you. there was. The intermediary just didn't handle these funds. Yeah, the intermediary didn't handle funds, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Runner. Are oh, you done? Yeah. You're good? Okay. Um, is there a motion? Move to sustain the Franchise Tax Board. Second. Okay, the motion is to sustain the Franchise Tax Board by Ms. Towers, um, seconded by Mr. Horton. Uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Ms. Ma? Is there any objection? Oh, no objection. Then, um, oh, okay. <clears throat> Thank you. By consent. Thank you, Mr. Rajardo. Thank you, Franchise Tax Board. Ms. Richmond, please call the next case. Our next case is B4, Frank Sheen and Stephanie Sheen. Please come forward. Okay, um, Mr. Ambrose, please introduce the issues in this case. The issues in, uh, before the board in this appeal are whether appellants have shown error in the proposed assessment, which is based on a federal action, and whether appellants have established that a portion of their income is not subject to California income tax in 2009. And I'd just like to bring to the board's attention to, to put in the record that um, the Franchise Tax Board, by letter dated May 19, 2016, <laughs> Um, they, <clears throat> beg your pardon, they have conceded um, Ms. Uh, Shine's um, sick pay income and, um, so, and, and have so notified the appellants and the revised proposed assessment of additional tax is $983 plus applicable interest. So the issue of uh, Ms. Shine's sick pay income is, is not before the board today. Okay, very good. Um, Taxpayers, if you would please introduce yourself for the record and begin your presentation. You have 10 minutes for your initial presentation and then five minutes on rebuttal. I'm Stephanie Sheen. I'm Frank Sheen. Okay. Please begin. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for hearing the case today. As it stands, we did receive a voice message uh, from the uh, board that they have agreed that we were not residents of California during the 2009 tax year. Okay. Uh, and California, and they're not going to consider my wife's income, sick pay income, as California income. I am now addressing the new issue, which is if we were not California residents at the time, and the only basis that the tax board is asking us to pay more taxes on the amount of money that we did pay, which was my severance pay. They're basing their uh, determination on our federal audit. The federal audit was separate from what California had deemed as California taxes, 
why are we being asked to pay additional taxes? Okay. So, actually, I'm just here. We're just here to ask for more time. Yeah, more time to assess the numbers that the uh, Federal Tax Board came up to determine that we owe them 900 some odd dollars, $993. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Shine. Franchise Tax Sheen. Board, you have 10 minutes? Sheen. Sheen? Sheen. 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 Um, Franchise Tax Board, please uh, introduce yourself for the record, and you have 10 minutes. Good morning, Chairwoman Ma and Board Members. I'm Eric Brown, representing uh, Franchise Tax Board, and with me is Diane Ewing, also a Franchise Tax Board. The issue in this appeal is taxation of California source income paid to appellant Frank Sheen for services performed in California as a resident of California while employed by his California employer. Respondent's examination of appellant's 2009 California return was prompted by receipt of notice of a federal action and respondent made additional adjustments. During the course of appellant's protest and appeal, Appellants provided additional documents to respondent that resulted in respondent making additional adjustments in appellant's favor. In the first instance, respondent revised its NPA and reduced additional tax owed from $2,553 in the original NPA to $1,868. The second time, respondent further reduced additional tax owed from $1,868 to $1,667. And finally, respondent made an additional adjustment by including only appellant Frank Sheen's gross income from his California employer and also appellant's California-based rental income. The adjustment resulted in a further reduction of additional tax owed, which is now $983. At this point, appellants dispute only taxation of appellant's California source income. Appellants filed a California non-resident return for tax year 2009 and reported that they were residents of Texas. They reported rental income from residential real property in San Jose, California. They also reported gross income from Mr. Sheen's former employer, a California employer. Because Mr. Sheen performed services for his employer in California during the time he was an employee and a California resident, gross income from that employer is deemed to be California source income. Appellants do not claim that there was error in the way FTB calculated appellants' tax, but claim that they were not California residents and should therefore not be subject to California taxation. The law provides that non-residents and part-year residents are taxed on income derived from a California source. In this appeal, appellants received rental income from residential real property that is located in California. Appellants also received income from severance pay, vacation pay, and other items of gross income paid to Frank Sheen. The law has long recognized that these sources of income are derived from California sources, and non-residents and part-year residents are subjected to California taxation accordingly. Appellant Stephanie Sheen received income from Unum Life Insurance Company of America third-party plans, and the payor reported the income to Employment Development Department of California as personal income tax wages. Upon review of all the evidence, however, respondent has excluded income paid to appellant Stephanie Sheen from Unum and recalculated appellant's tax liability at $983 based on Mr. Sheen's California source income from Phillips Lumilids Lighting Company of $43,417 and net rental income from rental of their San Jose, California property of $14. Appellants have not established error in FTB's actions, and the NPA should therefore be sustained, and I would be happy to respond to any questions. Thank you. Mr. Sheen, five minutes on rebuttal. Okay, yes, in fact, uh, we are not disputing the simple fact that the uh, severance pay paid out in 2009. I was uh, let go in 2008, and the um, payment was to be paid in February of 2009. So we do not dispute the fact that $43,000 was to be California tax income, in which we did pay California taxes of 2000 California tax of 2000 I got it here. 
$2,495. Okay, so, and then uh, that, that severance pay actually was paid at a 48% tax rate. So uh, we do not question the fact that Cal uh, California State Tax, I mean Board, redid the taxes, but it turns out that they redid the taxes in their favor. There were many deductions that could have and should have been included had we done them ourselves as an uh, revised tax form. So I'm questioning the amount of, that they came up with and I cannot, well, I'm not going to say I can't, I will, I don't think it's fair to allow them to make the determination of what type of deductions we would be as, uh, privy to for the $43,000 taxes, I mean income. So I'm just basically asking for the time to do the numbers ourselves and see if we come up with the same numbers that they come up with. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Horton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is there a reason that you haven't submitted information to the department as to what your deductions could have been, should have been? Yes, because it wasn't, but recently that they determined that we were non-residents. Okay. All right. Up until now, we had been corresponded with one another, and there was no decision made why we're here today. So if I'm understanding your testimony, it is that you concur that this was California-based income. Yes. However, the deductions uh, provided by the deductions allowed by the Internal Revenue, I presume, uh, was not sufficient, and you're contesting those deductions that they establish. No. I'm not contesting what the Internal Revenue had decided because well, that was let, separate. Let me let me let me let me restate that. I believe the Franchise Tax Board is using the information that the Internal Revenue established. And so if they're using that information to compute your California based tax return, uh, you would probably be in dispute of the, the information that they use which they obtain from the Internal Revenue. And you would probably want to um, provide additional documentation to support that you're entitled to additional deductions uh, on your California-based tax returns. For example, if there were expenses on your property that were not pr properly claimed, you felt there were additional expenses uh, that should have been claimed that wasn't reported, and you have documentation to support that, or some other deduction that may be available to you. Uh, yes, we do have the documentation, and it was all reported. It, the deductions were reported, but after talking to the um, department, the department, they had split up our interest payments to our property in California to where it's, they see us making a profit off of the income from the house, from our house. And I don't agree with them doing it that way. I have got to admit I am no tax lawyer. And, but um, using TurboTax, the interest payments that we pay on the home are merely deducted from the income okay. as a loss. I get it. Um, members, um, there may be just a simple mis misunderstanding of the law that may be able to be clarified by having the department and the taxpayer meet and confer on these additional documentations that are available. Uh, and we're in no position to audit or to make a decision based on information we don't have and, uh, you know, subjective statements. So, um, uh, may, may we comment? Yes. Uh, we did meet and confer prior to 
coming up here today, and we were trying to explain the California method, which is very difficult, and they had a Texas tax preparer, so in my experience is not very many people outside California <laughs> know exactly how to do that, but um, what uh, I think Mr. Sheen is referring to in terms of is, you know, deductions not allowed is, for, for example, the mortgage interest. When we learned that the house had been rented for four months, the mortgage interest on that house, eight months of it was applied on the Schedule E as an expense, mm -hmm. and four months of it was applied on their Schedule A mm -hmm. as an itemized deduction. And that's the, is the sort of thing. Now, um, one thing that came out, good thing that for, for appellants that came out of our conversation is we got to talking about the security deposit. In addition to $16,000 in rent income, they received a $3,000 security deposit. Now, they made it very clear that they're, they've kept that money separate and apart from any other um, income they received. So we could take that off of the rental income, which would bring the rent income down from 19 to 16, and, and we'll do that uh, post this hearing. Okay. Because sometimes uh, the security deposit can be used for expenses and other things like that, and they've made it clear they're not doing that. Okay. Um, I mean, this is, this is evolving, appears to be evolving in the right direction where um, we have the benefit of accomplishing a, two, two, two very important things. One is the education of the taxpayer for future filings and future communication. Uh, two, the resolution of a tax matter uh, that had that evolution taken place prior to this hearing probably could have been resolved um, to the taxpayer's satisfaction. Uh, the inherent uh, challenge before the board is that additional time is going to lapse, which means if it's not resolved, additional interest and all of that, so maybe there's a way that the department can take in consideration that as well in their deliberation. Uh, well, wanna, I uh, think Mr. Sheen may have a comment on that additional time. Um, Yes, I got a yes and no where I would like additional time to prepare our own taxes uh, just using the California basis as opposed to using the federal basis. And um, the, 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 if I may, Mr. Sheen, uh, not to interrupt you, sir, the department seems to be prepared to make a $3,000 adjustment to your income based on your security deposit, presuming that other funds and adjusting your uh, income down in the calculation, um, which could affect a number of other uh, expenses relative to your Schedule E, um, ultimately, um, and carrying that forward. Uh, so it, it, it appears that this amount may very well That's disappear at the end of the day uh, uh, or be reduced significantly. Uh, but, you know, it's not uncommon for the board uh, to just go ahead and do that just to get it out of the way uh, if that seems to be the consensus of all the parties that there is subsequent adjustments to be made. And considering uh, uh, my colleague's uh, perspective relative to the additional time that the state may incur and expenses the state may incur in trying to resolve something that appears to be resolved or close to being resolved, you know, uh, we might just go ahead and rule yeah. in favor of the appellant and get it over with. Yeah, I thought I heard it that way. It just took me a minute to, right. <laughs> to decipher. I so. expected that. All right. Sounds like the... Mm -hmm. Okay, so okay, maybe you can just yeah, uh, uh, yeah. My, my concern, Madam Chair, is that confirm the motion is is that the the case is evolving, and uh, the department it has 
done the right thing and the department is taking, has taken the information under consideration, the amounts involved uh, would take a calculation that would require all these additional facts. So based on the facts provided to us, uh, I would believe that additional adjustment is, is warranted uh, to the expense, uh, relative to the expenses and the deductions on the taxpayer's tax return that would zero this amount out and therefore rule in favor of um, Grant. The appellant granting uh, the uh, reducing the amount down to zero and granting in favor of the appellant. Thank you. There's a second. I second. second. Okay. Uh, Does the franchise questions by the franchise tax board? Um, I'm not sure I understand the motion because um, in favor of appellant would. Um, do away with the tax altogether, it seems. Yeah, there's $993. Hmm? 983. 983. Right. It's 983 and then whatever adjustment we could make by removing the $3,000. Right. And so the motion, motion was, the motion was yeah, to I grant mean, the it, appeal it, under the yeah. assumption yeah, that well, once the $3,000 was money. adjusted and worked its way through the return, that there probably would be, would yeah, be no, down to zero. I don't know the actual effect the three thousand dollar would make, but it, it seems there would probably still be some tax due. Maybe not worth another trip out here from Texas. I don't know. Oh, absolutely. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just kind of <laughs> thinking this has been going on for a long time, and we just got notice of an adjustment. And um, I, I, I appreciate that you, uh, the, that the department is willing to look at and make another adjustment. So in the calculation of this, I think that it, it appears that if not zero, it will be real close to zero. Well, so. ma Madam Chair, if I may. Um, yes, Mr. Horton. What other expenses do you believe that you're entitled to? We weren't, uh, we weren't granted moving expenses. Uh, when you say moving expenses, be more explicit, please. Uh, well, in 2008, once I was terminated from my job and uh, given, given the service, I had no more ties with that company, and therefore it, it didn't make sense to stay in California for the 2009 tax year. So we moved out of California to our residence in Texas. So. We were allowed those deductions by the federal government. California, we did not file any of the information to California. As they stated in their deposition, I mean, in their paperwork, that we neglected to say that my wife's income was part of California's. We didn't report it as on the California uh, non-residence form and other things that we didn't include. Well, did you, did you move? Well... I don't know that moving expenses, expenses relative to the property, did, mm -hmm. you, did you, when you, you sold the property? No. You still have it? Still have it. Um, did you, are there any expenses relative to the property? Yes, we continue that, to come back and forth. We did You come back and forth to manage the property? Yeah. Yes. During the year in question? Yeah. Yes. During the taxable year in question? In the 2009, yes. We returned to... Uh, make sure it got rented out correctly. Um, we did a lot of little things so, so, back and uh, forth. Not to have you delineate all those things, but relative to the expenses attributed to managing the property, renting it out, and so forth, were those expenses reflected on your on your federal tax returns? No, not all of them. Are there any other expenses that may or may not have been reflected on your federal tax returns? May not have been. Did you did you take out? I I don't want to ask you leading questions, so it's yeah. going to be incumbent upon you to to articulate what you feel these expenses might be. Well, there's there's several expenses, but I can't put them all in the all right. question right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Madam Chair, I I I would kind of defer to the to the to the appellant. Uh, on the time matter, given that he they reside in Texas, um, w w uh, 
I mean, there are a number of, you know what, I hate, I hate to, to, to not have the, not hate, I don't hate anything, <laughs> but what I would like to see is that the, uh, the department provide the appellant with a list of possible expenses that could have been claimed and then determine if they were a claim. Maintenance costs, utilities, repair, uh, as it's related to the property. I, on the service pay, whether or not uh, there was adjustments to the service pay for various things that we could attribute that would have caused the actual amount uh, to be less than what was actually re reported. I still have concerns about the cost to the state of California of adjudicating a case that seems to be um, a misunderstanding and a lack of uh, understanding on the part of the taxpayer as to what is deductible and not deductible. And as we have evolved to a point that they, everybody seems to be a, in agreement that there are additional um, expenses. Um, and so, uh, and the legal fees uh, related to, uh, uh, fees and costs related to trying to resolve a taxable matter in that period, uh, or rental and so forth, as long as it's related to the property, I don't know where these numbers get us, Madam Chair. Uh, one or two things, uh, mm -hmm. defer it, see if the department and the, the appellant can work it out, uh, put it over, see if they can go in the back, give them an office in the back, see if they can work it out to save the taxpayers a little bit of money of having to have this matter come back before us um, and then report back to the board through appeals. I mean, I defer to the parties and the board. Yeah, real quick. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Runner. Yeah, I, I mean, if we can like, get this worked out this afternoon, that would be great. Because clearly what I don't think we want to do is we don't want the taxpayer to have to figure out how to get back here from Texas. We don't FT, want FTB to spend a number of hours. We could quickly burn up the $983 um, to, try to try to get this resolved. So, I mean, it seemed to me that at least what I'm hearing is because of the because of the sourcing issue, there now are some issues to which the taxpayer feels that they're entitled to, as a result of that, that have not been identified in the current in, in how they when they have when they originally filed their taxes, yeah. and so therefore they they believe that that would lower their liability. Yeah. So I, my concern is I'm not sure how FTB then calculates that. Right. Um, I don't expect the FTB to then do their tax return for them under these situations. No, but I think we need to say hey. You know, are we getting close enough here to where it's going to cost us more money for both the state and the taxpayer to try to find the last $100? Um, and so I'm fine with putting this over, getting them to work it out, and for us to take this back up then uh, on, on a decision then at the end of the day. How does that sound to everyone? Um, that sounds good except for one question. I, I heard the board say zero out. <laughs> and and then I hear, uh, yeah. Um, well, you members, I, I, the tax, they said no. no. So okay, we have a motion. May I speak to that? Uh, it's, we're not Madam sure Chair. whether it would. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Horton. Um, I, uh, I'm just deferring back to you. I'm not answering his question. May he speak okay. to it? Okay. Well, there was a motion on the floor. Do you want to? I'm not. Funny. Ask for a substitute motion. I've never heard of a deputy. Uh, or do you want to? At this point, subsequent motion to maybe split the baby or something. I don't, I don't know. I mean, he's, go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair, I, your, your thoughts? I don't want to comment. Oh, okay, Ms. Stowers. Sorry. I'm sorry. So we can get there. Okay, so there is a motion basically to grant by Mr. Horry and second by Ms. Harkey. There's some discussion on that at least $3,000 would be coming off to reduce the income and possible other expenses, whether it be expenses related to the actual property here, preparing the property, getting it ready for rental, coming back to California, um, flight to and from California, from Texas. Um, it's, a lot. it's a lot of expenses. It, it, I, I, I really understand where Mr. Horton is coming from, that once you go through all the calculations, mm -hmm. the, 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 the amount at issue well, could be close to zero. Ms. Stowe, if, if I may, uh, uh, I don't know, what's your tax bracket? 30%? <laughs> During the 2009? Yeah. I mean, 
what, what, what everybody's paying a lot of taxes, so you got yeah. Be, but you know. back then, with the severance pay, it was taxed at a tax rate of forty eight percent. Forty eight percent. Forty eight percent of three thousand. I mean, I understand the adjustments. I understand whether you carry forward, and I get all that. But. <laughs> um, uh, let's go to appeals. Uh, what they have to okay, say. appeals. By my, I, mean, I was just going to suggest. I think the parties had direction. The board would like the parties to try to resolve it if they can, and there's some avenues for discussion. And I know there's not a desire of anybody in this room to extend it unduly, but maybe it would make sense to uh, give the parties some time to talk together, and if necessary, provide more briefing. But hopefully they can resolve it without the necessity uh, for briefing. Looking at these extra issues, members, I move to take the matter. We withdraw my motion. Move to take the matter on submission, uh, pending discussion of the parties uh, and communication back to the board through appeals. Okay. Um, seconded. Uh, motion is to take this uh, matter into submission. Hear this again later on, and then um, if there's any resolution, and then Ms. Harkey seconds it. Uh, without objection. Um, I, I, just to clarify, I know they're, you, they're in Texas now. You're, so in Texas. I you have to get back. Uh, I'm uh, guessing maybe we don't want it to come back for an oral hearing if it comes back. Uh, I would just we're, we're taking it for discussion well, later today. All there today. Yeah, today. Oh, My, we're going to give them time today. My mistake. Don't yeah. go to Texas today. Oh, we're <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. That worked for the department. <coughs> you guys uh, schedule all that. To work through lunch, maybe, or something. Yes. Uh, okay. Mr. Gow, maybe we can provide them a conference room. All right. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Ms. Richmond, next item. <coughs> that concludes our matters for this morning session. Next item. Okay, and we will return at 1.30. <coughs> thank you.
Okay, the board meeting is reconvening. Ms. Richmond, please uh, call the first item. Good afternoon, members. Our first item on the afternoon agenda is item F, public hearings. Item F1, proposed adoption of cigarette and tobacco products tax regulation 4076, wholesale cost of tobacco products. <coughs> Thank you, and to the department, if you would please introduce yourself for the record and then commence your presentation. Thank you, Chairman, <coughs> Chairwoman Ma, members of the board. I'm Pamela Mash from the board's legal department, along with Bradley Heller, also from the legal department. I'm here to request that the board vote to adopt proposed special regulation, uh, special taxes regulation 4076, wholesale cost of tobacco products. The proposed regulation clarifies the meaning of the term wholesale cost of tobacco products as defined in Revenue and Taxation Code Section 30017. I understand there's someone who appear to speak on this. Yes, we have one public speaker, Mr. Dennis Sloper. If you would please come to the front. You will have three minutes for your presentation. And please introduce yourself for the record. Um, Chairwoman Ma, members, uh, Dennis Sloper for the California Distributors Association. Uh, we've reviewed the regulation, and unless I hear something different from what legal has to say, we're in support. Okay. Okay, members, any questions, comments? <laughs> Seeing none, do I have a motion to accept staff recommendation? So moved, Madam Chair. Okay, um, motion by Mr. Horton, seconded by Ms. Second. Ms. Stowers. Uh, without objection. Item carries. Next item, Ms. Richmond. Our next item is F2, Business Taxpayer Bill of Rights hearings, and we do have several speakers. Okay, welcome, Mr. Gilman. If you would please introduce yourself for the record and commence your presentation. Good afternoon, members. Uh, Todd Gilman, Taxpayers' Rights Advocate with the State Board of Equalization. Um, let me get organized here real quick. Uh, first off, I'd like to uh, bring to the board's attention, I believe we have some um, distinguished individuals in the audience. Um, I believe uh, we had a contact from uh, Assemblywoman Patty Lopez that expressed interest in coming to the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, so I don't know if she's in the audience. She said she was going to make an appearance. And also we have Honorable Assessor uh, Kathleen Kelleher uh, in the audience as well. And I believe we have one other assessor, but uh, I'm not certain, but I want to make sure that they are um, acknowledged and recognized for being in the audience. Uh, Ms. Kalahar is here uh, representing the California Assessors Association today for the assessors. So we'll move on to the hearings. Uh, this is the Business Taxes Taxpayer Bill of Rights hearings for Sacramento, May 24th, 2016, where individuals have the opportunity to present their ideas, concerns, and recommendations regarding legislation, the quality of agency services, and other issues the board in related to the board's administration of its tax programs, including sales and use tax, environmental fees, excise taxes, and any other issues identified in the Taxpayers' Rights Advocate's 2014-2015 annual report. Um, we have three business tax speakers. If you would like them to come up now, I can. OK, great. Um, we have speaker cards from Jesse McClellan, from Rex Halverson, and Jean Christopher. And if there are others who would like to speak, if you would please come up to the clerk and um, fill out a speaker form. For business tax? Yeah. Wow. Doing this for business tax? Wow. To the speakers, um, if you would please um, Introduce yourself for the record. You have three minutes each, and we may ask you additional questions after. We hear um, your presentation as well as uh, Mr. Gilman's response, and then we'll be opening it up for member comments. Thank you, Mr. McClellan. Thank you. My name is Jesse McClellan with McClellan Davis, uh, and I wanted to thank the board uh, for giving us this opportunity to present our concerns. Thank you, Madam Chair and board members. Um, also wanted to thank the taxpayers advocate Todd Gilman and uh, his office for uh, working with 
me on this particular issue that I'm presenting today, um, and also a number of other issues that him and his office has helped us with historically. Um, they really do a great job helping us to, to resolve matters. Um, the issue uh, that, that uh, I want to address today, and there's actually two, there's um, a second issue that, that just came up. Um, but the first issue, I, I think it's a relatively simple one. Um, I think the solution uh, should be relatively simple. Um, and it's that when you have a case that's scheduled for a board hearing, um, there's times where it's removed from the hearing, uh, whether it be from, from legal or the department. Um, and sometimes there's, uh, there's no reason provided for the removal. Um, and, and there's never a, a time frame um, that's provided to, uh, for us to give to our clients, to the taxpayer, to say, look, uh, we can anticipate this being resolved or back on the calendar within 30 days, 90 days, a year, whatever it may be. There, there just isn't a time frame. Um, so, so really uh, what we're asking for is that there be some guidelines set up um, and that there be some identif identifiable time frame and every case is unique, and, and some um, extenuating circumstances may warrant additional time, so I, I think it's appropriate to allow for that opportunity to have additional time. Um, but I think it would be good to at least have a time frame, um, whether it be 30 days or 60 days or 90 days, uh, to either resolve the matter, request an extension for more time, or to bring it back to the calendar. Um, and that's the first issue. Uh, the second issue goes to administ uh, administrative protests. Um, they used to be referred to as late protests. So if a timely petition is not filed, uh, you have the opportunity to file an administrative protest, which essentially gives you the rights uh, that are provided under a timely petition. Um, sometimes they're accepted and other times they're, they're not. So the concern is when they're not accepted, there's not really a process in place to have it looked at, to have a second set of eyes put on the administrative protest to, to figure out why it was denied. Um, and, and my thoughts in general there are that under an administrative protest, because it's not under a standard petition, the board can still take collection action. But, but I think we should err on the side of giving taxpayers the opportunity to have their case heard. Um, and I think it would be a good safeguard uh, to, to at least have someone else look at the denial to figure out, well, why wasn't this accepted? And thank you. Okay. Thank you. Next speaker. <clears throat> good afternoon. My name is Rex Halverson, and I'm a tax attorney and the former Deputy State Controller Tax, and having the privilege of sitting on this board from the years 95 to 98 for the Honorable Kathleen Connell. I've practiced state and local tax now for 38 years and would like to make the following comments about two cases that I have currently and one matter of customer service. Case number one involved a $214,000 tax assessment against an innocent spouse who merely made the mistake of applying for and signing the BOE seller's permit for her resident alien husband's used car lot. Taxpayer found me eight years after the initial assessment and well after the appeals deadline in an effort to do an offer and compromise or make installment payments. Within weeks, we found the actual pertinent records, so we supplied all of those to the collections unit. Although this matter is not yet closed, the taxpayer went through eight years of worry and hell when the actual liability is closer to 56000 than 214000 and she's paid over 46000 in the Chapter 13 bankruptcy, so she owes close to 8000 The problem, the original assessment was a rush to judgment, a guess, a wildly inaccurate guess, plunging an innocent spouse with four children into a nightmare that should never have been as scary as it was portrayed. The solution, in my humble opinion, more time should be spent in reviewing these estimated assessments long before the NOAs or NPAs are issued in dual assessments. Now, case number two involves a taxpayer who built his gas station in 2009 down in the Bay Area. It was the first gas station in the Bay Area to carry E85 fuel. E85 fuel is an alcohol fuel blend that contains ethanol and no more than 15% gasoline by volume. During the next six or seven years, the gas station owner was never told that he had to have a separate BOE permit 
for selling E85 fuel and a use fuel tech permit for selling all other types of vehicle fuels, gasoline and diesel. The Special Taxes and Fees Division handles the use fuel tax and a separate division handles the motor vehicle fuel tax. So, I don't understand why. In my, in my taxpayer's case, he never knew he had to have a second permit. And now the BOE is going back to 2009 in their audit because he never had a permit. That's not fair. <clears throat> this is a perfect example, in my opinion, of a waste of valuable BOE audit assets. One auditor should be able to handle both fuels. Lastly, the definition of E85 fuel is hardly helpful to taxpayers in BOE publications, as many times the gasoline content of the E85 fuel exceeds the maximum percentage of gasoline, 15%, thus making the fuel a blended fuel rather than E85 fuel, and blended fuel is subject to used fuel tax rather than the motor vehicle fuel tax. My client has multiple examples of invoices for fuel that reflect this fact. In other words, he'll actually take how much gasoline was put into the tank, then he'll take how much ethanol was put into the tank, and the gasoline is 16%, so he thinks he's subject to a different tax. My last comment is about the front counter at BOE headquarters. Over my long career, I've dropped off petitions for redetermination and records requested by BOE auditors or BOE collections at the front desk, and for the most part have been greeted by a very warm and friendly staff. Most of my petitions had to be date stamps so that they had a record of timely filing. In the last two years, though, I've noticed there's more resistance at the front desk to taking my hand-delivered items. Staff have advised me that, they can no longer, that I can no longer drop off files or petitions. And staff, instead, staff or I must call the person that the package is addressed to, and I must wait for that person to come down and pick up the package. Sometimes I might wait 10 minutes, sometimes 30. Sometimes I've given up and walked off after calling the person for you know, 10 or 20 times. But the last time this happened to me, when I did walk off, I mailed the package and it never arrived. The front desk staff have said to me and advised me in no uncertain terms, I cannot simply drop it off because many people never pick up the mail from them. I know that BOE staff are busy, but the front desk is usually staffed by two to four people and it represents the face of the BOE. If customer service is important to the BOE, I think that the BOE members should consider allowing tax practitioners to continue to hand deliver packages and petitions for redetermination and perhaps ask staff to deliver those packages to the mail room if not picked up by the addressee at the end of the day. My suggestion stems from the fact that U.S. Mail has lost no fewer than three of my packages mailed to the BOE and FTB in 38 years, and those are only the ones I know of. On a positive note, appeals are moving faster than any time that I recall, and both my clients and other practitioners are extremely grateful to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Yes, my name is Gene Christopher. I'm a taxpayer and a citizen. Um, I came across... Um, a situation the other the other day at the, a local hardware store where I had some screens replaced. I'm sure the screens probably cost less than a dollar, but they charged me tax on forty dollars labor. And I asked them why they do this, and they said, "Well, that's they have to charge tax on uh, on this. Uh, it's a minor amount. I realize that, but I think if you." extrapolated over a period of a number of people is a lot of money that they're paying that they shouldn't be. And he also said they paid, uh, you have to pay tax on service to lawnmowers. Well, if you uh, sharpen a lawnmower, I don't think there's much uh, product or merchandise in that lawnmower servicing, and they shouldn't be charging tax for that. Um, I do have one other thing. I'll make it short and sweet. Um, I was a member of a Rotary Club for over 30 years, a number of clubs. Uh, we do a lot of good work throughout the community, throughout the world, in fact, for some clubs. Um, there is a tax exemption, a sales tax exemption for service clubs. However, I would defy you to tell me a service club that gets that tax exemption. I had uh, a situation personally where I belonged to a club. I looked into it to try to get us exempt from the tax and you couldn't do it. I asked the gentleman, how do you do it? What do we have to do to be able to get that tax exemption? And he could not tell me or would not tell me. And I don't know if it's a deep down secret or what it is, but 
There's a reason that the people that put these rules together wanted service clubs to get an exemption for meals. So to, and basically that's what I'm talking about. And uh, they had a reason for doing that, but there isn't anybody that can tell me how you could do it. So I just thought I wanted to pass that on. You can do what you want with it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Christopher. Okay, Mr. Gilman, would you like to respond? Uh, yes. Um, well, we'll start off with Mr. McClellan. First off, I want to thank Mr. McClellan. I want to thank all the taxpayers, for that matter, for appearing before you today. Uh, it's not often always easy to get down to downtown Sacramento, but they've made the effort, so it's obviously important to them. So, uh, again, uh, I believe uh, Mr. McClellan's suggestion is reasonable, and uh, we can do a better job when it comes to providing taxpayers with something substantive as to why a case has been pulled uh, from going forward to a board hearing. Um, also, providing the taxpayer with something meaningful regarding when and if the case is going to come back um, will provide the taxpayer a sense of finality. And I think that's part of what they sometimes um, suffer from, which is the anxiety of this has been going on for a few years. You know, when is this case going to come back? Um, but maybe, you know, the case is pulled for a good reason, which means it's not going to come back because there's a decision that's made or an adjustment made that's going to benefit the taxpayer. So it kind of goes both ways. but. It goes back to the information that would be helpful to them. Um, and also, as mentioned by Mr. McClellan, um, with respect to his recommendation in his memo, um, th this might be a topic that may be suited for our um, business taxes committee uh, in order to get all the issues on the table with respect to, you know, when, if, when, how much information we're going to provide taxpayers when it comes to a case being pulled. Um, but it was just a recommendation that he had made in the uh, written submission that he had provided to the board. Um, so I think they're good recommendations, and my plan is to work with our um, BOA staff to see whether or not we can incorporate what he recommends. With respect to Mr. Halverson's issues, um, I think that, um, first off, I didn't get a chance to look at the cases, so it would be helpful if we had um, some account numbers uh, with respect, and I'll be following up with Mr. Halverson on that. Um, uh, with regards to case number one, um, I don't know how recent this uh, actually happened, but um, uh, it, th there's definitely some things that we can look into to see whether or not um, we're assessing the right amount of tax to the individual that apparently, from what Mr. Halverson, Mr. Halverson is saying, uh, was just a, a name on a permit, but she was not the decision maker of the business. Um, so my plan is to assign that to one of our uh, technical advisors to look at his case to see what the facts are, what happened, and see if we can figure out uh, what the resolution would be with respect to that case. On the second matter, um, I had a chance to look into this one with the E85 in the gas stations. Um, I have some good news. It sounds, from, from what I understand, the board is, has developed a letter. I don't think it's available, but it's going through clearance uh, to be sent to taxpayers uh, asking them if they would like to have a combined audit. So that would partially address what Mr. Halverson is recommending or concerned about where if a taxpayer um, is scheduled for a tax audit, they now can make the decision as to whether or not it's going to be one auditor out there or two auditors that are going to be conducting not only a routine sales tax audit, but maybe a motor, a motor carrier audit or a used fuel tax audit. So that should address um, some of those issues with respect to that concern. And then as far as the uh, dropping off mail at the counter, yeah, I I'm sure that it's important to everyone that um, our counter staff are the face of the BOE when taxpayers come in. Um, I'm going to follow up with our um, deputy director of admin to find out what exact exactly is the policy and if uh, taxpayers are not allowed to drop off materials, they should be. Um, we should be responsible for directing that information to the appropriate section. So, And then with uh, Mr. Christopher. Uh, Mr. Christopher um, and I spoke this uh, afternoon, and um, I, I'm not sure whether the retailer is charging tax correctly. There's four different types of labor: um, repair labor and uh, assembly, or repair labor and installation labor are generally not taxable. Um, and what he described is more of a repair labor. So our plan is to follow up with um, the retailer to see if they're charging tax correctly, and then also let Mr. Um, Mr. Christopher know that if they are overcharging tax, he would be entitled to a refund from the retailer. Um, with respect to his last issue um, on the social clubs, I, I, there's some narrative out there and some information with respect to how tax applies to social clubs. Uh, 
and I'm not quite sure exactly how it works with them. So my plan is to go back and research the uh, concern that he has and see how um, those types of organizations are treated when it comes to taxation. So, Excuse me. If I could just say not only social clubs, but service clubs. Service clubs. Well, yeah. There is an exemption in the rules. Okay. okay. Uh, members. Mr. Renner. Just a couple of follow-up, um, uh, particularly in regard to, well, let me just go down the line on a couple of these. Um, the issue of the contact, when, when it is that an issue, when an um, appeal has been um, delayed or not taken off agenda, R right now I think what takes place is it basically ends up a communication from board proceedings. Um, when somebody's case is, is going to get uh, postponed. Is that the normal process? Not all of those letters always hit my desk, but I, to, to my recollection, the last one that came off came directly from appeals. So there was from a, appeals. From, from, a, from appeals. From that, last that was actually part of my concern, is that, is, is that oftentimes, at least my understanding is that oftentimes it just a, uh, you know, there'll just be a contact from, from board proceedings, and board proceedings doesn't really know anything other than that is not going to be on the calendar. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's important that one of the issues we may have to do is engage appeals if they're not in, uh, engaged in some of these to be able to give either explanation or at least let, I would assume, at least let um, board proceedings give the individual taxpayer the information of who to contact. Um, you know, at that point, I think that's I think that would be the the, the key process because right now, I think. Uh, with, with right now, just going going to uh, board proceedings, you're basically just communicating the taxpayer us on the agenda, correct? Correct. Yeah, and we just usually tell them that their case is being deferred because we don't because you don't know. You, correct. Right. So I think we need to do some extra effort in regards to, to to that. So I think if we could go ahead and again, as we review that, see how that could be done in order to inform the taxpayer and give them some 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 additional information. I think certainly a timetable is good because, mm -hmm. again. I think oftentimes this is just, you know, um, you know, kind of the way things happen in government, right? We're going to get delayed, and we know that that means the next hearing, or it's going to take two hearings, but the taxpayer who's maybe been in this queue for the last three years doesn't know that. Right. right. And so I think a lot of times it's just being able to then just help them give some parameters to them at that. So I think that would, in, in, in regards to that. Let me, in regards to the, to the Mr. Halverson's concerns, the couple, one of the other issues you brought up was the dual permits. Two permits that are required? Correct, for a gas station. For a gas station? If you have E85 fuel, it's a separate permit, different, different tax. I think we need to make sure that we review our, 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 um, our publications. And, uh, and again, um, again, it would be interesting to, again, to go back, not only our publications, but also go to our website uh, to ensure that, that, that there's some instruction at that point. If you're opening up a, a, a gas station, that should be one of the things that we take them through in this checklist of making sure you have the right things um, in order for them to, to do that. Because I don't think, it, they may certainly think they only need the one permit and go and do that. And then we require a second permit. Uh, and then they don't really know that until, unless we, unless they are aware that this, that certain fuel needs a certain, a different kind of permit. So I, I think we need to review the, the permitting process to ensure to see both, the, both online and also in our offices to know if we are instructing properly somebody who's opening up that kind of business. I think we've, we actually hit this with the issue that came up once before when we issue about uh, fuel tank registration too, right, right. Right? right? I mean, all of a sudden, you know, somebody realized they open a gas and they realized, oh, I didn't know I needed a fuel tank. To, and right. again, they need, we need to have a good clear checklist of if somebody's in a certain kind of business of the kind of permits they should be seeking to then have um, at, the, at that point. Um, to me, that would be a, an, a, an important issue um, that we need to, uh, to, to, to address in that process. Um, anyhow, so those are my, my observations on those. Okay, um, Mr. Horton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I share Mr. Runner's concern, uh, but in, in addition to what he said, but the other challenge is, is that the Board of Equalization, um, some often operates in silos. And so each permit could actually have a different set of auditors who are coming out to examine uh, the gas station. An underground storage permit, for example, is, mm -hmm. is, is examined by a different part of the agency sales and use tax, different part of the agency, 
However, the taxpayer is not aware of that. And so when someone from sales and use tax come out, they uh, from the Board of Equalization, if I have an underground storage issue, they should have said something or should have cleared it. And so we run into uh, 6596 issue uh, when we have the audit and the audit didn't mention the storage and use tax. So it's something that the board has sort of grappled with uh, for a number of years, uh, even sought legislation, no, not legislation, but administrative policy to try to, and as Mr. Renner indicated, some kind of education to try to accomplish uh, that, those objective of resolving that. So, you know, we appreciate you bringing the point forward and sharing it with us. Um, the customer service issue, <clears throat> my experience in the last 30 years of the Board of Equalization is that the BOE has some pretty kind-hearted people who ultimately want to do whatever they can to serve. Uh, they're innately service-oriented or they wouldn't be working for the state. <laughs> um, and so what we may have is a policy issue uh, where some policy may have been established without our knowledge. And so again, you know, we, we appreciate that uh, coming uh, to, to bear. Uh, and um, the other concern, the social club, I agree with Mr. Uh, the, te the Taxpayer Bill of Rights Advocate, Ooh, uh, uh, the, it, it may be more of an understanding of the issues which hopefully we can resolve. Uh, and then, but the one, in the one of the ways that I look at concerns expressed by the taxpayer, and I think it's indicative of the entire board, is that one complaint is really tantamount to 200 complaints because there are probably another 200 people out there who feel the same way that you feel but just didn't have the opportunity to come before us. And so I think when we treat it as such, what happens is, is that it enhances our responsiveness and elevates uh, the issue to a point that maybe we may need to look at some pamphlets or means of education uh, our taxpayers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you. So I have a couple of, oh, Ms. Harkey. Okay. Um, so I just have a couple of things. Um, we didn't touch on the administrative protests yet. And I'm, I'm just, I'm just wondering, yeah, um, you know, some of like the appeals and protests, you know, um, not sure if we've ever talked about having like a real independent outside person look at it versus someone who's um, in the process, you know, um, engaged in the or, or has a stake at either the outcome. Um, that's one of the things that I've um, questioned in the last year. Well, I, what I can say is that you know the administrative protest is overseen by the petition section and the uh, refund section. Um, you know, I was speaking to Mr. McClellan before the hearing that generally what happens when a taxpayer uh, wants to apply for an administrative protest, um, it is based on certain, um, I want to put this, um, certain requirements that a taxpayer has to meet in order to um, be allowed into an administrative protest. For example, maybe the taxpayer um, wasn't noticed properly and the taxpayer didn't have adequate time to respond, or possibly the taxpayer has, uh, has been um, at a commission, for lack of a better way of saying it, they were ill or something was happening where they didn't have ample time to respond to uh, a notice of determination to file a timely petition, or maybe they're in the middle of changing tax practitioners. That happens too, um, to where maybe they've <clears throat> let somebody go and now they're hiring somebody else, and for whatever reason it didn't get approved. But um, what Mr. McClellan is touching on is something entirely different. Um, there are other circumstances outside of that that we need to look at as an agency to see whether or not those types of cases would be allowed in under administrative protest. So, is that what you're, Mr. McClellan? Uh, yes. the 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 cases that that I'm thinking of, and and one in particular um, that was recent, is is really, um, it gets a little complicated. We don't need to go into that now. But but the the gist of it is that it's a case where I think once somebody looks at it they're going to agree that the liability should have never been issued in the first place. I mean, it's inevitable if, if, the, um, if the evidence is looked at. 
and really it stemmed from an inquiry from the return analysis unit after the business had closed for a year or greater. I think it was one or two years. So the business didn't respond because it was a shell of an entity. And so the process oftentimes is to issue an estimated bill at that point because records aren't coming in in response to the inquiry. That then led to a personal liability um, billing that was issued that wasn't apparently received. And, and we're contesting that, but really what we're looking at is the underlying evidence of the LLC liability. And we got a, a letter the next day basically saying, look, this is denied. And my thought is there's no way they went through all the documentation that we went through and developed and presented. And that if somebody just looks at it, I, I think there's a very good chance that they would agree with us. And at the end of the day, there's really not a process that we're aware of, um, aside from exercising various channels to, to try and get this done um, for taxpayers to call and say, look, can you take a second look at this um, to try to get some eyes on it? And, and that's, that's indicative of, of the, the sort of concerns that we have with those cases. Okay, Mr. Gilman. Well, I mean, as Mr. McClellan states, I mean, every case is obviously unique and different. And it's going to depend on a number of factors in terms of whether or not a case would qualify for an administrative protest or not. But I think what he's trying to say or recommending um, is a process to, that might be either inside or outside the current process that allows the taxpayer to provide a set of facts that maybe weren't looked at before. And if there is some kind of independent body that can, kind of like what you're suggesting, that can look at those cases and make a decision as to whether they should or shouldn't be allowed in um, would be helpful for the taxpayer because I think what he's trying to point out is that it could have been resolved much earlier in the process as opposed to you know months if not I don't know how many maybe not years but months down the road so so does it make sense if like like your shop well it was kind of funny you mentioned that because I was thinking the same thing so <laughs> is this like a you know would it be uh, something that comes to the taxpayers' rights advocate's office to do an independent review and make a recommendation um, as to whether or not we believe? Uh, I think I'll Mr. Runner right has there. a question. So let me just yeah. ask. Again, I, I think it's something for review. Um, right. and, and, and I think maybe it's something that we can, I mean, since we work together on right. the customer, customer service, service committee, right. maybe it's something we can just bring on the committee. We'll work with, 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 um, uh, Mr. Gilman, on, the, on that issue to see if we can come okay. to a resolution on it. I actually wanted to follow up on one other item, and that is, again, we could set up whatever systems are good, and of course that's where we want to catch a lot of the issues. But oftentimes, some you can have the you can have effective systems, but boy, something just isn't getting handled right. Mm -hmm. To me, what you're describing there, Mr. McAllen, is is a perfect time to call up a board member to say, hey, look, can you, can you have you guys review this mm -hmm. so that we can see if there's a process and bring the big people together? So I'm hoping that you're using those tools, too. Uh, again, that doesn't solve the big problem, and, and certainly we don't want to have people calling us on every one. We'd rather set up systems that solve the problem. Right. But sometimes the systems don't work. Mm -hmm. and, and at the bottom line, what I'd like to do is make sure that if we've got a constituent out there who just needs some extra attention to see if something is handled correctly, um, boy, I'd encourage you to help direct them to, to our member offices, too, to help us assist. Well, I, I don't want us people to call us, and then we call the uh, ED. petition and refund section and say, hey, can you look at it again? They're like, well, we denied it once. We looked at it. We denied it again, right? I mean, that's not the point of it, right? No, it's sometimes just it's just someone. Yeah, sometimes it's just look, the process. Yeah, so someone, I think, mm. some group, and maybe, you know, maybe you can work on it in we'll your work. committee and yep. figure out you know, what the process is so at least, you know, people feel like someone did actually look at it. take another look at it, right? Um, my other question is you mentioned four types of labor. Right. Um, and you mentioned repair labor, installment labor. Um, so what are the other two? Since the other two are assembly and fabrication. So those are generally the two taxable forms of labor. And the other two types of labor are generally non-taxable. So assembly and installation like if you install a part on a car, generally the labor that goes into installing a part on a car is not going to be taxable. Okay. Um, repair, like if you're repairing the screen, for example, that he's talking about, generally is not going to be considered taxable labor. So. Okay, well, it seems if there's confusion out there uh, with retailers, perhaps we, um, I'll include it in my newsletter, and I know we all have newsletters that right. we send out, so maybe we'll um, mm -hmm. yeah, put 
um, yes, the four types of labor and which ones are taxable and which ones are not. So I thank you, Mr. Christopher, for bringing that forward. Um, thank you. Anybody else have I questions? Ms. Harkey. Hi, thank you. No, I, I, I appreciate that too. There's just one thing I'd like to say is that if, if um, the gentleman is, is going to get a refund, let's be sure that the retailer that misunderstood doesn't go through a lot of pain. Let's okay. be sure this is a simple one-step process. The board refunds, he gets his refund, so we don't have to drag this out for the retailer. Um, the fuels interested me, that if you have an E85 fuel and you mix it and then you get a different tax structure, can you expand on that for me? Yeah, well, I'd like to reiterate one point. Remember, this is a gas station that just as it was being built, um, uh, actually uh, E85 was brought to it, and the people selling the E85 said, look, we'll put in the pumps for you, et cetera. So he really got caught after he had done his, originally, his original permit. So now... In E85 fuel, it can't have any more than 15% gasoline, so it's called maximum 15% gasoline. The problem is that the way it's actually bought is that your truck trailer will go over to pick up the, the gasoline at one place and load it into the large uh, tanker, and then it will drive to the ethanol fueling station and dump in the ethanol at the same, I mean, into the same tank. Then the truck drives along and they mix. So. <laughs> by the time the guy gets, check. <laughs> by the time the guy gets the bill, though, it breaks out how many gallons of gasoline went in there and how many gallons of ethanol went in there. And when the guy double checks to see if it's E85, even though it's labeled as such on an invoice, he actually does the math. And when you find more than 15% of gas, that falls outside your definition in the publications. And therefore, he starts saying, well, then i got to collect the motor vehicle fuel tax and not the use fuel tax. And that's created a problem because all of a sudden he gets then audited by both saying, no, you did this one wrong and you took the wrong credit and here you did this one wrong and we get this. Plus, we're going to go back as many years as seven because you didn't have that other permit. And that's your problem, not ours. So it's rather complicated, but the publications are wrong and um, they, we need to clean up the definition of E85. It might be easier to say, if, if you're selling E85 fuel, this is the tax that applies. And we don't care how much gasoline is in there. But if you don't start breaking out that it doesn't have a maximum of 15%, these people get into blended fuel and they, and the, and they come up with a total. Yeah, I can answer. see it's a real gotcha and catch yeah. 22. I'm not sure, but that sounds like it might be something for is business there, taxes. Is that the law? I mean, what requires the I don't know. Let's, let's research yeah. it, and I'd love to work with you, Todd, and, oh. and see just to be sure we get clear as exactly what's going on, and maybe we'll look at the two regs or whatever and okay. find out what the situation is and if we can do it with just some cleanup language or if we actually have to have legislative language. Yes, ma'am. Okay, because I thought that was that was way too confusing. As for the mailroom delivery, I think yes. You know, if you bring it in, we ought to be able to get it to a mailroom. If nothing else, I would think we'd have responsible people. But I bet you that there's been parcels lost or claimed to be lost, and so now all of a sudden the rule is don't take it. And so I think we can work with that. We might want to just give a little cover to the uh, front desk people. Um, as for identifiable time frame for rescheduling hearing. I have wondered, too, if they just fall off the radar screen and go away, if they're really being worked on, if there's a resolution, if they're just being pulled because they think maybe the board's not going to be favorable. Uh, you know, I have my own suspicions, and I just kind of would like to know what the reasons are when things fall off the agenda as well. So I think in any event, we should have some kind of uh, an explanation, especially for the taxpayer, and maybe even whatever we can communicate to the board as to what the reason is. Um, and there you go. I think that's it. Thank you very much for bringing these Thank forward. You. Okay, Mr. Horton. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I just wanted to, to sort of explore the administrative hearing uh, process. Uh, as we consider what to do with that, um, uh, I'm always concerned about taking action based on the exception and, and not the rule. And uh, because in, in doing so, inherently, we 
create a greater bureaucracy that makes it challenging oftentimes. And so uh, let me also recommend that one of the efforts might be to educate the representatives about the uh, process uh, and relative to the chain of command. Uh, taxpayers rights advocate is currently available. Uh, we don't really need to establish that. You can currently contact the taxpayers rights advocate with any concerns whatsoever, including whether or not the information was looked at properly. Uh, the executive director, uh, the hierarchy within the appeals process, uh, they're all currently available. And uh, with, uh, now if they have been contacted in the past and that hasn't worked and the data that has been provided, you have not had a, a, a fair chance or your, uh, your, your uh, opportunity, uh, no one's given an objective view of that data after they've looked at it and they have not been fair about that, uh, that's a different concern. But if it never has been looked at, then that's an inherent problem that the system itself ought to be able to address. Um, and so uh, uh, maybe more of the taxpayers' rights hearings, maybe a, an outreach effort directly to the representatives to make them aware of the power of your office and uh, the responsiveness or the, the role of the ED. Uh, as well as the other hierarchy within the system to be able to address those concerns. Uh, again, you know, uh, I have found that the agency is extremely responsive and wants to be that way, and I'm always concerned about creating further bureaucracy that makes it even more challenging uh, to resolve the matter at, within the existing system and at the lowest level possible. Okay, seeing no further comments, um, thank you very much, uh, speakers, uh, for coming down. Thank you, Mr. Gilman. Thank you, members. Um, this was an informational uh, item, so we will go to the next item. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, just for the record, we have one written submission that I wanted to read into the record real quick. Sure. Um, that a gentleman uh, had sent us a document. And um, we received a uh, anonymous document last night. Um, where a business owner in San Francisco expressed concerns with the BOE's cost of recovery fees. Um, the taxpayer feels the fees punish small business owners for having a liability when they are already struggling, and the taxpayer states that the cost of recovery fee is unjust, aggressive, and counterproductive and needs to be abolished. Also, the taxpayer states that when a payment has been earmarked for a specific tax period or periods, BOE should honor those payments and apply them towards taxes first and not the cost of recovery fee. So I'm in the process of researching this. Again, we don't know who this taxpayer is, but we'll certainly work with um, District 2, D2, uh, with respect to their management and, and your ACOF to make sure that uh, we uh, provide them with information uh, based on what we've been able to um, develop. Again, we don't know who this taxpayer is. So, and what's the cost recovery fee? It's a. It's a. It was passed by. Um, well, it's a law that was put into effect. It basically, reimburses the board for the cost of collecting from taxpayers. So, uh, it's a graduated amount over time. So, apparently, this individual has um, some fees that have added up, and it's apparently affecting his business, and he's not happy. Okay. So. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, that concludes the business taxes taxpayer bill of rights hearing. We'll move on to the property taxes taxpayer bill of rights hearings. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Mon, members of the board, Todd Gilman, taxpayers rights advocate with the BOE. Uh, this is the property taxes taxpayer bill of rights hearing for Sacramento, uh, May 24, 2016, where individuals have the opportunity to present their ideas, concerns, and recommendations regarding legislation, the quality of agency services, and other issues related to the board's administration of its tax programs, including state and county property tax programs, and any issues identified in the taxpayers rights advocate 2014 2015 annual report. And I believe we have four speakers signed in. I have five speakers. Five speakers. Okay. Yes. So if the following speakers would please come up. Mr. David 
Jarrett. Mr. David here. Um, I see Mr. Assemblymember Gibson here. What is your timeline? You got some time. Okay, good. Um, okay. Um, okay, is Mr. Jarrett here? David Jarrett? No? Okay, Tim Phyllis? If you could please come up to the front. Denise Friedman? John Gamper? And Howard Cato? If you guys want to come up after. That would be great. So you have three minutes for your presentation, and um, there may be additional questions after Mr. Gilman um, makes his remarks to your remarks, and then it'll be open to board member okay. questions. Um, well, it would probably be proper to have Mr. Phyllis go first. Mr. Phyllis, uh, you were the first one that contacted us that said that you wanted to come to the Taxpayer Bill of Rights hearing. Mr. Phyllis uh, came to us last year, if you recall, and he was in Culver City in June and has a ongoing property tax matter with the Humboldt County Assessor. So I'll let Mr. Phyllis have his time. Okay, thank you. My name is Tim Phyllis. Um, I live in Humboldt County, and I purchased property in 2013. And um, last year at Culver City, I did a presentation, and I've been in contact with the uh, Property Taxpayers <laughs> Advocates Office. And so uh, my struggle is continuing. Uh, I did have a meeting with uh, Mr. Gilman, Mr. Sutter, and uh, Council Moon, uh, yesterday. Uh, some of what I was going to present today um, is in currently in litigation, so we won't, we probably won't go over that. But I do have some copies that I would like you guys to have. Okay, these, uh, these pages are numbered. Um, I think I'm going to start with um, page number nine. And this is the original uh, tax bill I've, I got from the assessor's office for 2014-15. It shows a taxable value on this tax bill of $472,000. Uh, the purchase price in 2013 was $153,000. Um, according to the laws that I read, this is in violation of Revenue and Taxation Code. And those laws would be 50, 110.1, uh, and 110B. Um, also, to support those would be Property Tax Rule 460. That's page 11. And the one in particular is Rule 460B6, where it says, taxable value means the base year full value adjusted for any given lien date as required by law, or the full cash value for the same lien date, whichever is less. Okay, so that tells me that it's going to be the lesser of the two. The lesser of 472 and 153 would be 153. If the assessor does nothing and has no evidence uh, the value placed on the roll should be the full cash value as determined by Section 110. And that is the purchase price. That would be the default setting for value. And, okay, so let's move on to page 24. Page 24 is for determining value. Now, this is all about determining value. And remember, the assessor did not determine any value until November of 2014, well after the roll was completed for 2014-15. Uh, uh, everyone uh, seems to try to step over uh, the law for determining value, and that is 110B. Section 110B says... Uh, the purchase price is rebuttably presumed to be the full cash value. Before determining a value other than the purchase price, an assessor must provide evidence the sale did not take place in an open market transaction. If this evidence is not presented, 
value is already determined by Section 110B. Uh, so if there's no evidence it was not open market, then uh, it's already determined and there's nothing that needs to be done after that. And to bring this to the attention of all concerned, the assessment appeals manual, this is page 26. Uh, it says, the party asserting the full cash value is other than the purchase price paid, bears the burden of proving that the sale was not an open market transaction. And again, relating to uh, appeals hearings, um, if the assessor does not enroll the purchase price, they bear the burden of proof and must provide evidence the sale was not an open market transaction. So these two things say that she needs evidence this was not an open market transaction. Now, page 27, this is a statement by the Humboldt County Assessor on November 21st, 2014, and she stated she does not have this evidence. An assessor can't just decide they don't like the purchase price and come up with a different value. No one has the authority to step over the law. Section 110B is the law for determining the value of real property. And I went back and researched at the archives and I came up with uh, a letter from Assemblyman Quackenbush in 1988. He's the author of AB 3382, which is now Section 110B. The Board of Equalization supported passage of this bill. In this article, he describes exactly where I'm at and his bill was intended to stop this type of behavior by assessors. Okay, page uh, 31, please. I, got, I received some responses from uh, your council in uh, January of 2016. In these responses, council cites, in defense of the Humboldt County Assessor, council cites Guild Wineries in, uh, versus Fresno. This is in 1975. Okay, there's a, a more current appellate court ruling. This is Maples versus Kern County, page 32. And this is in 2002. Um, it counters the guilds by stating the sale by itself is now sufficient to establish value in the absence of evidence the sale was not an open market transaction. Maples came after Prop 13 in 1978 and after Section 110B in 1989. I, I think it's reasonable to expect that a ruling in 2002 would be more applicable than one before 1978, which is when acquisition value became the law. Remember, in November of 2014, the Humboldt County Assessor declared she has no evidence this was not an open market transaction. It's interesting that a taxpayer has to go to such great lengths to get answers about valuation of their property. Time's expired. Okay, thank you, Ms. Phyllis. Perhaps we'll have some more questions uh, great. after that. Um, Ms. Ms. Friedman. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. <laughs> Good afternoon, Chairman Ma and honorable members of the board. My name is Denise Friedman. I am here to ask for your help with an issue involving Proposition 90. In 2011, I sold my home of 32 years in Los Angeles and bought a home in San Diego of equal or lesser value using Proposition 90, which is Section 69.5 of the Revenue and Taxation Code. I plan to transfer the base year value from my Los Angeles home to my San Diego home so that my property tax expense would not increase. Although I met the statutory requirements, my Proposition 90 claim was denied because of incorrect guidance that the board issued to assessors. This guidance began as a position taken by a lawyer for the board in an adaptation in 1988 and found its way into the assessor's handbook. Because of this guidance, my annual property tax bill is now double the amount I expected to pay. As I will explain, the position taken 30 years ago is incorrect. And although it is not binding on anyone, it has been outstanding for so long that the assessors feel they must follow it. I am here to respectfully request that the board correct this erroneous position. 
In 2011, after my husband died and my children had started families of their own, I sold my home in Los Angeles that my late husband and I had owned for 32 years and moved back to San Diego where I grew up. In 2011, the market value of my home in Los Angeles was slightly more than double the assessed value. Buying a new home having the same value would cause my annual property tax expense to more than double. This is a consequence of Proposition 13 that makes it difficult for seniors living on fixed income to relocate. That is why Proposition 90 was passed. Prop 90 allows seniors to relocate or downsize without increasing their annual property tax expense. This is a one-time benefit. Specifically, Prop 90 provides that a person over 55 years of age may transfer that pay base year value of the original property to a replacement dwelling of equal or lesser value that is purchased or newly constructed by that person as his or her principal residence within two years of the sale of the original property. I sold my Los Angeles home and purchased my San Diego house within two months thus meeting the statutory requirements. However, my claim was denied and my property tax bill more than doubled. Why? The house that I bought in San Diego was the house I grew up in. When my father died in 2009, he left his home to me and my three siblings in equal shares. My siblings and I had been holding on to it because we wanted to keep it in the family. I reached an agreement with my siblings to purchase the remaining 75% at fair market value. In May of 2011, I sold my home in Los Angeles, and in July of 2011, I purchased the 75% interest in my childhood home and became the 100% owner of the home. To be sure, the market value of the San Diego house was less than the value of Los Angeles house, so why was my claim denied? Thirty years ago, a BOE lawyer took the position that the word purchased in the statute meant that a person had to purchase 100 percent of the replacement property. Thus, since I inherited 25 percent of the San Diego house and only purchased 75 percent, my claim was denied. This position is wrong. It conflicts with the statute and is inconsistent with the policy of Prop 90. First, the language of Prop 90 required me to purchase a replacement property of equal or lesser value than my original property. This is what I did. Nothing in the statute says that I had to purchase 100% of the replacement dwelling in order to qualify for relief. Second, nothing about the policy behind Prop 90 requires a senior to purchase 100% of the replacement dwelling. The legislator enact legislature enacted Prop 90 to provide relief to seniors who wanted to downsize and relocate. The legislature did not intend se for seniors to trade up and move into nicer homes at the expense of the county. Indeed, the equal or lesser value requirements prevent seniors from trading up. Buying a more expensive home with continu while continuing to pay property taxes based on the old house. The policy goals are achieved by requiring the 100% value of the original house compared to the 100% value of the replacement property. It's the value. I purchased 75% and the value of 100% of the property was less than the house that I sold. I engaged in a transaction that is exactly what the legislature attended. I just need one more minute. Under these facts, I entitled to transfer my base year value under the statute. The board can easily rectify the situation by repudiating the prior erroneous staff position. I have spent four years trying to get my claim approved, and in doing so, I learned that I am not the only person that has been not denied Prop 6090 relief for this reason. The staff at the San Diego County Assessor's Office agrees that the board's 30-year-old interpretation does not automatically fall from, follow from the statute and that the result is unfair to those who are trying to buy out their co-owners. Accordingly, I am here to ask that you fix this problem by asking your staff to revise the assessor's handbook and to acknowledge that the prior interpretation is not correct so that the San Diego assessor can grant my claim.
Mm. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Gilman, any okay. response? We'll start with Mr. Phyllis. Um, my staff and I have been engaged with Mr. Phyllis since last year, obviously, and we've continued to stay engaged with him and have diligently tried to address all of his issues to the best of our ability um, with respect to the concerns and problems that uh, he's brought to our attention. Um, I think one of the issues that's been uh, kind of confusing is that, you know, the role of the advocate, and, and Mr. Phyllis and I talked about that yesterday. Um, I think he has a view that we have a certain amount of authority or power over um, the assessor to compel them to take a certain action when it, a taxpayer determines that uh, maybe a value is not being accepted or that they're not viewing the statute um, the way maybe the taxpayer is. Um, based on what I've reviewed and what I've read and some of our tax counsels that I've talked to have informed me, that's not how the statute reads. I don't have I don't have the discretionary authority to compel the assessor to do anything. Um, there are there are some sections in the law that allow me to uh, work with the assessor on training and providing publications and education and making sure that the assessor understands what taxpayers' needs are. But there there really is nothing in the statute that would allow me to compel the assessor to take the value that he wants them to enroll. Furthermore, um, with respect to uh, his issue, and he did mention this, that um, I think you did, but you, you've, he's had the opportunity to have two assessment appeals um, with the Humboldt County Local Assessment Appeals uh, Hearing Board, and uh, now the matter's in litigation. Um, it, it's just, it's, it really boils down to a matter of um, our legal counsel has advised me and my staff that his uh, understanding of how the statute applies is different than the way we look at it. And so it's just, it's a matter of agree to disagree at this point in terms of how the law applies, so. Okay, uh, members, Mr. Horton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm sorry, ma'am, what's your name again? Ms. Phyllis Friedman. Ms. Friedman? Yes. Uh, Denise Friedman. Yes, uh, uh, My apologies. Ms. Friedman, um, thank you for bringing the matter before us. Uh, more than happy to meet with the LA assessor as well as uh, in conjunction with Member Harkey uh, to have a conversation with the San Diego Assessor about the issue. It is difficult to uh, micromanage the assessors who, quite frankly, do an exceptional job um, in what they do on a norm. Um, I understand the challenge as it relates to the law, though. Uh, Pro uh, Proposition 90 uh, at some point uh, expired. And so, and then they reenacted it, the legislature reenacted it for a period of time. So I think it's sort of incumbent upon us to um, see uh, to what extent the, that may be the case. And you're absolutely right. Uh, there is nothing in the law or the intent of the law that says you can't acquire uh, less than 100% of the actual property. Uh, what the law says is like kind for like kind, and uh, the assurance is if your 75% meets that qualification, then theoretically you should have uh, been availed uh, the exemption. Uh, so um, uh, we probably want to take a look at this a little bit closer. Uh, Before and, and be more than happy to assist you with that. Uh, the uh, Mr. Gilman's office uh, is limited in, as he's indicated, is limited in their authority, but the board does have oversight over the uh, county assessors and can issue letters, LTAs, letters uh, to the assessors to clarify uh, if there is inappropriate. Uh, or not inappropriate, but because uh, rarely is there inappropriate actions, but if there is a misunderstanding of the application of the law, therein is our inherent um, uh, uh, authority that might be able to be helpful. Thank you. Thank you again for coming for us. Ms. Harkey. Oh, I I'm would, sorry. Mr. Gilman wants to respond? Or? No. I, I, just, I just wanted to make a comment because I didn't get a chance to comment on, on, on uh, Ms. Friedman's issue. Um, you know, the type of scenario... Uh, this type of scenario may not have been anticipated when the architects of Prop 60 and Prop 90 were looking at this, where a person inherits a piece of property, and I think that's where the problem comes into play. 
Um, secondly, part of what, again, like she mentioned, part of what Prop 60, Prop 90 were trying to accomplish was to allow those seniors to downsize and move in, move their base year value with them when they sold their home. Um, with that said, we've already been looking into Ms. Friedman's issue, and I, I think what she's recommending is reasonable. Um, it, it's in the uh, assessor's manual that that word purchase made its way into from uh, a number of annotations that we have had uh, for a number of years. How it made its way in there, I don't know. But assessors are following it, and that's what's created the problem for Ms. Friedman in San Diego. S San Diego has no issue with it in terms of, I've talked to San Diego County's assessor's office. They're just following right. board prescribed guidance. Okay, and I think uh, Mr. Hort Horton I said that he would. I would just like to say that I bet you the San Diego assessor actually wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, I bet you're right, Ms. Arkey. He was on the board for 20 years and left in the late 90s, would it have been? So he I, was on like the board that. for 20 right. years. So Mr. Right. Dronenberg probably understands this very, very well. <laughs> and with his help and support, maybe we can actually revise the assessor handbook for more clarity. Yeah. But I think I'll pick up the phone and make a call first. But, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so Mr. Horton, I think, yeah, said that he would bring it under his committee, Property yeah, Tax yeah. Committee, to take a look at this. Oh, is that what? Yeah. Okay. We will. Okay. You go, I, I, okay. Well, I would give, I would give Mr. Mr. Dronenberg a call. Okay. Um, the, um, Mr. Horton. It says it's not bound by that handbook. You know, it's just, well, you know. Yeah. They, they kind of have they, to follow They, it, they can so. kind of. Interpret this. I mean, when you say purchase, purchase is what she's only purchasing a portion of the of the property. She's inheriting another portion. Right. I mean, if she was purchasing one third of a triplex, you know, we would be faced with the same situation. So, inheriting a percentage of of a percentage, it's not new, you know, to this process and in the interpretation. So. Uh, this may be what I refer to as a cool hand loop situation. I don't know if you, I may be dating myself, but in the movie Cool Hand Luke, he said, what we have here is a failure to communicate. And so we will provide that with the assistant member, Harkey. Yeah. Or Level. perhaps we have to clarify it. So thank you for coming and bringing that to our attention. Thank you. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to have the last two speakers because they're on another issue, a similar related issue. Uh, we have Mr. Gamper as well as Mr. Cato. Madam Chair and members, John Gamper representing the California Farm Bureau Federation. As you know, I'm not a practitioner and this is not my taxpayer. I am an advocate of public policy wonk just like you guys are. And I'm an advocate for solving problems for my member of the um, San Joaquin County Farm Bureau, Yolo County Farm Bureau. He is houses in his house, Solano. So I missed him yeah. by three. He is a uh, resident of, of Stockton. The ranch is in Yolo okay. County and he's a member of the uh, Solano County. County Farm Bureau. Uh, be that as it may, this is a Prop um, 58 issue on transfer of ownership between parents to children. And uh, Mr. Cato, Cato is going to provide his personal situation, but I wanted to try to frame it as how in the heck did we get 30 years down the road from Proposition 58 and not have this problem come up before? This is a cleanup bill to a bill that passed 30 years ago. And nobody figured that a president and a secretary of a corporation are mom and dad, and they're going to transfer the property to son and son or son and daughter upon their death because of the revocable living trust. The revocable living trust owns the C Corp. I would have advised him to put it in S Corp, by the way, but <laughs> they didn't ask me at the time. No. Uh, but LLPs, LLCs, they all don't qualify. And how many agricultural operations are LLPs, LLCs, or S Corps? They need legal li liability protection from all the laws that have been passed by the legislature that put them in legal jeopardy all, every single day, whether it's an attractive nuisance because he lives on a creek or because of heat stress or whatever. For, or whatever. And the fact that it's a closely held corporation by mom and dad and they're transferring to the son and daughter and the statute says it should be liberally construed, we're, I'm flabbergasted that this hasn't come up before and we just need a fix and we urge you to to do what you did for 
owners of units of cooperative housing. Mm. This was the last amendment yeah. to Section 63.1 C8. And it was a bill sponsored by the Board of Equalization and an omnibus governance and finance bill, Chairman Wolk at the time. Uh, and it went through on consent, unanimous in both houses. It added that statement to the, uh, to the pocket on page 14 that says, for purposes of this section, real property includes an interest in a unit or lot within a cooperative housing corporation as defined in I of section 61. Um, so the idea that you need a constitutional amendment to fix this, as Ledge Council told um, Assemblyman Ting's staff, I believe it was, uh, is ludicrous. I'm not sure they cracked the Constitution and read Proposition 58, that's Article 13 AH, where it says real prop, uh, primary residence as defined by the legislature and a million dollars of property as defined by the legislature. They defined it, and then you guys amended it in 2011 in SB 947, and now we're asking you, please, let's fix this going forward. Let's fix this going backwards. Let's fix <clears throat> this retroactively by declaring that it's declaratory of existing law so my member does not get screwed. And I'll be perfectly blunt, and I apologize for my language, but uh, at this point, I'm going to introduce Mr. Howard Cato. I get a little bit of emotional. He's going to probably get a little emotional too, and we apolo I'll apologize in advance for him, but he'll lower, he'll keep his voice down. Yeah. <laughs> Howard Cato. Um, thank you. Hello. Um, before I begin, uh, I have passed out to all the board members uh, four documents, and you should have that in your hands. And the reason I pass it out is because in my presentation, I'm going to make reference reference to certain text in the statutes and also in a Board of Equalization letter dated January um, 23rd. January 23rd, 1991. So if you, I won't begin until you have that documentation. Th this packet? Yes. And there's, sh um, actually, there should be, they should be bounded by a clip. Okay. Green. Like yeah. this. Okay. A colored clip. Orange, green. Use green. Yeah, good for color. We remove those clips. Yeah? yeah? Oh. Okay. Oh. I still have a clip. My name is Howard Cotto. I'm here today before the Board of Equalization to dispute Revenue and Taxation Code Section 63.1 C8. My parents were farmers for over 60 years and worked very hard to build their business. The property that they farmed was purchased in the 1950s and placed in a family-owned corporation in 1981, years before the passage of Prop 58. After my mother passed away in May of 2014, uh, this farm property is being reassessed just because it is owned by a family-owned corporation whose sole shareholders were my parents. No shares were ever owned by any other family members. Thus, the financial impact of Section 63.1C8 to our family farm is substantial. It has doubled the property tax on our farm property, and I estimate that in the next 20 years, a minimum of an additional $100,000 in property tax will need to be paid. First, Revenue and, and Taxation Code Section 63.1C8 is unfair and not equitable. This section states, quote, real property means that real property is defined in Section 104. Real property does not include any interest in a legal entity. For purposes of this section, real property includes an interest in a unit or lot within a cooperative housing corporation as defined in subdivision I of sec uh, section 61. I already read it to him. Okay. A benefit that is provided to a farmer that farms as a sole proprietorship is exempted from reassessment from... Uh, is exempted from reassessment when the farm property is passed from parent to the children, but the same exemption is not afforded to a farmer who farms as a corporation. This Revenue and Taxation Code Section 63.1C8 is unfair to the family farmer who operates his farm as a corporation 
even though both families are in the same type of business. Secondly, Revenue and Taxation Code 63.1 should be liberally construed to carry out the intent of Proposition 58. S Section 63.1 C8 should not be read in isolation. Rather, this section should be interpreted in conjunction with other sections in Revenue and Taxation Code Section 63.1, including the notes and annotations. Note 1 to the Revenue and Taxation Code Section 63.1 states the following, quote, it is the intent of the legislature that the provisions of 63.1 of the Revenue and Taxation Code shall be liberally construed in order to carry out the intent of both of the following. Number one, Proposition 58 on the November 4th, 1986 general election ballot. And number two, Proposition 193 on the uh, March 26th, 1996 uh, primary election ballot. Section 61.C8 should be liberally construed to carry out the intent of Prop 58. Namely, it must recognize that there's an implied exception in our case because 100% of the ownership interest of the legal entity is being passed from parent to child. When 100% of the ownership interest in a legal entity is being passed, that means it includes the real property. Note that Section 63.1 C8 allows for an explicit exception for one legal entity, namely a cooperative housing corporation, and yet does not allow the property tax exemption to a family farm that is run as a corporation. Thirdly, please refer to the Board of Equalization letter dated January 23rd, 1991. This letter from the Board of Equalization to County Assessor states in part, California trust law recognizes that the administration of a trust is governed by the trust instrument, Union Bank and Trust Company versus McCulligan, 1948-84, Cal App 2D-208. This, where the trust instrument conflicts with statutory power, the instrument controls unless a court pursuant to probate section 16201 relieves the trustee of the restriction in the instrument, end quote. This, the wording in my parents' trust document should take precedence over the statute language in section 63.1 C8. F fourth and lastly, my parents formed this family-owned corporation in 1981 and prepared the revocable living trust in 1984 prior to the passage of Prop 58. How my parents or me would have known that Proposition 58 would be passed years later and result in a property taxation issue is unrealistic. Even many Board of Equalization employees, trust attorneys, and other farmers who I've spoken to do not know about Prop 58. In summary, Revenue and Taxation Code Section 63.1 C8 is unfair to a family farmer who runs their farming business as a corporation. Operating a business as a corporation is a prudent business practice today because of litigious events and stringent regulations. I respectfully request that our family farm property be provided with the same property tax exemption as a family farm that farms as a sole proprietorship. Their, the intent of my parents, as stated in their trust document, has been yeah. always to pass 100% of their assets that they own, including real property to their children. How can one say that 100% of the assets being passed does not include the real property. Section 63.1 C8 should be liberally construed to carry out the intent of Prop 58 
and should recognize that 100% of the ownership interest in a legal entity is being passed, that implies that the real property is being passed. My parents' trust document clearly stated that the farm property should be passed to my sister and I on a 50-50 basis. I respectfully request that if provisions of 63, section 63.1 cannot be liberally construed to carry out the intent of Prop 58, that the Board of Equalization make a finding stating that. If there's any questions, I would be happy to respond right now or after this meeting. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Cato. Uh, Mr. Yellman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Members, uh, one of my staff has been working with Mr. Cato for about a month now, and um, we have uh, requested some documentation. I believe he's provided some of it, including a copy of the family trust, to see how the corporation was held uh, in the trust. Um, regarding his suggestion, what he's recommending would require an amendment to Revenue and Taxation Code 63.1. So really, we're at a stage where we're um, working with our legal department. We have engaged one of our uh, tax attorneys in the legal department. Uh, also, uh, our property tax department is aware of it as well. I have not engaged our legislative division to discuss it with them. Um, but as we make progress or whatever direction this ends up going, we'll make sure to keep Mr. Cotto informed. The one thing he mentioned that I did pick up on is it sounds like we need to do some education and possibly some outreach to those entities that may be small family farms or other corporations that might have a similar situation in terms of if you have a corporation like this and you're going to be <coughs> taking people out of it, there could be a property tax consequence down the road. Well, I, I think similar to the last um, mm -hmm. case, you know, what is the intent of the legislation, right? For right. The seniors, it's that seniors shouldn't be displaced and they shouldn't, you know, have to make that choice. And I think in terms of, you know, parent to child um, transfers, transfers, I mean, the intent was clearly for parents to be able to leave their properties to their children. So again, that they wouldn't be forced uh, to have to sell. So, you right. know, we've been going around also with Mr. Gamber and Mr. Cotto trying to figure out what the fix is going to be. And mm -hmm. um, thank you for putting uh, m more resources into right. this, and we look forward to hearing um, what your conclusions are. But Mr. Horton has some comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, Mr. Gamber, I, I think it's important that we do engage the legislative unit uh, and, and seek to clarify whether or not the, the, the existing language, uh, it, as you say, um, if, it, if it says, as defined by the legislature, that gives the legislature enormous amount of latitude, even though it may be a constitutional amendment, uh, because it, 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 I'm not saying it is, I'm saying when it says it's defined by the legislature, all of a sudden it becomes just a regular change that can be made without the uh, voting threshold that's necessary in order to accomplish, you know, a constitutional change. So uh, the ledge unit probably needs to engage to make sure that that is the case or is not the case uh, because if it is then declaratory legislation is a really simple thing uh, uh, given the wisdom of the legislature uh, as I experienced uh, I believe they uh, would be responsive to that um, regulatorily um, uh, we can you know, uh, I think it's more of a legislative fix than um, a change of the regulation, but we could uh, make a change uh, and say that it is, de we believe, is declaratory of existing law mm -hmm. and send it to the Office of Administrative Law and see if they kick it back. So um, what I would recommend in order to expedite <laughs> this is that we sort of travel on parallel tracks, uh, that we do both, uh, that we engage the legislature and see where their, uh, where their thoughts are relative to this, and at the same time, uh, I believe Member Harkey's committee, Madam Chair, um, can kind of go through the other process of trying to clarify that. Stuart, may I just say, you did it before, you could do it again. When you amended yeah, Section no. 63, Point one C eight in two thousand eleven. I don't think there was a letter from Ledge Council saying it needed a constitutional amendment. The bill passed seventy eight to zip and forty to zip. So, yeah, the 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 good and the bad 
uh, legislation can pass until it's challenged. <laughs> you know, it, it, yeah, no, it remains no. law, you know. As defined by the legislature. Ms. Ma Mao, yes, I, I'd Ms. like Adam. to make a comment to Mr. Gilman's comment. Um, in the interest of time, I did not mention this, but in the Board of Equalization question and answer document, there's a question number two, and it reads as follows. The question reads, which transfers of real property are excluded from reassessment by Proposition 58 and 193? The answer according to the Board of Equalization is transfers of primary residence in, in quote or in parentheses it says no value limit. Transfers of the first one million dollars of real property other than primary residences, the one million dollar exclusion applies separately to each eligible transferer. And in in yellow highlight, in which you have a copy of, it says this. Transfers may be the result of a sale, gift, or inheritance. A transfer via a trust, which my parents had, also qualifies for this exclusion. For property tax purposes, we look through the trust to the present beneficial owner. When the present beneficial ownership passes from a parent to child, this is a change in ownership that is eligible for the parent to child exclusion. So nowhere in this question and answer does it mention about revenue and taxation code 63.1 C8. And so the taxpayer, if he has a trust document and he has property that's in a corporation, and by just reading this alone, he'll think, okay, I'm okay. I, I can qualify for a, a parent-to-child exclusion. But, but nowhere is it mentioned that there's a catch here. You, you better right. uh, yeah. not own property in a corporate... In a legal entity. In a legal entity. And that's... And the only way I found out about Prop 58 is when I got a notice of reassessment <laughs> from the Yolo County Assessor's Office, and I didn't understand why it was being reassessed, right. and I wondered, and then I looked at the date of, on that, uh, it says the reassessment is effective as of a certain date, and the date was the date of the passing of my mother. That's how I found out about it, and I had no idea of Prop 58, until I, I received this right. letter of reassessment. Right. So the general public needs to know that if they are gonna form a, a corporation or a legal entity, they better be aware that when they want to pass on that, that property to their kids, that they're gonna face the consequence of possibly facing a property tax reassessment. Right. Okay. Okay. So I, I thank sorry. you, Mr. Cotto and, and Mr. Camper. Um, you know, I'm sorry. The Board of Equalization was formed in 1879, um, and times change, and you know, entities are created, and technology, and all this, and so that's what makes our job interesting is is trying to update the code uh, for these particular problems. So I thank you for coming, bringing that to our attention. Um, letting the public know that this could be an issue for other folks, and then also Mr. Gilman's uh, attention by his staff to seeing um, what we can do to um, solve this. But I think you can hear from the board that we are sympathetic, and you know, we, what is look back to the intention of the legislature or, or the board. You know, so um, so we hope that there is going to be a favorable outcome for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have one written submission for the property tax. Okay. I may read that into the record real sure. quick. Sure. Uh, Mr. Larry Kaplan has um, submitted a written submission regarding his property tax bill. Mr. Kaplan was informed by the assessor of uh, Santa Cruz County of a reduction in value that was understood would be, effect, would be in effect for his first installment payment, which was due uh, October 10th, pardon me, uh, December 10th. Uh, Mr. Kaplan believes he was not um, adequately informed by the county assessor uh, or tax collector that his tax bill would be uh, due in full even though um, there was a pending value change. 
Uh, Mr. Kaplan suggests that the assessor, when notifying a taxpayer of a reduction in value, also provides specific notice that the amount of the current bill must be paid in full uh, and the adjustment to the bill will be done later. In other words, what happened was is that there, there was an adjustment, no, there was an adjustment down in value, and he discussed that with the assessor over the phone, and so he took that for granted and sent a check in plus 20 percent. Um, and then they, it hadn't been put on the roll or the adjustment hadn't been made, and so the check was kicked back, so there was penalties involved. And he went ahead and paid it, but he thinks that the assessor can do a better job notifying property owners that you need to pay the full amount until the adjustment's made. So okay. that concludes our hearing. Uh, well, I see uh, Unless we have Mr. Young is here um, in charge of our property taxes, so perhaps he can make sure that um, the policies are uniform uh, with all the assessors across our 58 counties. So um, we thank the taxpayer for writing in, and we will look into this further. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. This concludes our business tax and property tax taxpayer bill of rights for uh, Sacramento. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gilman. Okay, Madam Clerk, please call the next item. The next item on our agenda is the Legislative Committee. Ms. Ma is the chair of that committee, Ms. Ma. Thank you. Um, we are going to take uh, items out of order since we have members uh, here who would like to present and speak on behalf of their own bills. Uh, so the first item we're going to take up is AB 567 by Mr. Gibson, Cannabis Tax Amnesty of Mr. Gibson. Mm -hmm. And his uh, assistant would like to come up uh, to the front. That would be great. And Ms. Peelsticker, if you could uh, read the... Um, uh, presentation on the bill. Uh, good morning, um, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, AB 567 relates to medical cannabis retailers uh, and tax amnesty. Uh, the board voted to support the bill on January 26, 2016, and at the meeting, staff agreed to bring the bill back for an update uh, when it is amended. In this case, it is proposed to be amended and um, will go through policy committee next month. So there are additional amendments beyond the ones that the board considered um, at the last hearing. So existing law imposes sales tax on retail sales of marijuana, including medical marijuana, to the same extent as any other retail sale of tangible personal property. Uh, this bill requires the BOE to develop and administer a tax penalty amnesty program for sellers in a medical cannabis-related business. Since the last legislative committee, the following amendments uh, have been proposed and uh, will be going into the bill uh, very soon. Uh, first is to remove revisions to the Uniform Controlled Substances Act related to license suspension for a dispensary that employs any person under 21 years of age or allows a qualified patient to arrange for third-party deliveries. Uh, removing all references to the Franchise Tax Board and just to have the bill uh, be about EDD and uh, BOE. Specify that the Department of Consumer Affairs is the appropriate licensing authority for license issuance, restatement, or renewal. Remove references to local licensing. Revise the amnesty period to a three-month period beginning July 1, 2017 and ending September 30th, 2017. And to apply to qualified tax liabilities due and payable for tax reporting periods prior to January 1, 2015. Uh, the fiscal impact of the bill remains the same. Revenues would be based on participation rates, and the BOE revenue impact is at a particip participation rate of 50% would be $52.8 million, at a participation rate of 75%, uh, $79.2 million, and at 100% it would be about $105.6 million with substantial computer programming costs to revoke or refuse a seller's permit. That concludes my presentation. Okay, thank you. Mr. Gibson, mm. welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I just respectfully ask why I vote. She did in my report already. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, thank you very much and good afternoon, Madam Chair and board members. Thank you for your consideration of Assembly Bill 567, which seeks to increase the tax revenue by providing a tax amnesty period for medical cannabis businesses that fail to pay their taxes historically and are now looking to be in compliance. As you may recall, I presented this bill earlier um, in January of this year and received full support um, by the board. I am now here um, to 
and ask for reconsideration given um, substantial amendments that you that have been taken. Um, I want to pause there. Um, when I came in January, this body um, asked that any amendments be brought back and you being made informed of those amendments. And today I sit here to uh, share with your staff as well as yourselves those particular such amendments um, that I have taken in this Bill 567. And so I am standing by my commitment by providing you um, with this presentation today. Amendments are as follows. <clears throat> Removing Section 1 of the bill which would have been adding regulations to the way dispensaries operate. The reason uh, this was removed in order to ensure a clear focus on the amnesty program to reframe from doing um, too much in this one measure. Removing the Franchise Tax Board from the bill. The reason the FTB conducted um, an analysis showing um, as estimate loss of at least $500,000. Their analysis assumed full compliance using the number of dispensary from the Board of Equalization's estimates. Amendment three, the sunset date. Amendment three, uh, sunset date um, from a six month period ending no later than January 31st, 2016 to be a three month period between, between July and September of 2017. The reason, the current amnesty period in this bill was based on an assumption that the bill, that this bill would pass in 2015. <clears throat> Um, being that this measures carry over into the year, the amnesty period needed to be updated. Um, I respectfully um, ask for your I vote um, consideration of all the amendments to Assembly Bill um, 567 and stand ready to answer any questions that you may have. Ms. Harkey. I have a question. Uh, the Franchise Tax Board wanted <coughs> to be exempted from this. Are they going to be pursuing income tax with no amnesty and we're what what what's what's the reason uh, I, I can please. yes okay yeah. uh, yes um, I had a conversation with the franchise tax board and um, they their intent would just be to have this bill be about sales tax amnesty what they're finding is that under uh, under current law most collectives and cooperatives um, that our dispensaries uh, operate not for profit, which means that they would only be subject to the minimum franchise tax under current law, so that the revenue derived from an amnesty program um, would be uh, uh, not very large and the costs to administer it would be quite substantial. So uh, given that analysis, uh, they matter of fact, to be what remiss. they're saying is it doesn't pay them to pursue the tax because they're nonprofit. Uh, well, that the amounts that would come into amnesty would just be that eight hundred dollars per right, dispensary. Right, because they're so, operating as nonprofit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. That was that was something I hadn't heard before. Well, because under current law, they're required to offer to. Um, to operate not for profit, but with the new regulations going in in a couple years, um, they will be converting to for profit. Okay. Okay, Mr. Horton. Okay, um, I think that did it. Um, I do want to uh, share with the body that, or the board, that um, the other inherent challenge that the FTB has is that under current federal law, it is. It treats the uh, treats these cannabis operators uh, a little bit different. So there is inconsistency with the federal law as it applies to the state law. So until such time that uh, all of this, uh, until such time that uh, the state establishes, you know, a income tax uh, consistent with federal law, which is going to be inherently challenging, yeah. uh, is where we have the issue of revenue. Um, and to some degree, it's still being treated as an illegal product being sold. And therefore, the lack of acknowledgment of it being a income tax transaction in some of the areas of the law 
wherein there would be a larger revenue generated if such was the case. Chairman. Mr. Runner. Yeah, just real quick. Um, the, the amnesty period, um, and let me, I think this is more of a BOE question than it is to the, to the member. Um, since these businesses sometimes are hard to find, hard to locate, at t I guess unless you go to the unless you go to the internet and ask for them, I guess <laughs> weed map. Uh, but sometimes it's they just it just it is it is just more difficult at times <coughs> to chase down the process. I'm my only concern is whether or not we will be prepared in terms of the education and the outreach effort um, that we I think needs to be it set up. Um, in order to uh, be ready for then that limited, uh, what, July 1st to September, right? Mm -hmm. uh, three month period, you know, um, and that's what my concern would be. Not, again, not, not in terms of the content of the bill or the other, but whether we will be able to then do an effective outreach effort in order to make sure that everybody is fully aware of and what the process is to come in and, uh, under the amnesty. So that's my only concern. I just would like to know that we are at least really evaluating that well, because I would assume, let me go to Mr. Gibson, um, that you didn't come up with those dates. I don't know if the committee came up with those dates or whatever, but I assume that was kind of driven by us. Yes. Okay, so I just want to ensure that we are actually secure about those dates. That's all. Uh, Ms. Dowers. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Gibson. Um, I appreciate you removed the Franchise Tax Board from the bill. Huh. I should have had my pre-briefing. <laughs> Anyway, um, I was under the impression that the Franchise Tax Board was still there, um, so I'm not going to be a participate on this item. Okay. I just want to let you know. Okay, great. Uh, Ms. Harkey. Um, I, I'd just like to say I think we are, we do have a sufficient database. It's just getting the people to go out and, and ensure that you know, everybody's licensed and whatnot and are informed, uh -huh. um, because I think they, uh, the industry is on the web. It's <laughs> not, not that tough to find. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, but I do have a problem with uh, the state of, the, and this is not related to Mr. Gibson's bill because I think the amnesty is a good idea. It's, uh, it's an incentive to get on board, get permitted, and, and get above board. But I do have a problem if we're going to be doing this at the state that the Franchise Tax Board is not participating because either we're taxing as a state or we're not. And we are already in violation of federal law anyway by virtue of the industry and the banking relationships we're having trouble with. So I, I would think that would bear some exploration. I, I think if, you know, if one's in the pond, we all need to be. And, um, you know, I, I don't know of any other industry that we exempt from income taxes just because we're confused. So I, I just, I think, I think that's probably not something to be resolved here, but it is something for us to continue to explore that, you know, I understand they're nonprofit and they're supposed to go to profit, but we need to be sure that we're treating all taxpayers fairly. And especially when we've got an industry like this, it's definitely going to be costly for us to implement. We need to be sure that, you know, people are assuming they're paying taxes. People in my district assume we're going to collect taxes. So income taxes should be part of that. So, um, you know, I appreciate you bringing this forward. I'm disappointed the FTB is not on it, but I do like the simplification of the measure. Thank you. Mr. Runner. I, I was going to say, I, I, I also have a concern with the FTB issues in regards to cannabis. In fact, we had a meeting in my office a couple, uh, a week or so ago, uh, where I've asked uh, FTB leadership to come in along with BOE um, to ensure that we were exchanging information well enough uh, in terms of making sure the F FTB, because I was feeling like FTB is not as aggressive as they need to be in regards to bringing in their, these, these, these taxpayers. So I, I believe that started a series of meetings um, between um, Mr. Gao and, and the FTB in regards to exchange of information uh, in order that we have, because I, at the end of the day, it was determined that we have much better information than they do. Um, <coughs> and so we open the door at least for that to take place because I am concerned about that. To me, I'm not sure it's an issue of the fact that they don't want to be taxed as much as it is the cost of implementing the program doesn't have a good big enough payoff for the amount that they get to collect because they're nonprofits. Um, but I do believe and agree that we need to make sure that California has a consistent policy when it comes to the issue of taxation of, of, uh, of the cannabis industry. And um, I know at least there's some kind of conversations going on and I encourage us to continue. 
Mr. Horton. Um, I believe this is, this, in that this is a, a waiver of the penalty, it has a dual benefit in that we're, we're going to be in the process of collecting the tax from these individuals. There is a huge benefit of having the administration in place and the revenue is there on a um, return on investment uh, cost benefit analysis, significant amount of revenue if in fact uh, folks comply and participate and a huge benefit to the industry for them to participate as well. Um, and so uh, the upside is to use a child, a young folks statement through the roof, you know. So thank you, Mr. Gibson, for bringing the measure forward. Thank you. Uh, members, I don't know that we need to make a motion, though. We've already supported it, but support as amended. I think so I would so support as amended. Mr. Horton moves. Mr. Runner seconds uh, with Ms. Stowers not voting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gibson. Thank okay, you. our next bill. Um, Gray. Yeah. Assemblymember Gray is here, so we will hear AB 2678 related to the state designated fairgrounds. We also have one speaker on this item, if he would like to come up as well. Mr. Stephen Chambers. Thank you. Two. Oh, two speakers. Um, we're going to have Ms. Peelsticker Peel uh, present the item, and then we'll um, have you all speak after. Ms. Peelsticker. Thank you. AB 2678 currently is in the Assembly Appropriations Committee suspense file. Uh, existing law uh, imposes the sales tax on all retailers for the privilege of selling tangible personal property at retail and the use tax on storage use or consumption in the state of uh, tangible personal property purchased from a retailer except where the law provides a specific exemption or exclusion. This proposed law would require that uh, taxable sales and purchases within a state designated fair area is, are to be segregated on the sales and use tax return. It also mandates that 30% of the state's general fund sales and use tax revenues derived from those segregated sales and purchases be deposited into the fair and exposition fund and it excludes fairs located within Los Angeles County. The measure would sunset January 1, 2022. The fiscal impact is an annual general fund revenue loss of $17 million with moderate administrative costs to modify tax returns, program computers, and notify affected retailers. Thank you. Mr. Gray, welcome. Mm -mm. Good afternoon, members, okay. and thank you uh, for the opportunity uh, to present my bill, AB 2678. Um, as uh, all of you are aware, for over 75 years, uh, our fair networks here in California enjoyed a stable uh, source of funding. Uh, that source of funding was, for many, many years, uh, tied closely to the horse racing industry. With the decline in those revenues and over the course of uh, a very difficult uh, decade for the state budget, uh, we saw that funding uh, eliminated altogether finally in the 2011-2012 uh, budget. Uh, in an effort to restore some funding, uh, again, a stable, reliable source going forward. Uh, we looked at taking a portion uh, of the state's uh, sales tax uh, expenditures collected at those facilities, facilities that support uh, schools and FFA programs and young people and a lot of uh, great activities, uh, community members seeing increased fees uh, and other challenges uh, in order to try stay relevant uh, and funded. Um, you know, these uh, sites also serve as uh, areas for emergency disasters, uh, community centers. And so what we did is dedicate a portion of that uh, state sales tax to create uh, that funding going forward. It will not restore uh, at one time, I think, almost $30 million that we dedicated to the fairs, uh, but by our estimates will in fact uh, restore somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 to $15 million, uh, which is a significant investment, uh, would provide much needed relief and certainly uh, would enjoy uh, your support here today. And with that, I'll let our speakers uh, put in their two cents. 
Thank you. Steve Chambers, Western Fairs Association, Madam Chair, members, we're very appreciative of this legislation that Assemblymember Gray has introduced. As he pointed out, we had this great model for 75 plus years that funded fairs from horse racing. And looking back in our history, of course, when we legalized racing in 1933, we had to build all the administrative agencies to implement it. So it was kind of exciting for me to sit here today and to read the, uh, you know, this is an area we're not super familiar, taxation. We are pretty familiar with fairs and where they are and what they do. And we've always thought of fairs as local governments. In many ways, they act just like local governments. They've got infrastructure issues. They've got, you know, all the same challenges that the cities and counties uh, uh have have before them during these difficult uh, recession that we're coming out of, but uh, they're the only local government that doesn't participate in some way with uh, the sales tax that's generated on their property. And so we think that uh, it makes a lot of sense to try and tie fares not only to the revenue that they're helping generate, but also gives them an incentive to have more activities and things like that on their fairgrounds. Our horse association not only represents the 76 fairgrounds, the facilities, 78 fairs in California, but we also represent over 500 fair-related businesses. And of course, anytime you have a bill in your newsletter that talks about sales tax, you get a lot of calls from your businesses. And you know what? I will tell you, they support this 100% because they are the only businesses where that are collecting. We realize they're not paying sales tax. They're collecting it on behalf of the state, turning it over with no hope of any of that money ever coming back to support their infrastructure or their business operation. You can't say that about any other business that's collecting sales tax in a city or county. They know that some of that is being held locally and it goes to things like underground electrical and um, sewer systems and all that stuff that's not real exciting but necessary for those businesses to operate. So we know it's, you know, a lot of it's an area that we're not familiar with, but we feel like the Board of Equalization, you know, kind of you're already in this business of, of trying to identify where taxes are generated, where they're supposed to go. And certainly I can tell by sitting in here for an hour and a half, you have a very supportive culture uh, as an agency. Um, and so we really look forward to hopefully working with you. We realize that that's still up to uh, Assembly Member Gray and 119 other legislators and a governor, but we'd like to uh, have your support now if possible. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair. Paul Smith with the uh, Rural Counties Association, RCRC. We are in strong support of this bill. It's one of our top priorities. I can't really go to an RCRC Board of Directors meeting without hearing about the plight of our fairs, our fair grounds, our fair uh, network. Um, in rural counties, uh, fairs are uh, very much like a local government, as Mr. Chambers talked about. And, and with counties, they're very much a partnership, uh, particularly on uh, public safety issues. Um, I, I remind folks that fairs aren't just about uh, corn dogs and Ferris wheels. Uh, they are also not just about you know, doll shows or, um, uh, you know, after um, after. Uh, fair parties or, or gatherings. They are really a public safety component for local communities and nowhere is that more important in the rural areas. You only have to look at the Rim Fire in Tuolumne County. You look at the fires in Lake and uh, nearby Napa. Um, those fairgrounds uh, were a vital component in housing people, in staging um, first responders, et cetera, et cetera. So we believe it's very important that the state come in with a better funding scheme than what we've had in place in recent years, which is virtually minimal uh, redirection in light of general fund loss and horse racing uh, proceeds loss. Um, we believe this is an appropriate way to permanently and long term uh, help out the fairgrounds, uh, each and every one of them. We encourage this bill to move forward. We would really appreciate the support of the Board of Equalization. Uh, and let's get our fairs back to where they should be and can be. And so we implore um, bodies to support this effort. Um, so thank you very much. Um, you all know that I've been a big supporter of fairs. Um, and we saw firsthand uh, in Lake County that the fairground was used for probably six months straight uh, for emergency um, services um, and aid and also other um, related um, um, agencies to come and actually be on site um, to handle all the fires as well as um, the aftermath of the fires. Uh, so my question to Mr. Chambers is um, the infrastructure Obviously, there's never going to be enough money for infrastructure, and perhaps you can tell us how much it would cost to uh, renovate and update uh, all of the existing 76 fairgrounds and, and their facilities. You know, I've visited all of mine in my district, and um, some, 
you know, are in better shape than others, number one. And number two, if you could also share with us uh, the economic structures. Um, not all of them are owned by the state of California. Some of them are jointly, um, it's like the county owned and managed. And if you could just explain that, because um, I think um, the audience also needs to know how each fairground operates. Yeah, thank you. Let me just start with uh, with your second question, which is governance structure. You know, California is kind of unusual. Our 78 fairgrounds, 54 of them are district ag associations, a title that actually precedes the current legal definition. We had district ag associations as early as 1869. Currently, they're set up as quasi-state agencies. They have boards appointed by the governor. Those, I can you know some legislators um, sitting on this board of equalization or former legislators, it seems like almost all of you. So uh, you know what that's like. You have people who want to serve on fair boards in your district, so they're calling you to see if you'll call the governor on their behalf. And uh, uh, we also have 24 county fairs. Those are run a variety of different ways. They're usually at arm's length, an association that, where the county uh, supervisors appoint some of the board members, but they operate as a, a as a, sometimes it's called an instrumentality of the county. They're not necessarily directly affiliated with the county. Their employees aren't county employees. That's the, the traditional model or the typical model these days. We also have two citrus fruit fairs. Um, um, I think I'd have to go to law school to understand quite what they are, but uh, there's the Cloverdale Citrus Fruit Fair and the National Orange Show in San Bernardino. And then we have the California State Fair here in Sacramento. Um, but all of them, fortunately, uh, in statute are defined as the network of fairs. And that's actually a, a you know, set in code long ago by uh, Senator Ken Maddy, who got tired of leaving fairs out in various bills that he was carrying. Every now and then he would accidentally like leave out all the county fairs because he only mentioned the district ag associations or he'd leave out the state fair because it wasn't named. So hopefully that solves it. But we see the fairs as all in the same business. They're all uh, either governmental or nonprofit. They're all on public land in some way. Even some of the state agencies are on land that they lease from the county or city. Uh, but the infrastructures involved and the creation of those fairs has been something that the state's been the lead on since their inception in the 1800s. Um, uh, as far as infrastructure and costs. I'm not an engineer, and I know one of the things I hear from the people uh, who work in that field is that that's very scary for us is that as the economy seems to come back, cost of construction is going up exponentially, it seems like. So we know that we did a study, uh, the Department of Food and Ag led a study of just emergency or urgent infrastructure repairs. These aren't um, uh, renovations or anything. This is just fixing stuff for public safety. And that was close to $300 million, and that was two years ago. And at the same time, we recognize that fares generate money locally. I mean, we do, you know, fair time, as you talked about, you know, fair time can be successful, but we also rent buildings. I mean, we also have a, do a lot of things that don't generate money, like, you know, junior livestock auctions and all those other, you know, uh, being emergency evacuation centers for Red Cross. So, uh, I, so we're not expecting to see $300 million fall out of the sky for fair infrastructure, but the current state budget has $4 million in funding for infrastructure. And from our perspective, that's the other end of the spectrum. That's so such a small amount that we create winners and losers amongst our own members because it's so far from being able to do any, do what's necessary. Uh, so we really appreciate Assemblymember Gray's bill, which we would hope over time would would start to generate amounts of money uh, enabled us to really start catching up on a lot of these projects. Hope that answers. Uh, yeah, and the funding would just go to the general exposition fund, so it could be used for operations or. Infrastructure. Right now, the uh, the bill I believe, as amended, is focuses on infrastructure. It it's does infrastructure. it does allow. We, we would appreciate the Department of Food and Agriculture having the uh, you know the flexibility to work with the fairs and determine what the priorities are. Anytime you've got less than the total amount of money necessary, it gets difficult, and sometimes those issues change. For example, the Napa County Fair uh, had submitted projects for urgent health and safety prior to being used as an evacuation center for the Napa fires. That use as an evacuation center put a tremendous strain on the facility. Now they have different issues. And so we, we, that's one of the reasons we, have a, a, we appreciate working with the Department of Food and Ag on, on essentially funding strategies for, for all funds available. So we need more money. Okay, Mr. Roder. Yeah, just to, just to um, um, for, first of all, give me the background on the L.A. County. Yeah, why hmm. L.A.? <laughs> <laughs> there were. They're not giving up any money. <laughs> they're not giving up. The uh, there was a perspective from some members uh, of legislature uh, that they wanted uh, to be out 
uh, of this particular effort, uh, largely. The, the, those L.A. County fairs wanted to be out? Um, no, they, they were silent. Yeah. You want me to take it? I, I'll be a little more direct, sir, uh, uh, yeah. Mr. Runner. Um, <laughs> I think you've read in the media over the last six months some questionable activities in the management of that fair. It is not a state fair. It's not even a county fair. It's a nonprofit fair. And there Which been, fair is that? This is the Los Angeles County Los Angeles. Fair. I believe yeah, it's the, its official title. Yeah, but the exemption title. is for every fair in, I, I, in L.A. County. I don't believe. I believe that is the only one in within no. Los Angeles. No, it's not. No, it's not. But there's. But that is the count. That is the 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 focal of the conversation. Is is that there shouldn't be state money is going to that entity, which has, for lack of a better term, suffered some bad press in terms of its financial management. And there is some discussion going forward. Yeah, I, I think, for instance, it can be very difficult discussion. for me to support a bill that, for instance, and I'm closely associated with affairs, I have a, an experience, we have something going on that I think all fairs ought to look at, and that's a joint powers, which then is long-term survival for fairs uh, between uh, the city uh, in, in the Antelope Valley, cities in the Antelope Valley and the Antelope Valley um, fairgrounds, that, which is the 50th, which isn't even listed in here. So I'm not sure exactly how it got overlooked, um, but it's a very vital operational fair, self-sustaining, self, you know, self and, and, and I'm at perplexed as to what got them out of the deal. As introduced, uh, it was inclusive of all fairs, uh -huh. and the uh, Assembly Revenue Tax Committee uh, saw fit uh, to put that exemption uh, in, I'm certainly open to uh, narrowing the exemption going forward. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I okay. Well, let me clarify the uh, Antelope Valley Fair, which I know you're quite familiar with, right. uh, uh, is, is part of the fair network and is in Los Angeles County, and right. I think that's just an error in, 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 yeah. in, in your okay, report Okay, that would be my there, concern. But, but yeah. Believe me, I, I got a call right away from them. <laughs> saying, why are we out of this? Yeah, and, and we've said, well, we'll work with the author. And, of course, it's a long way from the governor's desk. So. Right. And I actually think that's resolvable. Yeah. Okay. That would be my concern in regards to that. And I have a, you know, there's another opinion in regards to trying to conform behavior by trying to put people in and out, can, um, you know, to try to solve the problem. Can I just um, piggyback on that? Is the L.A. County Fair part of the fair network or not part? Yes, it is. They are. And the property is owned by who? County of Los Angeles. Well, it seems like they're just like every other fair in the fair network. They're still owned by the public, either the yeah. county or the state, and they should probably be included in the bill. But uh, Ms. Harkey. Well, uh, that was one of my concerns is if LA's out, I need to know why. <laughs> okay. And I think you've kind of explained it. There's some something that's perceived, if not actually going on with the funding, and so they don't want to fund it anymore, or it's a political hassle. Somebody's, somebody's throwing rocks. Um, I, as a rule, because we've got being in the legislature and going through budgets like we always do, um, I'm getting much more involved in the legislature <laughs> here, I think, than I wanted to, but I will tell you that uh, I'm very concerned with segmenting portions of revenue for certain issues because it seems like when we get into budget negotiations, the pie becomes more limited and limited because we have to fund certain things. We get match funding from federal government for certain things. We have to fund the education. We have to fund, I mean, there's just these priorities that just eat up the budget. So I'm not really strong on taking a certain percentage and putting it into another fund. Um, and so I'm probably not going to support this. I don't know that I'll pose. I'm just going to stay away from it because it's not something I'd be naturally inclined to want to do. And so I wish you luck, but I'm not, doesn't matter for me. You need the other votes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your comments. Mm -hmm. Mr. Horton. You know, generally speaking, um, a uh, tax exemption is always a good thing. So, um, there is some concerns about L.A., and this is my first time sort of hearing about it, uh, more than willing to work with you, Assemblyman Gray, in that regard. Um, L.A. is, the, the ground is, uh, the fair itself is owned by the county, is managed by? It's managed by a nonprofit, and they contract with the county to run the fair and the property on behalf of the county, and they do that in, in I'm not an expert on this area, you 
might know more about it than me, but but that's not an uncommon model for some of the county fairs because long time ago in the 60s, a lot of the county fairs no longer wanted to have the liability of of a fairgrounds and the activities that took place there. So they they created nonprofits to run them kind of at arm's length. So Sonoma County is that way. It's a Sonoma County Fair Association, Alameda County. Um, um, the uh, LA County is the only model I'm aware of where the supervisors themselves don't hold board appointments. Um, they allow instead the, a nonprofit to elect essentially a board that then oversees the operation. That And the uh, funding would go to the nonprofit or to the county for distribution to the nonprofit, providing them some control over those funds. Is that the, the, al the allocations in the, in the in the past have for county fairs have it's depended on the uh, contractual arrangement between the association and the county. So I know that there are some counties where when the Department of Food and Ag's had funding available, they sent it to the county to administer on behalf of the, with, with the fair, but there are others where if it's in the county's agreement, they'll send it directly to the fair. And I'm not familiar enough with LA County, but they've been part of the network since their inception. And then they've received, I know the Department of Food and Ag, you know, helped build the grandstand at the LA County Fair in the 1930s with money from horse racing. So that, that relationship <coughs> has always been there and I'm sure it's gonna change or evolve as new management takes place there. Uh, um, that's just, they're in that situation right now. Yeah. Um, this is one of those situations where uh, I'm supportive of the bill, supportive of the measure. Um, how, this is one of those situations where it's really sort of in the legislature's purview. Uh, from a Board of Equalization's perspective, I'm supportive of the measure. Um, because our efforts to administer this is not that significant. And the overall benefit, I believe, to the state can be significant. So if the fair is shut down, you end up losing income tax. You end up losing all of the tax increments associated with the fair. Um, and that's inherently dangerous to all the parties involved. So when you have something as simple as this, it turns out being simple at the end of the day, but going through the legislative process often requires a level, uh, a higher level of education uh, in order just to bring some clarification to those issues. Um, uh, let me suggest for consideration only, and, and I do this only with the caveat of deferring to uh, the member and the legislature uh, not being party of that esteemed body anymore. Uh, we certainly want to uh, respect that process. The, um, if, in fact, the legislation provided that the funding went to the county and there was some element of control over that where there were some checks and balances that they could implement, possibly LA might be a little more comfortable given the concern about the nonprofit uh, and the funding going directly to the nonprofit, it's just no control on their part. Uh, the other thing on the overall funding, I concur with Member Runner, uh, Joint Powers Agreement. Uh, the other is to take a look at the bonding uh, capacity of the local agency. If they have that bonding capacity, then issuing or going to the voters who benefit from this as well, and seeking a bond uh, allows the fair to pay off the bond so you get the immediate cash flow in order to do the rehabilitation that you need and the incremental payoff over a period of time, which could be accomplished with the sales tax increments. And so you end up with a joint participation on everyone's part uh, in preserving the income tax, the property tax increments, maybe not so much with the uh, the utility taxes and all the other things that go along with that. Ms. Towers. Thank you. Because this bill is a tax expenditure that should be evaluated during a comprehensive review of tax reform of our tax structure, the controller's office is not participating on this item. Okay. Mr. Runner. Let me tell you where I kind of am. I, I, conceptually, I think it's an interesting idea. I personally would probably support the bill. I'm not sure it's in the best interest. I, I'm not sure where the interest of the BOE is in this bill. Um, 
I do believe it's, you know, I think it's kind of a, a uh, you know, I, I just don't know what our total interest is. Individually, I would support the idea. I think it's an, I think it's the, a, an important kind of uh, re, uh, revenue source for these fairs. I understand the culture and the importance of them in, in, in the communities that they're in. However, I certainly couldn't do it until we resolve the, personally couldn't support it until we resolve the issue with, with, with uh, the plan for LA County. Uh, you know, my friends at home would not be able to uh, understand why I would do that. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't be allowed to drive through. Okay, so it seems like we don't have, um, you know, majority support based on um, some of the concerns here. Um, I don't know if you're going to work on the bill as it moves to the next house. Yeah, well, we're absolutely going to work on the bill and uh, the LA County issue, frankly, uh, from the perspective of the rest of us and those of us out in rural California, we'd love for LA County to be in because that's a big uh, revenue generator. Exactly. Um, All the more uh, it's right. in fact those of you down in LA County that uh, in the legislature that, that, that seem to have the Hopefully good policy would be able to float above any kind of uh, issues that may be amongst the background of that, huh? Now, Mr. Brenner, I believe you used to be in the legislature, didn't you? Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that was rhetorical, I, I believe. I, I, I certainly <laughs> appreciate uh, all the comments uh, here today, uh, Madam Chair, and would be happy to commit uh, to all of you to work uh, on these issues. I know uh, uh, Member Horton had some uh, good uh, suggestions that I could take back uh, to discuss with some of the other members, and uh, we'd be happy to uh, perhaps reach out for your support uh, at a later date. Okay, Mr. Horton. Just a quick question, a clarification. Are the funds pooled? You know, and it, they are. Yeah. And competitive and, then? And then are they distributed based on some proportionate, uh, I mean, would, would LA County all of a sudden uh, lose anything? Uh, if, no. the, if the fund sales tax collected by LA County went into a pool, and let's say LA County uh, makes up uh, 40 30 percent of the of that uh, they in turn will receive 30 percent of this revenue back or is it allocated some other way so the uh, the revenue would be taken from the state general fund portion uh, so the county would stand to lose nothing it would then be deposited into the fair and exposition fund at which point that money could be granted out to deal with infrastructure projects at any of the included fairs. So uh, oh. certainly from a local perspective, nothing's lost. But perhaps from the state general fund perspective, something's lost. Mr. Horton, if I may, to, to, to elaborate on the Senator Gray's point, the issue here is preserving a network of fairs. So the insurance policy that LA County buys is is di directly related to the health of all of the fairs. The vendors that travel to LA County in September have to go and service the fairs in October and in July. And so if you don't have a healthy infrastructure of a network, the costs would come back to an LA County or any other participating fair in the, in the form of higher vendor cost or less quality insurance products, all of the things that need to be purchased and acquired to run a fair day-to-day, month-to-month, et cetera, throughout the state. Yeah, we had uh, similar, as Mr. Gray may remember, similar legislation proposed by um, then Assemblyman Steinberg and had the inherent challenges on um, the distribution of the funds in the, where LA or any other major county that's a huge revenue generator, uh, had a sense of not being, having a benefit. One of the ways that we looked at dealing with that is to establish a baseline that assures them that they would have a reserve uh, that would be pulled out that would be there and available for them. At some point, uh, depending on the sunset, depending on the use of these funds, uh, something like Social Security may just, funds might not be there and available when they, when they need them uh, if they're being used by other counties. So if you're pulling funds from L.A. being used elsewhere without some element of security, uh, uh, you know, you're going to have those concerns. That may be another reason or another issue that you may want to try to fix uh, in the process. But again, I'm, I'm supportive, so. Thank you. Uh, hey, Eric, how you doing? <coughs> <laughs> Just had to shout out to Eric. Yeah. So. <laughs>
Okay, so um, two of us are, are supportive. I personally signed a letter. I think anything is better than nothing um, when it comes to the fares. I'm, I'm glad you're carrying the bill, Mr. Gray, and raising the awareness because some people um, that don't go or frequent the fares um, that much aren't aware of the needs. Uh, the fair board members, you know, need to get a little bit more engaged and lobby their uh, legislators, which I have asked them to do. So I'm hoping that, um, you know, we are going to have a, a fair grounds, you know, legislative day and I'll come up to Sacramento and I'll go and lobby all the members um, in the next uh, appropriate time. So uh, I thank you for caring. I thank you all for coming today and we will stay tuned in terms of um, the bill moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. The only thing uh, we would ask is we really appreciated the uh, uh, the staff analysis because, again, this is new ground for us as the Trade Association, and uh, we certainly expected there to be, should this bill be moving forward, um, um, administrative costs and we'd love to be able to uh, you know know what those are and want to we want to support that element we realize we're asking an agency I mean it was asked earlier why you know why are the Board of Equalization discussing this well one reason from our perspective is the bill asked you to do something it asked you to perform tasks for us and and so hopefully your staff will share that with assembly member gray as we get closer because we wouldn't want to miss the opportunity to, to make sure we do right there Yes, yeah, so, oh, so that's one of the reasons we're hearing the bill is um, the bills that have nexus to us, um, which ask for an analysis uh, from, you know, Michelle Peel Stickers Unit and also a cost analysis is obviously very important to the legislators um, moving forward because without a cost analysis, well, the bill can't keep continue to move. And so I want to thank the legislative unit uh, for performing a very, very important task um, for us. And, you know, thank you for recognizing, you know, the reason you're all here. And, and we're also trying to weigh in early to give our input um, and also our support either as a board or as individual members. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, if you also, if you have any issues in regards to the, the cost of analysis or the cost of implementation or anything, um, we'll be glad to discuss that also as individual members with, with you and our staff in that, in, in that regard, too. Be glad to do that. As long as we have a legislative staff to, to perform that function. <laughs> that just got cut today from yes, the assembly and budget. <laughs> So, and hence my additional so comments. You know, I, I just tell you how it is. I knew she was hinting. But <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for your time. Thank you for coming, Mr. Gray. Thank you, board members. Thank you. Okay, the next bill is AB 717 uh, by Ms. Gonzalez. Sales tax exemption on diapers. I believe uh, Ms. San Miguel from the Office of Assemblywoman. Gonzalez? Tim? Tim, is, is she here? The next bill? Yeah. Uh, Ms. Gonzalez's office? No? Okay, why don't we move to the next one? Members, if, uh, Madam Chair, if you'd like, I'd move support of the bill. I think it's similar to a measure we've heard before. I second. And I think she has narrowed the bill. Um, oh, you probably can just read the, uh, um, the amendments, right, Ms. Peelstiger? Uh, I can tell you what the bill does now. I'm... Um, I don't okay, fine. Well, but the, why don't you make the bill exempts from the sales and use tax diapers designed, manufactured, processed, fabricated, or packaged for use by infants and toddlers, designated size three or under, and there's also a sunset. And the cost estimate now has significantly gone down. Uh, annual state and local revenue loss of thirty-six point two million. And before it was two hundred something, right? I uh, diapers. Yeah, <laughs> just diapers. I Probably. don't have the information before. Me about what it was. Yeah, so it was like I don't know, like three hundred million, if I recall, and so now it's narrowed to diapers for toddlers under three. Yes, only. Correct, Chairwoman. I'm sorry, Tim is um, seventy million. I apologize. So seventy to twenty. Thirty-six. Th uh, Thirty-six. Okay, so about half. Yeah. Miss Sowers. <laughs> <laughs> because this bill is a tax expenditure that should be evaluated <laughs> doing a comprehensive review and tax reform of our tax structure, the controller office is abstaining from this item. Okay. Now, okay. I want to make, well, Mr. Horst. Mr. Runner may be saying this as well, but I, I support the bill personally um, and from the BOE perspective. But this is another one of those measures that is much more of a legislative uh, issue than uh, the BOE and probably should be determined uh, by the legislature. But I'm supportive of it conceptually because it helps poor people. Uh, and I understand the complexity of the process that 
the budget process and how you pull all that stuff out and deal with that is more of a legislative uh, sort of issue. So this is one of those that I sort of pause as to why it's before us, but I'm supportive. So we have, okay. I support. Ms. Harkey? I, I support it. Okay. I think it's fine. Mr. Rowe. Mr. Runner? I'm good. Okay. Um, Mr. Horton makes a motion to support the bill as a board um, minus uh, Ms. Stowers um, support or abstention on, on, on the bill. Mr. Ms. Harkey uh, seconds. So, so be by it. a vote of four to one, State Board of Equalization will be supporting this bill so as a board. Isn't that four to zero if I'm abstaining? Four to, four, to, four to zero. Okay, four to zero. Okay, AB 1642 by Mr. Albernotti, fair prevention fee due date. Okay, uh, the board heard AB 1642 at its meeting on March 30th, 2016 without taking a position. Uh, last year, the board supported AB 203, which was identical to this bill. The board agreed to put this bill over to the May meeting to allow time for staff to provide details about fire fee payments made in the 31 to 60 day period after receiving a notice of determination. And currently the bill is on the Assembly Appropriations Committee's suspense file. The bill would extend from 30 to 60 days the time in which the annual fire prevention fee assessment is due and payable, as well as the time period in which to file a petition for redetermination. And the fiscal impact is an estimated $548,000 revenue loss in foregone interest and penalties with minor costs. Okay, thank you. I believe we have Mr. John Thompson and Mr. Josh Hoover from the Office of Assemblymember Obanoti. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair and board members. Uh, my name is Josh Hoover. I'm the Legislative Director for Assemblyman Obernolte. I wanted to extend his apologies for not being able to make it today, but thank you for allowing me to present on his behalf. Um, uh, despite uh, a lot of effort by CAL FIRE and BOE to educate payers of the fire prevention fee, um, there are a number of our constituents and constituents in other rural assembly districts that I <clears throat> feel that the 30-day period to pay or um, protest the fire fee is insufficient due to a number of um, uh, issues, including um, mail delays in rural areas and uh, insufficient time to obtain assistance to, um, to learn about the fee and to um, take action. So uh, that is why the Assemblyman has brought forward AB uh, 1642, we really believe that it um, allows that extra 30 days will really allow sufficient time for these residents to review those assessments and account for any delays uh, to incentivize compliance of the fire prevention fee. Um, so I want to thank uh, Mr. Runner for his sponsorship of the legislation and would respectfully request uh, support from the board on the bill. Who we'll support, Madam Chair? Second. Um, I think the logic, uh, from my perspective, this is uh, somewhat of a, a member's bill, and to the extent that um, it's far more familiar with the issues in his district uh, in that particular area that is concerning his constituency, and so would be in a better position to quantify the necessity, uh, although the concerns relative to the process appears to be of education appears to be happening, um, but there also appears to be some level of penalties that are occurring, and to the extent that this alleviates that, may in fact be some benefit in being supportive. Thank you. Comment? Good. Are you going to support? Yes. Just say okay. <laughs> this is okay. All right, this is okay. So, okay. Mr. Horton um, moves. Okay. Mr. Runner, um, Ms. Harkey seconds um, to support by unanimous consent. Thank you very much for coming, and good luck on the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. <coughs> okay, and our last bill on the agenda Private railroad. is... SB 1394 by Senator Hall, private railroad car tax mileage basis. We have one speaker uh, on this issue, Mr. Dave Ackerman. Ms. Peelsticker, please. I'm Chair, I'm most supportive of the bill. Second. There we go. Okay. Mr. Horton moves to support the bill. Mr. Runner seconds. I'm okay Do we still want to hear? Do we need to hear? I don't. No. 
unless Mr. Ackerman, you would love to. Especially asked for an I vote. There we go. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's been around for a while. <laughs> there you go. By unanimous support, thank you very much. The board will be uh, sponsoring the bill. Thank Supporting. you very much for the support. Thank yes. You. By unanimous support. So. Supporting the bill. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. This concludes the legislative committee. We are back into regular session. Ms. Richmond, please call the next item. So our next item is item G, tax program not appearance matters consent. These items may be taken in one vote. Okay, is there any member who would uh, not like to participate in any of these votes or pull any items on the list? Move the recommended action. Move G1, yeah, second G1. Okay, um, Mr. Runner, um, Ms. Harkey moves, Mr. Runner seconds to adopt staff recommendation on items G1.1 to G1.22. Without objection, motion carries. Ms. Richmond, please introduce the next item. Our next item is G2, Franchise and Income Tax Matters Consent. These items may be taken in one vote. Okay, members, any non-participation or any member wish to pull an item for review? Move Seeing none. Okay, Ms. Harkey moves. Second. Mr. Horton seconds to adopt staff recommendation on items uh, G2.1 to G2.9. Uh, without objection, motion carries. Ms. Richmond, next item, please. Our, our next item is item H, tax program non-appearance matters adjudicatory. Item H1, legal appeals matters. There is only one item. Okay, H1. All right, any uh, non-participation or any members wish to review this bill? Seeing none. Move to support staff's recommendation. Ms. Harkey moves to support second. recommendation. Mr. Horton seconds. Without objection, motion carries. Mr. Richmond, next item, please. Our next item is H2, Franchise and Income Tax Matters. These items may be taken in one vote or voted on separately. Okay, any members wishing to pull any items or non-participation? Seeing none. Do I have a motion? Is that is so moved. just one item? Is that, uh, uh, it looks like it's three, three. three items. I, let's, can we take them up separately, please? Okay. Um, we have a request to take each one up separately. So, um, Madam Clerk, if you could read the first item. Oh, I'm sorry. Our first item is H21 Decisions. Christine Brown. Move to adopt staff recommendation. Second. Okay, Ms. Stowers uh, moves, Ms. Harkey seconds to adopt staff recommendation. Without objection, motion carries. Ms. Richmond, next item. Our next item is a petition for rehearing Ameristar Casinos, Inc. and Subs. Move to grant the petition for rehearing. Okay, Ms. Harkey moves. A second. Mr. Runner seconds um, to grant the petition for rehearing. Without objection, motion carries. Um, Next item. Okay. Next item. Our, our third item is a Section 40 matter, That's Michael right. J. Bills and Mary E. Bills. Okay, any move to adopt the summary decision? Mm -hmm. Second. Okay. okay, Ms. Stowers moves to adopt the summary decision. Ms. Harkey seconds. Without objection, Members, motion carries. Uh, I think I'm a no on this. Let's see, what was the original vote? Do you want a precedential opinion? No, I think. Um, anyway. He's mean to, trying to be consistent, right? With, <laughs> yeah, my vote. Hold on a minute. Oh, you, I, I, I'd like to withdraw my motion. Huh? <laughs> okay, Ms. Yeah. Stowers is going to withdraw her motion. Okay. Is there uh, another motion on the floor? I'll move the summary, de summary decision. I'll second. Okay, Mr. Runner moves the um, moves the motion. Summary decision. Ms. Harkey seconds. Um, still a no. Me too. Okay, well let's take a. Uh, Thank you. Now I'm a no. Well, hold on. <laughs> now it's confusing me. Can, can you uh, um, can the council please explain what the vote is if we vote yes or no? Okay, this is a decision on the petition for rehearing. No. 
No, this no, is the this Bills, is Bill. Michael Bills and Mary Bills, Sec Section 40 matter. Do I have it wrong, Grant? Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so th this this is a summary decision, Section 40, that uh, basically just affirms what the board decided. Uh, at the oral hearing, which is that the appellants were residents of California uh, as of uh, January 11th of 2005, and then also that none of the uh, distributions uh, or the income from appellant husband's um, partnership interest was California source income. Okay. That, that was a 5 -0. And just a consistent. No, it wasn't. No, it, was it was a 3-2. No. The, the second part was yeah. a 5 -0. Yeah, but I'm, I'm voting. I'm, I will be voting on that because I was no on the residency side. Okay. Oh, there were two parts to it. Yeah. Still a no. Right. <laughs> Still a no. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Um, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Ms. Ma? Aye. Ms. Harkey? Aye. Mr. Horton? No. Mr. Runner? Aye. Ms. Stowers? No. Okay. Motion carries. Okay. Okay, next item, Madam yeah. Clerk, Ms. Richmond. Yeah, yeah. Our next item is I, tax program non appearance matters, I1, property tax matters. These are constitutional functions, therefore, the Deputy Controller may not participate in these matters under Government Code Section 7.9. Move the officer and staff recommendation on all items. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> what about we have a second. I'm sorry, was there a motion? A uh, motion by Mr. Horton to move the staff, adopt staff recommendation, noting non-participation by Ms. Stowers on items I-1.1 to I-1.11. Need a second. Second. Second by Ms. Harkey. Without objection, motion carries. Our next, next item. Our next item is I-2, offer and compromise recommendations. Move staff recommendation. Second. Ms. Harkey moves staff recommendation. Mr. Runner seconds. Uh, adopt staff recommendation items I 2.1 to I 2.4. Without objection, motion carries. Ms. Richmond. That concludes our tax program non appearance matters. Next are those items that were taken under submission. Our first item is B1, Gregory Rimmer. Okay, Gregory Wimmer. Sustain the FTB. Which, which, which item? Second. Rimmer. Sure that's why. The CPA. Oh, yeah. Yep. Ms. Harkey moves, Ms. Stower seconds to sustain the Franchise Tax Board. Without objection, motion carries. Next item, Ms. Richmond. Our next item is B4, Frank Sheen and Stephanie Sheen. Oh, so what happened? Did they all leave? They resolved it, and they've withdrawn the petition. And they what? They've re re resolved it and withdrawn the appeal. So FTB reduced the uh, tax to $289 and interest of 6409 and they've signed the agreement. Everybody's happy. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so home happy. do I need they to make did. an announcement about that, or you've made the announcement? We will... We'll uh, send out a letter. I think it will be that, dismissed right? in accordance with the agreement of the parties. Okay, great. Yeah. Good. Move support staff recommendation. <laughs> okay. Move to support staff recommendation by Ms. Harkey. Seconded. Well, we, it's, it's, it's withdrawn. We oh, it's withdrawn. Okay, fine. Members? Oh. Okay, done. All right. Um, Ms. Richmond, next item. Our next <coughs> item is closed session. The board members will now go into closed session to discuss settlements, pending litigation, and personnel matters. Okay. We will be on a short recess.
board is back from closed session. And um, I would like to announce uh, from closed session, the board is pleased to announce the appointment of Julia Finley to the position of Chief Financial Management Decision uh, Division. Yeah. This appointment is effective immediately, and the board is pleased to announce the appointment of Mark Desio to the position of Deputy Director, External Affairs Department. This appointment is effective June 1st, 2016. Please join me in congratulating both Julia and Mark to the BOE executive team. So that concludes the business for today. Thank you all for attending. This uh, concludes the first meeting of, first day of the meeting of the Board of Equalization. We will take a research, recess, ugh, recess and reconvene tomorrow, May 25th at 9 a.m. Thank you all.